For over a week, the musicians have been boarding planes and heading for Ingolstadt. As early as April 23rd, while Simon and Mary Lou listened to Clark Kent and his Superman, and George Dorn wrote about the sound of one eye opening, the Filet of Soul, finding bookings sparse in London, drove into Ingolstadt in a Volvo painted 17 day glow colors and flaunting Ken Kesey's old slogan, Further. On April 24th, a real trickle began, and while Harry Coyne looked into Hagbard Chalene's eyes and saw no mercy there, Buckminster Fuller just then was explaining omnidirectional halo to his seatmate on a TWA whisper jet in mid Pacific. The wrathful visions, the cockroaches, and the Senate and the people of Rome all drove down Rothhouse plots in bizarre vehicles, while the ultraviolet hippopotamus and the thing on the doorstep both navigated Frederick Ebertstrasse in even more amazing buses. On April 25th, while Carmel looted Maldonado's safe and George Dorn repeated, I am the robot, the trickle turned into a stream, and in came science and health, with key to the scriptures, the glue sniffers, King Kong and his Skull Island dinosaurs, the Howard Johnson hamburger, the riot in cell block 10, the House of Frankenstein, the signifying monkey, the damn thing, the orange moose, the indigo banana, and the pink elephant. On April 26, the stream became a flood, and while Saul and Barney Muldoon tried to reason with Markov Cheney and he struggled in their grip, Ingolstadters found themselves inundated by Frodo Baggins and his ring, the mouse that roars, the crew of the Flying Saucer, the Magnificent Ambersons, the house I live in, the sound of one hand, the territorial imperative, the druids of Stonehenge, the heads of Easter Island, the lost continent of Moo, Bugs Bunny and his fourteen carrots, the gospel according to Marx, the card-carrying members, the sands of Mars, the erection, the association, the amalgamation, the St. Valentine's Day massacre, the climax, the broad jumpers, the pubic heirs, the freaks, and the windows. Mick Jagger and his new group, the Trashers, arrived on April 27th, while the FBI was interviewing every whore in Las Vegas, and there quickly followed the Roofs, Moses and Monotheism, Steppenwolf, Civilization and its discontents, Poor Richard and his Rosicrucian secrets, the Wristwatch, the Nova Express, the Father of Waters, the Human Beings, the Washington Monument, the Thalidomide Babies, the Strangers in a Strange Land, Dr. John the Night Tripper, Joan Baez, the Dead Man's Hand, Joker and the One-Eyed Jacks, Peyote Woman, the Heavenly Blues, the Golems, the Supreme Awakening, the Seven Types of Ambiguity, the Cold War, the Street Fighters, the Bank Burners, the Slaves of Satan, the Domino Theory, and Maxwell and his Demons. On April 28th, while Dillinger loaded his gun and the kachinas of Arabi began the drum beating, the Acapulco gold diggers arrived, followed by the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Second Law of Thermodynamics, Dracula and his Brides, the Iron Curtain, the Noisy Minority, the International Debt, three contributions to the theory of sex, the Cloud of Unknowing, the Birth of a Nation, the Zombies, Attila and his Huns, Nihilism, the catatonics, the Thorndale Jagoffs, the Haymarket Bomb, the Head of a Dead Cat, the Shadow Out of Time, the Sirens of Titan, the Piano Player, the Streets of Laredo, the Space Odyssey, the Blue Moonies, the Crabs, the Dose, the Grassy Knoll, the Latent Image, the Wheel of Karma, the Communion of Saints, the City of God, General Indefinite Wobble, the Left-Handed Monkey Wrench, the Thorn in the Flesh, the Rising Podge, Shazam, the Miniature Sled, the 23rd Appendix, the Other Cheek, the Occidental Ox, Miz and the Chair Person, Cohen, Cohen, Cohen and Con, and the Joint Phenomenon. On April 29th, while Danny Pricefixer listened raptly to Mama Sutra, the deluge descended upon Ingolstadt. Buses, trucks, station wagons, special trains, and every matter of transport except dog sleds brought in the wonders of the invisible world, Maul's curse, the Jesus head trip, Ahab and his amputation, the horseless headsman, the leaves of grass, the Gettysburg address, the rosy-fingered dawn, the wine-dark sea, Nirvana, the net of jewels, here comes everybody, the pice and cantos, the snows of yesteryear, the pink dimension, the goose in the bottle, the incredible hulk, the third bardo, 
aversion therapy, the irresistible force, MC squared, the enclosure acts, perpetual emotion, the 99-year lease, the immovable object, spaceship Earth, the radiocarbon method, the rebel yell, the clenched fist, the doomsday machine, the RAND scenario, the United States commitment, the Entwives, the players of Null A, the prelude to space, Thunder and Roses, Armageddon, the time machine, the Mason word, the monkey business, the works, the Eight of Swords, Gorilla Warfare, the Box Lunch, the Primate Kingdom, the New Aeon, the Enola Gay, the Octet Truss, the Stochastic Process, the Fluxions, the Burning House, the Phantom Captain, the Decline of the West, the Duelists, the Call of the Wild, Consciousness Three, the Reorganized Church of the Latter-day Saints, Standard Oil of Ohio, the Zigzag Men, the Rubble Risers, the Children of Raw, T-N-T, Acceptable Radiation, the Pollution Level, the Great Beast, the Horrors of Babylon, the Wasteland, the Ugly Truth, the Final Diagnosis, Solution Unsatisfactory, the Heat Death of the Universe, Mere Noise, Eye Opening, the Nine Unknown Men, the Horse of Another Color, the Falling Rock Zone, the Ascent of the Serpent, Ready, Willing, and Unable, the Civic Monster, Hercules and the Tortoise, the Middle Pillar, the Deleted Expletive, Deep Quote, Lucifer, the Dog Star, Nothing Serious, and Preparation H. But on April 23rd, while Joe Malik and Tobias Knight were setting the bomb in Confrontation's office, the Dili Lama broadcast a telepathic message to Hagbard Chalene saying, It's not too late to turn back. And Joe hesitated a moment, blurting finally, Can we be sure? Can we be really sure? Tobias Knight raised weary eyes. We can't be sure of anything. He said simply, Shalene has popped up at banquets and other social occasions where Drake was present five times now, and each conversation eventually got around to the puppet metaphor and Shalene's favorite bit about the unconscious saboteur in everybody. What else can we assume? He set the timer for 2.30 a.m. and then met Joe's eyes again. I wish I could have given George a few more hints, Joe said lamely. You gave him too damn many hints as it is. Knight replied, closing the bomb casing. On April 1st, while God's Lightning paraded about UN Plaza and Captain Tequila Emoto was led before a firing squad, John Dillinger arose from his cramped lotus position and stopped broadcasting the mathematics of magic. He stretched, shook all over like a dog, and proceeded down the tunnel under the UN building to alligator control. OTO yoga was always a strain, and he was glad to abandon it and return to more mundane matters. A guard stopped him at the AC door, and John handed over his plastic eye and pyramid card. The guard, a surly-looking woman, whose picture John had seen in the newspapers as a leader of the radical lesbians, fed the card into a wall slot. It came out again, almost at once, and a green light flashed. Pass, she said. Hoite die Welt. Magen's das Sonnen system, John replied. He entered the beige plastic underworld of alligator control and walked through geodesic corridors until he came to the door marked Monotony Monitor. After he inserted his card in the appropriate slot, another green light blinked and the door opened. Taffy Rheingold, wearing a mini skirt and still pert and attractive despite her years and gray hair, looked up from her typing. She sat behind a beige plastic desk that matched the beige plastic of the entire Alligator Control headquarters. A broad smile spread across her face when she recognized him. John! She said happily. What brings you here? Gotta see a boss, he answered. But before you buzz him, do you know you're in another book? The new Edison Yerby novel? She shrugged philosophically. Not quite as bad as what Atlanta Hope did to me and Telemachus sneezed. Yeah, I suppose. But how did this guy find out so much? Some of those scenes are absolutely true. Is he in the order? John demanded. A mind leak, Taffy said. You know how it is with writers. One of the Illuminati Magi scanned Yerby, and he thought he had invented all of it. 
Not a clue. The same kind of leak we had when Condon wrote the Manchurian Candidate. She shrugged. It just happens sometimes. I suppose. John said absently. Well, I'll tell your boss I'm here. In a minute, he was in the inner office, being effusively greeted by the old man in the wheelchair. John, John, it's so good to see you again, said the crooning voice that had hypnotized millions. Otherwise, it was hard in this aged figure to recognize the once handsome and dynamic Franklin Delano Roosevelt. How did you get stuck with a job like this? Dillinger asked finally, after the amenities had been exchanged. You know how it is with the new gang in Aghati. Roosevelt murmured. New blood, new blood, that's their battle cry. All of us old and faithful servants are being pushed into minor bureaucratic positions. I remember your funeral, John said wistfully. I was envious, thinking of you going to Agarti and working directly with the Five. And now it's come to this. Monotony monitor in alligator control. Sometimes I get pissed with the order. Careful, Roosevelt said. They might be scanning. And a double agent such as you are, John, is always under special surveillance. Besides, this isn't really so bad, considering how they reacted in Agharti when the Pearl Harbor revelations started coming out in the late forties. I did not handle that matter too elegantly, you know, and they had a right to demote me. And alligator control is interesting. Maybe, John said dubiously. I never have understood this project. It's very significant work, Roosevelt said seriously. New York and Chicago are our major experiments in testing the mehum tolerance level. In Chicago we concentrate on mere ugliness and brutality, but in New York we're simultaneously carrying on a long-range boredom study. That's where alligator control comes in. We've got to keep the alligators in the sewers down to a minimum so the Bureau of Sanitation doesn't reactivate their own alligator control project which would be an opportunity for adventure and a certain natural mehume hunting band mystique among some of the young males. It's the same reason we took out the trolley cars. Riding them was more fun than buses. Believe me, monotony monitoring is a very important part of the New York project. I've seen the mental health figures, John said, nodding. About 70% of the people in the most congested part of Manhattan are already pre-psychotic. We'll have it up to 80% by 1980, Roosevelt cried with some of his old steely-eyed determination. But then he fixed a joint in his ivory holder and, clenching it at his famous jaunty angle, added, And we're immune thanks to Sabah's elixir. He quoted cheerfully, Grass does more than Milltown can to justify God's ways to man. But what does bring you here, John? A small job, Dillinger said. There's a man in my organization named Malik who's getting a little too close to the secret of the whole game. I need some help here in New York to set him off on a snark hunt until after May 1st. I'd like to know who you've got in your staff closest to him. Malik, Roosevelt said thoughtfully. That would be the Malik of Confrontation magazine? John nodded, and Roosevelt sat back in his wheelchair, smiling. This is a lead pipe cinch. We've got an agent in his office. But neither of them realized that ten days later, a dolphin swimming through the ruins of Atlantis would discover that no dragon star had ever fallen. Nor could they have guessed how Hagbard Chalene would reevaluate Illuminati history when that revelation was reported to him, and they had no clue of the decision he would then make, which would change everybody's conspiracies shockingly and unexpectedly. Here are the five alternate histories, Gurad said, his wise old eyes crinkling humorously. Each of you will be responsible for planting the evidence to make one of these histories seem fairly credible. Wotopod, you get the Carcosa story. Evo, you get the lost continent of Mu. He handed out two bulky envelopes. Guatone, you get this charming snake story. I want variations of it scattered throughout Africa and the Near East. He handed out another envelope. Unica, you get the Orantia story.
but that one isn't to be released until fairly late in the game. He picked up the fifth envelope and smiled again. Gajetsi, my love, you get the Atlantis story, with certain changes that make us out to be the most double-dyed bastards in all history. Let me explain the purpose behind that. And in 1974, the four members of the American Medical Association gazed somberly down at Joe Malik from his office wall. It looked to be a long day, and there was nothing to anticipate as exciting as last night had been. There was a thick manuscript in a manila envelope in the inbox. He took the heavy manuscript out and shook the envelope. Damn it, there was no return envelope. Well, working at a magazine like Confrontation, whose contributors were mostly radicals and the kinds of kooks who were willing to write for no bread, you didn't really expect them to enclose stamped self-addressed envelopes. There was a covering letter. Joe sucked in his breath when he saw the golden apple embossed in the upper left-hand corner. Hail, Eris, and hi, Joe. Here is a brilliant original interpretation of international finance called Vampirism, the Heliocentric Theory and the Gold Standard. It's by Jorge Lobengula, a really far-out young Discordian thinker. Jams don't go in much for writing, but Discordians fortunately do. If you find it worth printing, you may have it at your usual rates. Make the check payable to the Fernando Poo Secessionist Movement and send it to Jorge at 15 Rue Hassan, Algiers 8. Incidentally, Jorge will not be involved in the Fernando Poo coup. He is turning toward a synergistic economics, which will gradually lead him to see the folly of Fernando Poo going it alone. And the coup itself, of course, will not be any of our doing. But Jorge will be a key figure in Equatorial Guinea's subsequent economic recovery, assuming the world pulls through that particular mess. If you can't use this paper, burn it. Jorge has plenty of copies. Five tons of flax. Mal. P.S. The Fernando Poo rebellion may still be one or two years in the future, so don't jump to the conclusion that the pot is coming to a boil already. Remember what I told you about the goose in the bottle. M. Down the hall in the ladies' room, bolting the door for privacy, Pat Walsh takes her transistorized transmitter from her pantyhose and broadcasts to the receiver at the Council on Foreign Relations headquarters half a block east. I'm still writing lots of Illuminati research papers, and they'll give him plenty of false leads. The big news today is an article on Eurasian economics by a Ferdinando Poo national. It came with a covering letter signed Mal, and from the context, I feel fairly certain it's the original Maleclips the Elder himself. If not, at least we've got a lead on that damned elusive Maleclips the Younger. The envelope was postmarked Mad Dog, Texas. Joe put down Mal's letter, trying to remember the obscure references to Fernando Poo before the movie last night. Someone had said something was going to happen there. Maybe he should get a stringer on the island, or even send somebody over. A malicious grin crossed his face. It might be interesting to send Peter. First some Om, then a trip to Fernando Poo. That might fix Peter up. Joe flipped through the Lobengula manuscript quickly, scanning. There were no Fnords. That was a relief. He had become painfully conscious of them since Hagbard had removed the aversion reflex, and each Fnord had sent a pang through him that was a ghost of the low-grade emergency in which he had previously lived. He turned back to the first page and began to read in earnest. Vampirism, the Heliocentric Theory, and the Gold Standard by Jorge Lobengula do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Joe stopped. That sentence had been used in the Black Mass in Chicago, and further back he knew it was the code of the Abbey of Thelema and Rabelais. But there was something else about it that chewed at his consciousness, something that suggested a hidden meaning. This was not just a first axiom of anarchism. There was something else there, something more hermetic. The only place where all five Illuminati Primi met was the Great Hall of Gruad in Agardi, the 30,000-year-old Illuminati center on the peaks of the Tibetan Himalayas, with a lower-level waterfront harbor on the vast underground sea of Elusia. We will report in the usual order, said Brother Gracchus Gruad, 
pressing a button in the table before him so his words would automatically be recorded on the impervium wire for the Illuminati archives. First of all, Fernando Poo, Jorge Lobangula, having decided that the combined resources of Fernando Poo and Rio Muni can be reallocated so as to increase the per capita wealth of citizens of both provinces, has accordingly broken with the Fernando Pu separatists on return to Rio Muni, where he hopes to persuade Fang leaders to go along with his schemes for economic redevelopment. Our plans now center on a Captain Ernesto Tequila Imota, one of the few Caucasians left on Fernando Pu. He has good contacts among the wealthier Bobby. The ones who favor separatism, and he is inordinately ambitious. I don't think we need contemplate a change in timetable. I should hope not, said Brother Marcus Marconi. It would be such a shame not to emanatize Sir Eschaton on May 1st. Well, we can't count on May 1st, said Brother Gracchus Gruad. But with three distinct plans pointing in that direction, one of them is bound to hit. Let's hear from you, Brother Marcus. Charles Monsenego has now reached Anthrax's leprosy moo. A few more nightmares at the right moment, and he'll be home. Sister Theta Theodora spoke next. Atlanta Hope and God's Lightning are becoming more powerful all the time. The President will be scared shitless of her when the time comes, and he'll be ready to be even more totalitarian than her, just to keep her from taking over. I don't trust Drake, said Brother Marcus Marconi. Of course, said Brother Gracchus Gruad. But he has builded his house by the sea. And he who builds by the sea builds on sand, said Brother Otto Agatai. My turn. Our record, Gif Sympathize Control, is an international hit. Our next tour of Europe should be an extraordinary success. Then we can begin, very slowly and tentatively, negotiations for the Walpurgisnacht Festival. Anyone who tries to develop the idea prematurely, of course, will have to be deflected. Or liquidated, said Brother Gracchus Gruad. He looked down the long table at the man who sat by himself at the far end. Now you, you've been silent all this time. What do you have to say? The man laughed. A few words from the skeleton at the feast, eh? This was the fifth and most formidable Illuminatus Primus, Brother Henry Hastur, the only one who would have the gall to name himself after a Lawiger. It is written, he said, that the universe is the practical joke by the general at the expense of the particular. Do not be too quick to laugh or weep if you believe this saying. All I can say is, there is a serious threat in being to all your plans. I warn you, you have been warned. You may all die. Are you afraid of death? You need not answer. I see that you are. That in itself may be a mistake. I have tried to explain to you about not fearing death, but you will not listen. All your other problems follow from that. The other four Illuminati Primi listened in cold, disdainful silence and did not reply. If all are one, the fifth Illuminatus added significantly, all violence is masochism. If all are one, Brother Otto replied nastily, all sex is masturbation. Let's have no more mehu metaphysics here. George! Then George was here, with Chilene, in Ingolstadt. This was going to be tricky. George's head was bent over an earthenware stein, doubtless full of the local brew. George! Joe called again. George looked up, and Joe was astonished. He had never seen George like this before. George shook his shoulder-length blonde hair to clear it away from his face, and Joe looked deep into his eyes. They were strange eyes, eyes without fear or pity or guilt eyes that acknowledged that the natural state of man was one of perpetual surprise, and therefore could not be greatly surprised by any one thing, even the unexpected appearance of Joe Malik. What has Chalene done to him in the past seven days? Joe wondered. Has he destroyed his mind, or has he illuminated him? 
Actually, it was George's tenth stein of beer that day, and he was very, very drunk. Civil liberties were suspended and a state of national emergency declared during a special presidential broadcast on all channels between noon and 12.30 on April 30th. Fifteen minutes later, the first rioting started in New York, at the Port Authority on 41st Street, where a mob attempted to overrun the police and steal buses in which to escape to Canada. It was 6.45 p.m. just then in Ingolstadt, and Count Dracula and his brides were giving forth a rag-a-rock version of an old Walt Disney cartoon song. And in Los Angeles, where it was 9.45 a.m., a five-person mortuary group hurriedly convened, decided to use up all its bombs against police stations immediately. Cripple the motherfucker before it's heavy, said their leader, a 16-year-old girl with braces on her teeth. Her idiom, in standard English, meant paralyze the fascist state before it's entrenched. And Saul, trusting the pole vaulter in the unconscious, was leading Barney and Markov Cheney into the mouth of Lehman Cavern. Carmel, nearly a kilometer south of them and several hundred feet closer to the center of the earth, still clutched his briefcase and its five million green gods. But he did not move. Near him were the bones of a dozen bats he had eaten. To be a bat's a bum thing, a silly and a dumb thing, but at least a bat is something, and you're not a thing at all. Joe Malik, hit by the Raga Rock as if by an avalanche of separate notes which were each boulders, felt his body dissolve. Count Dracula wailed it again. You're not a thing at all. And Joe felt mind crumble along with body and could find no center, no still point in the waves of sound and energy. The fucking acid was Hagbard's ally and had turned against him. He was dying. Even the words, hey, that cat's on a bummer, came from far away. And his effort to determine if that really meant him collapsed into an effort to remember what the words were, which imploded into an uncertainty about what effort he was trying to make, mental or physical, and why. Because, he cried out, because, because, but because meant nothing. You're nothing but a nothing. Nothing but a nothing. But I can't take acid now, George had protested. I'm so damn drunk on this Bavarian beer, it's sure to be a down trip. Everybody takes acid, Hagbard said coldly. Those are Miss Portinari's orders, and she's right. We can only face this thing if our minds are completely open to the outside. Hey, dig. Clark Kent said. That French cat eating the popsicle. Yeah, said one of the supermen. It's Jean-Paul Sartre. Who'd ever expect to see him here? Kent shook his head. Hope to hell he stays long enough to hear our gig. Shit, the influence that man has had on me. He should hear it come back at him in music. That's your trip, baby, a second superman said. I don't give a fuck what any motherfucking honky thinks about our music. You're nothing but nothing. Mick Jagger hasn't even played sympathy for the devil yet, and already the trouble has started. An English voice drawled. Attila and his Huns were trying to do acute bodily damage to the Senate and the people of Rome. Both groups were speeding, and they had gotten into a very intellectual discussion of the meaning of one of Dylan's lyrics. A Hun bopped a Roman with a beer stein as another voice mumbled something about Tile Eulenspiegel's merry pranks. You're not a thing at all. Appendix Vow Flax Scrip and Hemp Scrip Flax Scrip was first introduced into Discordian groups by the mysterious Malaclips the Younger KSC in 1968. Hemp Scrip followed the year after, issued by Dr. Mordecai Malignatus K&S. In the novel, taking one of our few liberties with historical truth, we move these coinages backward in time and attribute Hemp Scrip to the justified ancients of Mamu. The idea behind Flax Scrip, of course, is as old as history. There was private money long before there was government money. The first revolutionary or reformist use of this idea as a check against galloping usury and high interest rates was the foundation of Banks of Piety by the Dominican Order of the Catholic Church in the late Middle Ages. See 
Tawney, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. The Dominicans, having discovered that preaching against usury did not deter the usurer, founded their own banks and provided loans without interest. This ethical competition, as Josiah Warren later called it, drove the commercial banks out of the areas where the Dominicans practiced it. Similar private currency, loaned at a low rate of interest, but not at no interest, was provided by Scots banks, until the British government, acting on behalf of the monopoly of the Bank of England, stopped this exercise of free enterprise. See Mwellen, free banking. The same idea was tried successfully in the American colonies before the revolution, and again was suppressed by the British government which some heretical historians regard as a more direct cause of the American Revolution than the taxes mentioned in most school books. See Ezra Pound, Impact, and additional sources cited therein. During the 19th century, many anarchists and individualists attempted to issue low-interest or no-interest private currencies. Mutual Banking by Colonel William Green and True Civilization by Josiah Warren are records of two such attempts by their instigators. Lysander Spooner, an anarchist who was also a constitutional lawyer, argued at length that Congress had no authority to suppress such private currencies. See his Our Financiers, Their Ignorance, Usurpations and Frauds. A general overview of such efforts at free enterprise, soon crushed by the capitalist state, is given by James M. Martin in his Men Against the State, and by Rudolf Rocker in Pioneers of American Freedom, an ironic title since his pioneers all lost their major battles. Lawrence Labadee of Suffern, New York, has collected, but not yet published, records of 1,000 such experiments. One of the present authors, Robert Anton Wilson, unearthed in 1962 the tale of a no-interest currency privately issued in Yellow Springs, Ohio, during the 1930s Depression. This was an emergency measure by certain local businessmen who did not fully appreciate the principle involved and was abandoned as soon as the tight money squeeze ended and Roosevelt began flooding us all with Federal Reserve notes. It is traditional among liberal historians to dismiss such endeavours as funny money schemes. They have never explained why government money is any less hilarious. That used in the US now, for instance, is actually worth 47% of its declared face value. All money is funny if you stop to think about it, but no private currency competing on a free market could ever be quite so comical and tragic as the notes now bearing the magic imprint of Uncle Sam, and backed only by his promise or threat that come hell or high water, by God he'll make it good by taxing our descendants under the infinite generation to pay the interest on it. The national debt, so-called, is of course nothing else but the debt we owe the bankers who loaned this money to Uncle after he kindly gave them the credit which enabled them to make this loan. Hemp scrip, or even acid scrip, or peyote scrip, could never be quite so clownish as this system, which only the Illuminati, if they really exist, could have dreamed up. The system has but one advantage. It makes bankers richer every year. Nobody else, from the industrial capitalist or captain of industry to the coal miner, profits from it in any way, and all pay the taxes which become the interest payments which make the bankers richer. If the Illuminati did not exist, it would be necessary to invent them. Such a system can be explained in no other way except by those cynics who hold that human stupidity is infinite. The idea behind hemp scrip is more radical than the notion of private enterprise currency per se. Hemp scrip, as employed in the novel, depreciates. It is thus not merely a no-interest currency, but a negative interest currency. The lender literally pays the borrower to take it away for a while. It was invented by German business economist Silvio Gazelle and is described in his Natural Economic Order and in Professor Irving Fisher's Stamp Script. 
Gresham's law, like most of the laws taught in state-supported public schools, is not quite true, at least not in the form in which it is usually taught. Bad money drives out good, holds only in authoritarian societies, not in libertarian societies. Gresham was clear-minded enough to state explicitly that he was only describing authoritarian societies. His formulation of his own law begins with the words, If the king issueth two monies, thereby implying that the state must exist if the law is to operate. In a libertarian society, good money will drive out the bad. This utopian proposition, which the sane reader will regard with acute scepticism, has been seen to be sound by a rigorously logical demonstration based on the axioms of economics in The Cause of Business Depressions by Hugo Bilgrim and Edward Levy. Economists can prove all sorts of things from axioms, and few of them turn out to be true. Yes, we saved for a footnote the information that at least four empirical demonstrations of the reverse of Gresham's law are on record. Three of them, employing small volunteer communities in Frontier USA, Kierkar, 1830 to 1860, are recorded in Josiah Warren's True Civilization. The fourth, employing contemporary college students in a psychology laboratory, is a subject of a recent master's thesis by Associate Professor Don Werkheiser of Central State College, Wilberforce, Ohio. On April 29th, still harboring a cargo of doubt about Hagbard, Joe Malik decided to try the simplest method of tarot divination. Concentrating all his energy on the question, he cut the deck and picked out one card that would reveal Hagbard Chalene's true nature, if the divination worked. With a sinking heart, he saw that he had come up with the Hierophant. Running the mnemonic Simon had taught him, Joe quickly identified this figure with the number five the Hebrew letter vow, meaning nail, and the traditional interpretation of a false show, a hypocrisy or a trick. Five was the number of grummet, the destructive and chaotic end of a cycle. Vow was the letter associated with quarrels, and the meaning nail was often related to the implement of Christ's death. The card was telling him that Hagbard was a hypocritical trickster aiming at destruction, a murderer of the dreamer-redeemer aspect of humanity. Or, taking a more mystical reading, as was usually advisable with the tarot, Hagbard only seemed to be these things, and was actually an agent of resurrection and rebirth. As Christ had to die before he could become the Father, as, in Vedanta, the false self must be obliterated to join the great self. Joe swore. The card was only reflecting his own uncertainty. He rummaged in the bookshelf Hagbard had provided for his stateroom, and found three books on the tarot. The first, a popular manual, was absolutely useless. It identified the Hierophant with the letter of religion, in contrast to the spirit, with conformity, and with all the plastic middle-class values Hagbard conspicuously lacked. The second, by a true adept of the tarot, just led him back to his own confused reading of the card, remarking that the Hierophant is mysterious, even sinister. He seems to be enjoying a very secret joke at somebody's expense. The third work raised more doubts. It was Lieber 555 by somebody named Mordecai Malignatus, which vaguely reminded Joe that the old East Village Other chart of the Illuminati conspiracy showed a Mordecai the Fowl in charge of the Sphere of Chaos. And Mordecai Malignatus was a fair Latinization of Mordecai the Fowl. Mordecai, Joe remembered, was, according to that half-accurate and half-deceptive chart, in dual control along with Richard Nixon, then living, of the elders of Zion, the House of Rothschild, the Politburo, the Federal Reserve System, the U.S. Communist Party, and Students for a Democratic Society. Joe flipped the pages to see what the semi-mythical Mord had to say about the Hierophant. The chapter was brief. It was in The Book of Republicans and Sinners, and said, 5. Vow. Nail. The Hierophant. They nailed love to a cross, symbolic of their might. But love was undefeated. It simply didn't fight. Five stone men were in a courtyard when an elephant entered. 
The first man was stoned on sleep, and he saw not the elephant, but dreamed instead of things unreal to those awake. The second man was stoned on nicotine, caffeine, DDT, carbohydrate excess, protein deficiency, and the other chemicals in the diet which the Illuminati have enforced upon the half-awake to keep them from fully waking. Hey, he said, there's a big smelly beast in our courtyard. The third stone man was on grass, and he said, No, dads, that's the ghostly old party in its true nature, the dark nicks on the soul. And he giggled in a silly way. The fourth stone man was tripping on peyote, and he said, You see not the mystery, for the elephant is a poem written in tons instead of words, and his eyes danced. The fifth stone man was on acid, and he said nothing, merely worshipping the elephant in silence as the father of Buddha. And then the hierophant entered and drove a nail of mystery into all their hearts, saying, You are all elephants. Nobody understood him. At eight o'clock in Ingolstadt, an unscheduled group called the Cargo Cult managed to get the mic and began blasting out their own outer space arrangement of an old children's song. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. And in Washington, where it was still only two in the afternoon, the White House was in flames, while the National Guard machine-gunned an armed mob crossing the mall in front of the Washington Monument, a single finger pointing upward in an eloquent and vulgar gesture which only the Illuminati knew meant, fuck you. In Los Angeles, where it was eleven in the morning, the bomb started to go off in police stations. And in Lehman Cavern, Markov Cheney disgustedly pointed out a graffito to Saul and Barney. Help stamp out sizism. Take a midget to lunch. You see? He demanded. That's supposed to be funny. It's not funny at all. Not one damn bit. She'll be driving six white horses. She'll be driving six white horses. She'll be driving six white horses when she comes. On April 29th, Hagbard invited George to join him on the bridge of the Leif Erikson. They had been sailing through a smooth-walled tubular passage that was completely filled with water, and was both underground and below sea level. It had been built by the Atlanteans, and not only had survived the catastrophe, but had been maintained in good condition for the next 30,000 years by the Illuminati. There was even a salt lock, located roughly under Lyon, France, which served to keep the salt water of the Atlantic out of the further reaches of the passage and the underground freshwater sea of Volusia. The underground waterways were connected with many lakes in Switzerland, Bavaria, and Eastern Europe, Hagbard explained, and if salt water were found in all of those lakes, the existence of the weird subsurface world of the Illuminati would be suspected. As the submarine approached a huge circular hatchway barring the passage, Hagbard turned off the devices that rendered the craft indetectable. Immediately, the enormous round metal door swung toward them. Won't the Illuminati know we've activated this machinery? said George. No, this works automatically, said Hagbard. It's never occurred to them that anyone else might use this passageway. But they know you could, and you guessed wrong about their spider ships being able to detect you. Hagbard whirled on George, a hairy arm lifted to punch him in the chest. Shut up about the fucking spider ships. I don't want to hear any more about the spider ships. Portinari's running the show now, and she says it's safe, okay? Commander, you're out of your fucking mind, George said firmly. Hagbard laughed, his shoulders slumping slightly in relaxation. <laughs> All right. You can get off the sub any time you want to. We'll just open the hatch and let you swim out. You're out of your fucking mind. But I'm stuck with you, said George, clapping Hagbard on the shoulder. You're either on the sub or off the sub, said Hagbard. Watch this. The Leif Erikson had sailed through the round metal gateway, which closed behind it. Here, the ceiling of the underwater passage was about fifty feet higher than it had been in the section they had just left, and the tunnel was only partially filling with water. The air seemed to be coming from vents in the ceiling. There was another metal hatchway in the distance down the tunnel. This lock is pretty big, George said. The Illuminati must have sailed some enormous submarines through here. And animals, said Hagbard. The hatchway ahead of them opened, and fresh water came pouring in. 
The water level in the lock rose until it reached the ceiling, and the Leif Erikson's engines turned over and began to propel it forward once more. This time Mavis was on the bridge with Hagbard. As George entered, Hagbard withdrew his hand from her left breast in an unhurried movement. George wanted to kill Hagbard, but he was thankful that he hadn't seen Mavis touching Hagbard in any sexual way. That would have been past bearing. He might have tested his newfound courage by taking a poke at Hagbard, and Goddess only knows what karate or yoga or magic would be the response. Besides, Mavis and Hagbard must be bawling all the time. Mavis greeted George with a comradely hug that made the entire front of his body ache. Hagbard pointed to an inscription carved in the wall of the cave. There was a row of symbols that George didn't recognize, but above them was something quite familiar, a circle with a downward-pointing trident carved inside it. The peace symbol? said George. I didn't know it was that old. In the days when it was put up there, said Hagbard, it was called the Cross of Lilith Velcor, and its meaning is simply that anyone who attempts to thwart the Illuminati will suffer from the most horrible torture the Illuminati can devise. Lilith Velcor was one of the first of their victims. They crucified her on a revolving cross that looked very much like that. The inscription warns the passerby to purify his heart because he is about to enter the Sea of Volusia, which belongs exclusively to the Illuminati. Traveling across the Sea of Volusia, you come eventually to the underground port of Agarti, which was the first Illuminati refuge after the Atlantean catastrophe. We are emerging into the Sea of Volusia right now. Watch! Hagbard gestured, and George watched open mouth as the walls of the cave that closed around them fell away. They were sailing out of the tunnel, but what they seemed to be entering was an infinite fog. The television cameras and their laser wave guides penetrated just as far into this lightless ocean that they were about to navigate as they had into the Atlantic, but this ocean was neither blue nor green, but gray. It was a gray that seemed to extend infinitely in all directions, like an overcast sky. It was impossible to gauge distance. The farthest depth of gray around them might be hundreds of miles away, or it might be right outside the submarine. Where's the bottom? he asked. Too far below us to see, said Mavis. The top of this ocean is just a little above the level of the bottom of the Atlantic. You're so smart, said Hagbard, pinching her buttock and causing George to flinch. Don't pay any attention to him, George, said Mavis. He's a little bit nervous, and it's making him silly. Shut the fuck up, said Hagbard. Beginning to feel anxious himself, wondering if the noble mind of Hagbard Chalene was being overthrown by the weight of responsibility, George turned to look out at the empty ocean. Now he saw that it wasn't quite empty. Fish swam by, some large, some small, many of them grotesque. All were totally eyeless. An octopoidal monster with extremely long, slender tentacles drifted past the submarine, feeling for its prey. There was a covering of fine hairs on the tips of the tentacles. A small fish, also blind, swam close enough to one tentacle to set up a current that disturbed the hairs. Instantly, the octopus's whole body moved in that direction. The disturbed tentacle wrapped itself around the hapless fish, and several others joined in to help scoop it up. The octopus devoured the fish in three bites. George was glad to see that at least the blood of these creatures was red. The door behind them opened, and Harry Coyne stepped out onto the bridge. Morning, everybody. I was just wondering if I might find Miss Mao up here. She's doing a stint in navigation right now, said Hagbard. But stay here and have a look at the Sea of Volusia, Harry. Harry looked all around, slowly and thoughtfully, then shook his head. You know, there's times when I start to think you're doing this. What do you mean, Harry? Asked Mavis. You know. Harry waved a long, snake-like hand. Doing this like a science fiction movie. <laughs> you just got us in an abandoned hotel somewhere, and you got a big engine in the basement that shakes the whole place, and here you got some movie cameras, only they point at the screen instead of away from you, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Rear projection, said Hagbard. Tell me, Harry, what difference would it make if it wasn't real? Harry thought a moment, his chinless face sour. We wouldn't have to do what we think we have to do. 
But even if we don't have to do what we think we have to do, it won't make any difference if we do it. Which means we should just go ahead. Mavis sighed. Just go ahead. Just go ahead, said Hagbard. A powerful mantra. And if we don't go ahead, said George, it doesn't matter either, which means that we just do go ahead. Another powerful mantra, said Hagbard. Just do go ahead. George noticed a small speck in the distance. As it got closer, he recognized it. He shook his head. Was there no end to the surrealism he'd been subjected to in the last six days? A dolphin wearing scuba gear. Hi, man friends, said Howard's voice over the loudspeaker on the bridge. George cast a glance at Harry Coyne. The former assassin was standing open mouth and limp with astonishment. Greetings, Howard, said Hagbard. How goes it with the Nazis? Dead, sleeping, whatever it is they are. I have a whole porpoise horde. Most of them Atlantean adepts, watching them. And ready to perform other tasks as needed, I hope, said Hagbard. Ready indeed, said Howard. He turned to Somersault. All right, said Harry Coyne softly. All right, he said more firmly. It's a talking fish. But why the hell is it wearing an oxygen tank and breathing through a fucking mask? I see we have a new friend on the bridge, said Howard. I got the mask from Hagbard's onshore representative at Fernando Poo. After all, a porpoise has to breathe air. And there is no surface in most of this underground ocean. It's water all, all, all the way to the top of the cavernous chambers that contain it. The only place I can get air near here is by swimming to the top of Lake Totenkopf. The <laughs> Lake Totenkopf monster said George with a laugh. We'll moor the submarine in Lake Totenkopf later today, said Hagbard. Howard, I'd like you and your people to stand by tonight and tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, be ready to do a lot of hard physical work. Meanwhile, stay out of the way of the Nazis. The protection they're under is particularly aimed at sea animals, since that was the presumed greatest danger to them. We'll have oxygen equipment as needed for any of your people who want it. Tell them to try to avoid surfacing on the lake unless absolutely necessary. We don't want to attract more attention than we have to. I salute you in the name of the porpoise horde, said Howard. Hail and farewell. He swam away. A little later, sailing on, they saw in the distance an enormous reptile with four paddles for swimming and a neck twice the length of its body. It was in hot pursuit of a school of blind fish. The Loch Ness Monster, said Hagbard, and George remembered his little joke about Howard surfacing in Lake Totenkopf. One of Gruod's genetic experiments with reptiles, Hagbard went on. He was really queer for reptiles. He filled the Sea of Volusia with these plesiosaur-like things, blind, of course, so they could navigate in darkness. Think about that. Eyes are a liability under certain conditions. Gruard figured monsters like that would be another protection against anybody finding a Garty. But the Leif Erikson is too big for Nessie to tangle with, and she knows it. At last there was a column of yellow light ahead. This was the light led into the Sea of Volusia by Lake Totenkopf. Hagbard explained that the lake was simply a place where the ceiling of rock over the Sea of Volusia had been soft and unstable enough to collapse. The resulting hole, being at sea level, filled with water. Debris falling down through the bottom of the lake had formed a mountain below the place where the roof of the Sea of Volusia was punctured. The Jesuits, of course, always knew that Lake Totenkopf connected with the Sea of Volusia and thus made possible easy contact with Agarty, Hagbard said. That's why, when they gave Weishaupt the assignment of founding an overt branch of the Illuminati, they sent him to Ingolstadt, which is right by Lake Totenkopf. And... There's the mountain under the lake. It loomed ahead of them, dark and forbidding. As the submarine sailed over it, George saw a cloud of dolphins circling in the distance. The mountain top had been sheared off in a fashion that seemed too precise to be natural. It formed a plateau about two miles long and one mile wide. There were what appeared to be dark squares on this gray plateau. The submarine swooped down, and George saw that the squares were huge formations of men. 
In a moment, they were hovering over the army like a helicopter observing troops on parade. George could clearly see the black uniforms, the green tanks with black and white crosses painted on them, the long, dark, upjutting snouts of big guns. They stood there silent and immobile, thousands of feet below the surface of the lake. That's the weapon the Illuminati plan to use to immunitize the Eschaton? asked George. Why don't we destroy them now? Because they're under a protective biomystic field, said Hagbard. And we can't. I did want you to see them, though. When the electrical, astral, and organomic vibrations of the American Medical Association, amplified by the synergetic clusters of sound, image, and emotional energy of all these young people responding to the beat, bring that Nazi legion back to life, it will call for nothing less than the appearance on the field of battle of the goddess Eris herself to save the day. Hagbard, George protested disgustedly. Are you telling me Eris is real? Really real and not just an allegory or symbol? I can't buy that any more than I can believe Jehovah or Cyrus is really real. But Hagbard answered very solemnly. When you're dealing with these forces of powers in a philosophic and scientific way, contemplating them from an armchair, that rationalistic approach is useful. It is quite profitable, then, to regard the gods and goddesses and demons as projections of the human mind or as unconscious aspects of ourselves. But every truth is the truth only for one place at one time. And that's the truth, as I said, for the armchair. When you're actually dealing with these figures, the only safe, pragmatic, and operational approach is to treat them as having a being, a will and a purpose entirely apart from the humans who evoked them. If the sorcerer's apprentice had understood that, he wouldn't have gotten into so much Appendix Lamed The Tactics of Magic The human brain evidently operates on some variation of the famous principle enunciated in The Hunting of the Snark. What I tell you three times is true. Norbert Wiener Cybernetics. The most important idea in the Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Malin the Mage is the simple looking formula Invoke Often. The most successful form of treatment for so called mental disorders, the behavior therapy of Pavlov, Skinner, Wolpe, et al., could well be summarized in two similar words Reinforce Often. Reinforcement, for all practical purposes, means the same as the layman's term reward. The essence of behaviour therapy is rewarding desired behaviour. The behaviour, as if by magic, begins to occur more and more often as the rewards continue. Advertising, as everybody knows, is based on the axiom repeat often. Those who think they are materialists and think that materialism requires them to deny all facts which do not square with their definition of matter, are loath to admit the well-documented and extensive list of individuals who have been cured of serious maladies by that very vulgar and absurd form of magic known as Christian science. Nonetheless, the reader who wants to understand this classic work of immortal literature will have to analyse its deepest meanings guided by an awareness that there is no essential difference between magic, behaviour therapy, advertising and Christian science. All of them can be condensed into Abra Melin's simple invoke often. Reality, as Simon Moon says, is thermoplastic, not thermosetting. It is not quite silly putty, as Mr. Paul Krasner once claimed, but it is much closer to silly putty than we generally realise. If you are told often enough that Budweiser is the king of beers, Budweiser will eventually taste somewhat better, perhaps a great deal better, than it tasted before this magic spell was cast. If a behaviour therapist in the pay of the communists rewards you every time you repeat a communist slogan, you will repeat it more often and begin to slide imperceptibly toward the same kind of belief that Christian scientists have for their mantras. And if a Christian scientist tells himself every day 
that his ulcer is going away. The ulcer will disappear more rapidly than it would have had he not subjected himself to this homemade advertising campaign. Finally, if a magician invokes the great god Pan often enough, the great god Pan will appear. The opposite and reciprocal of invoke often is banish often. The magician wishing for a manifestation of Pan will not only invoke Pan directly and verbally, create Pan-like conditions in his temple, he will also banish other gods verbally, banish them by removing their associated furnitures and colours and perfumes. The basic Christian science mantra, known as the scientific statement of being no less, is as follows. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. Spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore man is not material, he is spiritual. The fact that these statements are, in terms of the scientific criteria, meaningless, non-operational, and footless, is actually totally irrelevant. They work. Try them and see. As Alistair Crowley, no friend of Mrs. Eddy's, wrote, Enough of because! May he be damned for a dog! If you are afraid that you might, in this Christian environment, fall into taking the Christian science mantra too seriously, try instead the following simple experiment. For forty days and forty nights, begin each day by invoking and praising the world in itself as an expression of the Egyptian deities, Recite at dawn, I bless Ra, the fierce sun burning bright. I bless Isis Luna in the night. I bless the air, the Horus Hawk. I bless the earth on which I walk. Repeat at moonrise. Continue for the full forty days and forty nights. We say without any reservations that, at a minimum, you will feel happier and more at home in this part of the galaxy. If the results are exceptionally good, you just might start believing in ancient Egyptian gods.
Of course, there are further offences and affronts to the rationalist in the deeper study of magic. We all know, for instance, that words are only arbitrary conventions, with no intrinsic connection to the things they symbolise. Yet magic involves the use of words in a manner that seems to imply that some such connection or even identity actually exists. The reader might analyse some powerful bits of language, not generally considered magical, and he will find something of the key. For instance, the two plus three pattern in Hail Eris, or Hail Discordia, is not unlike the two plus three in Holy Mary, Mother of God, or that in the LS, MFT, which once sold many cartons of cigarettes to our parents, and the two plus three in Crowley's EO Pan, EO Pan Pan, is a relative of these. Thus, when a magician says that you must shout Abrahadabra and no other word at the most intensely emotional moment in an invocation, he exaggerates. You may substitute other words, but you will abort the result if you depart too far from the five-beat pattern of Abrahadabra. A glance at the end of Appendix Beth will save the reader from misunderstanding the true tenor of these remarks. But this brings us to the magical theory of reality. Mahatma Guru Sri Paramahansa Shivaji Alistair Crowley again, under another pen name, writes in Yoga for Yahoos, Let us consider a piece of cheese. We say that this has certain qualities, shape, structure, colour, solidity, weight, taste, smell, consistency and the rest. But investigation has shown that this is all illusory. Where are these qualities? not in the cheese, for different observers give quite different accounts of it, not in ourselves, for we do not perceive them in the absence of the cheese. What then are these qualities of which we are so sure? They would not exist without our brains. They would not exist without the cheese. They are the results of the union, that is, of the yoga, of the seer and seen of subject and object. There is nothing here with which a modern physicist could quarrel, and this is the magical theory of the universe. The magician assumes that sensed reality, the panorama of impressions monitored by the senses and collated by the brain, is radically different from so-called objective reality. About the latter reality, we can only form speculations or theories which, if we are very careful and subtle, will not contradict either logic or the reports of the senses. This lack of contradiction is rare. Some conflicts between theory and logic, or between theory and sense data, are not discovered for centuries. For example, the wandering of Mercury away from the Newtonian calculation of its orbit. And even when achieved, Lack of contradiction is proof only that the theory is not totally false. It is never, in any case, proof that the theory is totally true. For an indefinite number of such theories can be constructed from the known data at any time. For instance, the geometries of Euclid, of Gauss and Riemann, of Lobachevsky and of Fuller all work well enough on the surface of the Earth, and it is not yet clear whether the Gauss-Riemann or the Fuller system works better in interstellar space. If we have this much freedom in choosing our theories about objective reality, we have even more liberty in deciphering the given or transactional sensed reality. Everybody, of course, does this unconsciously. See the paragraph about the cheese. The magician, doing it consciously, controls it. This book, being part of the only serious conspiracy it describes, that is, part of Operation Mindfuck, has programmed the readers in ways that he or she will not understand for a period of months, or perhaps years. When that understanding is achieved, 
the real import of this appendix and of the equation 5 equals 6 will be clearer. The Starry Wisdom Church was not 0005's idea of a proper ecclesiastical shop by any means. The architecture was a shade too gothic, the designs on the stained glass windows a bit unpleasantly suggestive for a holy atmosphere. And when he opened the door, the altar was lacking a proper crucifix. In fact, where the crucifix should have been, he found instead a design that was more than suggestive. It was, in his opinion, downright tasteless, he thought grimly, testing the vestry door. It slid open smoothly, and he stepped back out of visible range, waiting a moment. They were either not at home or cool enough to allow him the next move. He stepped through the door and flashed his light around. Oh, God, no, he said. No, God, no! Goodbye, Mr. Chips, said St. Toad. Approaching the outskirts of the crowd, Fish and Chips saw a group of musicians who were obviously English from their dress and hairstyle. Their name, he saw on the biggest drum, was Calculated Tedium, and the guitar player had a canteen strapped to his hip. He reminded 0005 of how thirsty he was, and he asked, Pardon me, do you know where I could get some water or a soft drink? Take a snort from the canteen, the guitarist said affably, passing it over. He pointed to the west. See that geodesic plywood down there? It's a bleeding giant Kool-Aid station set up by the Cabalters, and guaranteed to hold out even if the crowd doubles inside before this is over? I just filled the canteen from there so it's fresh. You can get more over there any time you need it. Thanks, 0005 said warmly, taking a long, cold, delightful swallow. He had a very low threshold for LSD. The world began to seem brighter, stranger, and more colorful within only a few minutes. The Joker was actually Rhoda Chief, the vocalist who sang with the heads of Easter Island, and who had inspired much admiration in the younger generation, and much horror in the older, when she named her out-of-wedlock baby Jesus Jehovah Lucifer Satan Chief. A former processing and Scientologist currently going the Wicca route, the buxom Rhoda was renowned through showbiz for giving head like no chick alive a reputation which often provoked certain Satanists on the Linda Lovelace for President Committee to send very deadly vibes in her direction, all of which bounced off due to her wicca shield. She was also possibly the greatest singer of her generation, and firmly believed that most human problems would be solved if the whole world could be turned on to acid. She had been preparing for the Ingolstadt Festival for several months, buying only the top quality tabs from the most reliable dealers and she had crept into the geodesic Kool-Aid station only a few minutes earlier, dumping enough pure lysergic acid diethylamide to blow the minds of the population of a small country. 
Actually, the idea had been subtly planted in her consciousness by the leader of her Wakan, an astonishingly beautiful woman with flaming red hair and smoldering green eyes, who had once played a starring role in a black mass celebrated by Padre Pederastia at 2323 Lakeshore Drive. This woman called herself Lady Velcor and often made jokes about her memories of 18th century Bavaria, which Rhoda assumed were references to reincarnation. On April 10th, while Howard made his discovery in the ruins of Atlantis and Tlaloc grinned in Mexico, D.F., Tobias Knight, in his room at the Hotel Pancreston in Santa Isabel, concluded a broadcast to the American submarine in the Bight of Biafra. The rescues and chinks have completed their withdrawal, and General Isu Moputa is definitely friendly to our side, besides being popular with both the booby and the fang. My work is definitely finished. I'll await orders to return to Washington. Roger. Over and out. Frank Sullivan, capitalizing on his only real asset, was operating in Havana as a Cuban superman, using the name Papa Piaba, when the Brotherhood spotted his resemblance to John Dillinger. Gosh, he said when they made the offer. Five thousand dollars just to take two ladies to a movie one night, and it's only a practical joke, you say? It'll be a very funny joke. High Capo Mosinigo promised him, and the Smithsonian acquired Mr. Sullivan's asset as one of their most interesting relics. We'll kill the old red rooster. Hagbard was accompanied by Joe Malik when he returned to the stateroom. You go to the beer hall in Munich, he was saying, and steal any item, anything at all, as long as it's obviously old enough to have been there the night he tried the push. Then you rejoin the rest of us in Ingolstadt. Understood? Lady Velcor looked around the geodesic Kool-Aid dome. A man in a green turtleneck sweater and green slacks caught her eye, and she walked over to him, asking, "Are you a turtle?" "You bet your sweet ass I am," he answered eagerly. And so she had failed to make contact and owed this oaf a free drink also. But she smiled pleasantly and concealed her annoyance. <laughs> Thank you.
Robinson and Lehrman of the Homicide Department actually started the last phase of the operation. I was in New York to see Hassan I. Sabah X about a new phase of Laotian opium operation. I had just come from Chicago after staging that conversation with Waterhouse for Miss Cervix's benefit, and I decided to check with them for those little nuances that can't go into an official report. We met in Washington Square and found a bench far enough from the chestnuts to give us some privacy. Muldoon is on to us, Robinson told me right off. He was wearing a beard. I figured that meant he was currently in a weather underground group, since he was too old to pass for under twenty-one and get into Morituri. Are you sure? I asked. He made the usual reply. Who's ever sure of anything in this business? But Barney is pure cop through and through, he added. And his instincts are like dousing rods. Everybody on the force knows we've infiltrated them by now, anyway. They even make jokes about it. Who's the CIA man in your department? That kind of thing. Muldoon is on to us, all right, Lehrman agreed. But he's not the one I worry about. Who is? Being the first pentuple agent in the history of espionage was starting to grind me down. I really wasn't sure which of my bosses should hear about this, although the CIA certainly had to be told, since for all I know Robinson and Lehrman might be reporting to them twice, having another contact as a fail-safe check on my own integrity. The head of Homicide North, Lehrman said. An old geezer named Goodman. He's so damn smart I sometimes wonder if he's a double agent for the eye themselves. His mind jumps ahead of facts, just like an adeptus exemptus in the order. I looked up at the statue of Garibaldi, remembering the old NYU myth that he would pull his sword the rest of the way out of the scabbard if a virgin ever walked through Washington Park. Tell me more about this Goodman, I said. I didn't want to kill anybody at this point, and a bombing would only get Muldoon in. Even having Malik disappear might only bring in missing persons. Then I remembered the dummies used by the clothier on the eighteenth floor, right above the confrontation office. Burn the dummy just right before setting the bomb, and it might work. I drove back toward Manhattan, whistling "Ho, ho, ho!" Who's got the last laugh now? The bomb went off at two thirty a.m. one week later. Simon, leaving O'Hare Airport, where it was one thirty a.m., decided he still had time to get to the friendly stranger and meet that cute lady cop who had so cleverly infiltrated the nameless anarchist horde. He could get her into bed easily enough, since female spies always expect men to reveal secrets when they're in the dreamy afterglow with their guard down. He would teach her some sexual yoga. He decided and see what secrets she might slip. But he remembered the midnight conference at the UN building after the bomb was set and Malik's grim words. If we're right about this, we might all be dead before Woodstock Europa opens next week. Are you a turtle? Lady Velcor asks again, approaching another man in green. No, he says. I have no armor. She smiles as she murmurs, "Blessed be," and he replies, "Blessed be." Doris Horace heard the voice behind her say, "And how's the Miskatonic Messalina?" And her heart leaped, not believing it. But when she turned, it was him, Stack. Jesus! One Superman said to another, "Does he personally know all the good-looking white chicks in the world?" The Senate and the people of Rome were still tussling with Attila and his Huns. But Hermes Speed King Trismegistus, drummer with the credibility gap, watched placidly from only a few feet away, seeing them as a very complicated, almost mathematical ballet. He was concerned only with determining whether they illustrated the eternal warfare of Set and Osiris, or the joining of atoms to make molecules. He knew he was on acid, but what the hell? That must have been the Kool Aid, another of Tyle Eulenspiegel's merry pranks. The submarine rose above the plateau, lifting into the waters of Lake Totenkopf. Mooring it well below the surface on the shore opposite Ingolstadt, Hagbard and about thirty of his crew entered scuba launches and buzzed to the surface. Parked on a road beside the lake was a line of cars led by a magnificent Bugatti Royale. Hagbard grandly ushered George, Stella, and Harry Coyne into the enormous car. George was shocked to see that the chauffeur was a man whose face was covered with gray fur. It was a long drive around the lake to the town of Ingolstadt. It was very much as George had imagined it: all turrets and spires and Gothic towers mixed with modern Martian edifices straight from Mad Avenue. But most of the buildings looked like they had been put up in the days of Prince Henry the Fowler. 
This place is full of beautiful buildings, said Hagbard. The big Gothic cathedral in the center of town is called the Leapfrauen Minster. There's another Rococo church called the Maria Victoria. I've always wanted to get stoned on acid and look at the carvings. They're so intricate. Have you been here before, Hagbard? Harry asked. On scouting missions. I know where all the good places are. Tonight, you're all going to be my guests at the Schloss Keller in Ingolstadt Castle. Have to be your guests, said George. <laughs> None of us have any money. If you have flax, said Hagbard, you can pay in flax at the Schloss Keller. They first went to the Danau Hotel, which Hagbard said was the most modern and comfortable in Ingolstadt, where Hagbard had reserved almost all the rooms for his people. With every hotel in Ingolstadt bursting at the seams, it had taken a huge advance payment to bring this off. The hotel staff jumped to attention when they saw the line of cars with Hagbard's splendid Bugatti in the vanguard. Even in a town crowded with celebrities, overrun with wealthy rock musicians and affluent rock fans from all over the world, a machine like Hagbard's commanded respect. George, following Hagbard into the lobby, suddenly found himself face to face with two ancient bent German men. One, with a long white mustache and a lock of white hair that fell over his forehead, said, in heavily accented English, Get out of my way, degenerate Jewish communist homosexual! The other old man winced and said something placating to his colleague in a soft voice. The first man waved his hand in dismissal, and they tottered toward the elevators together. Several more old men joined them as George watched, too surprised to be angry. Here, though, in the fatherland of that kind of mentality, the old man's hatred seemed historical curiosity to him more than anything else. Doubtless such men as that had actually seen Hitler in the flesh. Hagbard grandly took a handful of room keys from the desk clerk. For simplicity's sake, I've assigned a man and a woman to each room, he said as he passed them out. Choose your roommates and switch around as you like. When you get up to your rooms, you'll find suitable Bavarian peasant costumes laid out on the bed. Please put them on. Stella and George went upstairs together. George unlocked the door and surveyed the large room with its two double beds. On top of one lay a man's outfit of lederhosen with silk shirt and knee socks, while on the other bed was a woman's peasant skirt, blouse, and vest. Costumes, Stella said. Hagbard's really crazy. She shut the door and tugged at the zipper of her one-piece gold-knit pantsuit. She had nothing on underneath. She smiled as George regarded her with admiration. When the group assembled in the lobby, only Stella looked good in costume. Of the men, Hagbard looked most natural and happy in lederhosen, which was perhaps why he'd had the notion of dressing that way. The Ingolstadt Castle, a battlemented medieval building built on a hill, had a magnificent restaurant in what had formerly been either a dungeon or a wine cellar, or both. Hagbard had reserved the entire cellar for the evening. Here. He said, We'll rally our forces around us, have some fun, and prepare for the morrow. He seemed in an agitated, almost giddy mood. He took his place at the center of the big table in a blackened carved chair that looked like a bishop's throne. On the wall behind him was a famous painting. It depicted the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV, barefoot in the snow at Canossa, but with one foot on the neck of Pope Gregory the Great, who lay prone, his tiara knocked off, his face ignominiously buried in a snowdrift. The story goes that this was commissioned by the notorious Bavarian jester, Thiel Eulenspiegel, when he was at the height of his fortunes, Hagbard said. Later, when he was old and penniless, he was hanged for his anarchistic attitudes and his low Bavarian sense of humor. So it goes. There he is, Markov Cheney whispers tensely. Saul and Barney lean forward, peering at the figure ahead of them. About 5'7", Saul estimates, and Carmel was 5'2", according to the R&I packet they had lifted from Las Vegas Police Headquarters. But who else would be down here, so far from the route of the guided tours? Saul's hand moves towards his gun, but the other figure whirls on them, flashing a pistol, and shouts, Hold it right there, all of you! Oh, Christ, Saul says disgustedly. Hail, Eris friend, we're on the same side. He holds up his hands, empty. I'm Saul Goodman, and this is Barney Muldoon, both formerly of the New York Police Force. This is our friend Markov Cheney, a man of great imagination and a true servant of Goddess. All hail Discordia, 23 Skidoo, Callisti, 
And do you need any more passwords, Mr. Sullivan? Gosh, Markov Cheney says. You mean that's really John Dillinger? Rhoda Chief, vocalist and apprentice witch, sampled some of her own Kool-Aid early in the evening. She swore until the day she died that what happened in Ingolstadt that Walpurgisnacht was nothing less than the appearance of a giant sea serpent in Lake Totenkopf. The beast, she insisted, turned, took its own tail in its mouth, and gradually dwindled to a dot, giving off good vibes and flashes of astral light as it diminished. There were many empty places at the big table when the Discordians sat down. Hagbard seemed in no hurry to order dinner. Instead, he called for round after round of the local beer, of which enormous stocks had been laid in to prepare for the Great Rock Festival. George, Stella, and Harry Coyne sat together near Hagbard, and George and Harry discussed sodomy objectively, between long, thoughtful pauses and deep drinking. Hagbard sent the beer around so fast that George frequently had to swill down a whole stein in a minute or two just to keep up. Various people came in and sat down at empty places at the table. George shook hands with a man around 30 who introduced himself as Simon Moon. He had a lovely black woman with him named Mary Lou Cervix. Just around the time George was finishing his tenth stein of Ingolstadt's fabled beer and feeling quite woozy, a man who looked very familiar floated into his line of vision. The man wore a brown suit and his gray hair was crew cut. George! the man shouted. Yes, it's me, Joe said George. Of course it's me. That's you, Joe, isn't it? He turned to Harry Coyne. That's the guy who sent me down to Mad Dog to investigate. Harry laughed. My God, said Joe. What's happened to you, George? He looked vaguely frightened. A lot of things, said George. How many years has it been since I've seen you, Joe? Years? It's been seven days, George. I saw you just before you caught the plane to Texas. What have you been doing? George shook his finger. You were holding out on me, Joe. You wouldn't be here now if you didn't know a lot more than you claimed to when you sent me to Mad Dog. Maybe good old Hagbard can tell you what I've been doing. There's good old Hagbard looking over at us from his end of the table right now. What do you say, Hagbard? Do you know good old Joe Malik? Hagbard lifted a huge ornamented stein of beer, which the management of the Schlosskeller had provided him as an honored guest. It was adorned with elaborate base reliefs of pagan woodland scenes, including tumescent satyrs pursuing chubby nymphs. How are you doing, Malik? called Hagbard. Great, Hagbard, just great, said Joe. We're gonna save the Earth, aren't we, Joe? Hagbard yelled. Gonna save the Earth, that right? What do you mean, save the Earth? Hagbard looked at him stupidly, his mouth hanging open. If you don't know that, why are you here? I just want to know. We're going to save the Earth, but are we going to save the people? What people? The people that live on the Earth. Oh, those people, said Hagbard. Sure, sure, we're going to save everybody. Stella frowned. This is the silliest conversation I've ever heard. Hagbard shrugged. Stella, honey, why don't you go on back to the Leif Erikson? Well, fuck you, Charlie. Stella stood up and flounced off, her peasant skirt swinging. George held his breath. Mavis had come into the room. Instead of the peasant skirt outfit Hagbard had decreed, she was wearing what might have been called hot lederhosen, a very short, very tight pair of leather breeches that made her long legs look fantastically long and underlined the round curves of her ass. Just then, a tall, stern-looking black man came into the room. He, too, was wearing Bavarian peasant costume. He went up to Hagbard and shook hands. Where's my Stella? He demanded gruffly. George felt his hackles rise. He knew he had no right of possession where Stella was concerned, but then neither did this guy. Exclusive possessions seemed the one type of sexual relationship not practiced among the Discordians and their allies. There was a kind of tribal, general love among them which didn't prevent anybody from sleeping with anybody else. An unsympathetic observer might call it promiscuity, but that word, as George understood it, meant using another's body for sex without feeling anything for the person you were physically involved with. The Discordians were all too close, too concerned about each other as people for the word promiscuity to fit their sex lives. And George loved them all. Hagbard, Mavis, Stella, the other Discordians, Joe, even Harry Coyne, maybe even Otto Waterhouse, who had just appeared. Mavis said, 
Stella's gone down to the submarine, Otto. She'll join us at the proper time. Hagbard suddenly lurched to his feet. Quiet! I want you to all join me in drinking to an engagement announcement. Engagement? Somebody called incredulously. Shut the fuck up. Hagbard snarled. Yes, I'm talking about an engagement to be married. Day after tomorrow, when the eschaton has been imminentized and all of this is over, lift your steins, Mavis and I will be married aboard the Leif Erikson by Miss Portinari. George sat there still for a moment, absorbing it, looking at Hagbard. He stood and lifted his stein. Here's to you, Hagbard, he said, and he drew his arm back in a sidearm motion so as to not spill any of the beer, and then let the whole stein fly at Hagbard's head. Laughing, Hagbard swayed to one side, a movement so casual it didn't appear that he was ducking. The stein struck the painted head of Emperor Henry IV. Sorry, said George. Hate to damage a work of art. You should have kept your head in place, Hagbard. It would have been less of a loss. He took a deep breath and roared. Sinners! Sinners in the hands of an angry god! You are all spiders in the hand of the Lord! He held out his hand, palm upward. And he holds you over a fiery pit! George turned his palm over. He noticed suddenly that everyone in the room was silent and looking at him. Then he passed out, falling into the arms of Joe Malik. Beautiful, said Hagbard. Exquisite. Is that what you meant by taking the woman away from him? Said Joe angrily as he eased George into a chair. You're a sadistic prick. That's only the first step, said Hagbard. And I said it was temporary. Did you see the way he threw that stein? His aim was perfect. He would have brained me if I hadn't known it was coming. He should have, said Joe. You mean you were lying about you and Mavis getting married? You were just saying that to bug George? He certainly was not, said Mavis. Hagbard and I have both had it with this catch-as-catch-can single life, and I'll never find another man who more perfectly fits my value system than Hagbard. I don't need anybody else. Eat! Eat, drink, and be merry. You may never see me again, Joe. Somebody at this table is going to betray me. Didn't you know that? Two thoughts collided in Joe's brain. He knows. He is a magician. And he thinks he's Jesus. He's nuts. But just then, George Dorn woke up and said, Oh, Jesus, Hagbard. I can't take acid. Hagbard laughed. The Morgan Hoyte Gesternwelt. You're ahead of the script, George. I hadn't started to hand the acid out yet. He took a bottle from his pocket and dumped a pile of caps on the table. Just then, Joe distinctly heard a rooster crow. At that moment, a little wall-eyed man tapped Joe on the shoulder. Sit down, Joe. Have a drink. Sit down with George and me. I've seen you before, said Joe. Perhaps. Come, sit down. Let's have some of this good Bavarian beer. It has great integrity. Have you ever tried it? Waitress. The newcomer snapped his fingers impatiently, all the while staring owlishly at Joe through lenses as thick as the bottom of beer glasses. Joe let himself be led to a chair. You look exactly like Jean-Paul Sartre said Joe as he sat down. I've always wanted to meet Jean-Paul Sartre. Sorry to disappoint you then, Joe, said the man. Put your hand into my side. Mal, baby, Joe cried, attempting to embrace the apparition and ending up hugging himself, while George, bleary-eyed, stared and shook his head. Am I glad to see you here, Joe went on. But how come you're doing Jean-Paul Sartre instead of your hairy taxi driver? This is a good cover, said Malaclips. People would expect Jean-Paul Sartre to be here, covering the world's biggest rock festival from an existentialist point of view. On the other hand, this is Lon Janey Jr. country, and if I started showing up as Sylvain Martisset with a face covered with fur, I'd have a mob of peasants carrying torches looking for me all over town. I saw a hairy chauffeur today, said George. Do you suppose it was Lon Janey Jr.? Don't worry, George said Malaclips with a smile. 
The hairy people are on our side. Really? said Joe. He looked around. Hagbard Chalin was the hairiest person at the table. His fingers, hands, and bare forearms were black with hair. The stubble of his beard came high up on his cheekbones, just below his eyes. On the back of his neck, the hair didn't stop growing, but continued down into his collar. Stripped, Joe thought, the man must look like a bare rug. Many of the other people at the table had long hair or afro haircuts, and the men had beards and mustaches. Joe remembered Miss Mao's hairy armpits. The peasant blouses on the women in this room hid their armpits from examination. George, of course, had that shoulder length blonde hair that made him look like a Giotto angel. But, Joe thought, what about me? I'm not hairy at all. I keep my hair in a crew cut because I prefer it that way. Where does that leave me? What difference does hair make? He asked Malaclips. Hair is the most important thing in this society, said George. I've tried repeatedly to explain that to you, Joe, and you've always never listened. Hair's the whole thing. Hair in this society at this moment is a symbol, said Malaclips. However, there is a real aspect to hair which enables me, for instance, to look around this room and surmise that many of these people are enemies of the Illuminati. You see, all humans were once fur-bearing. Joe nodded. I saw that in the movie. Oh, yes. You saw when Atlantis ruled the Earth, didn't you? Said Malaclips. Well, hairlessness, you'll recall, was Gruad's peculiarity. Most of the people whom the Illuminati permitted to live, and to eventually become re-civilized Illuminati style, were mated with or raped by descendants of Gruad. But the fur-bearing gene, found in all humans before the catastrophe, has not disappeared. It is quite common in enemies of the Illuminati. My suspicion is that if we knew the histories of Elf and the Discordians and the Jams, we'd find that they go back to Atlantean origins and preserve, to some extent, the genes of Gruad's foes. I'm inclined to believe that hairy people, in whom the genes of Atlanteans other than Gruad predominate, are inherently predisposed to anti-Illuminati activities. Conversely, people who work against the Illuminati are also likely to favor lots of hair. These factors have given rise to legends about werewolves, vampires, beast men of all kinds, abominable snowmen, and furry demons. Note the general success of the Illuminati propaganda campaign to portray all such hirsute beings as fearsome and evil. The propensity of hairiness among the anti-Illuminati types also explains why lots of hair is a common characteristic of bohemians, beatniks, leftists generally, scientists, artists, and hippies. All such people tend to make good recruits for the anti-Illuminati organizations. Sometimes we make it sound as if the Illuminati were the only menace on Earth, said Joe. Isn't it equally possible that people who are opposed to the Illuminati may be dangerous? Oh, yes, indeed, said Malaclips. Good and evil are two ends of the same street. But the street was built by the Illuminati. They had excellent reasons from their viewpoint to preach the Christian ethic to the masses, you know. What is John Gilt? Joe remembered what he'd said to Jim Cartwright several years ago. Sometimes I wonder if we're not all working for them, one way or another. He hadn't meant it at the time, but now he realized it was probably true. He might be doing the Illuminati's work right now, when he thought he was saving the human race. Just as Chalene might be doing the will of the Illuminati while thinking he was preserving the Earth. George, bleary-eyed and smiling, said, Where'd you meet Sheriff Jim, Joe? Joe stared at him. What? Hairlessness is the reason why Gruad and his successors were partial to reptiles, said Malaclips, adjusting his thick glasses. They had a real feeling of kinship. One of their symbols was a serpent with its tail in its mouth, which was intended to refer both to Gruad's Ophidian assassins and to his other experiments with reptilian life forms. Joe, still shaken by George's question, yet not wanting to probe further in that direction, said, all kinds of myths involving serpents crop up in all parts of the world. All of them go back to Gruad, said Malaclips. 
The serpent symbol and the Atlantean catastrophe gave rise to the myth that Adam and Eve, tempted by the serpent, fell into misery when they acquired the knowledge of good and evil. Just as Atlantis fell through the moralistic ideology of Gruad the serpent scientist. Then there's the old Norse myth of the world serpent with its tail in its mouth that holds the universe together. The Illuminati serpent symbol was also the origin of the brazen serpent of Moses, the plumed serpent of the Aztecs and their legend of the eagle devouring the snake, the Caduceus of Mercury, St. Patrick casting the snakes out of Ireland, various Baltic tales of the serpent king, legends of dragons, the monster guarding the fabulous treasure at the bottom of the Rhine the Loch Ness Monster, and a whole raft of other stories connecting serpents with the supernatural. In fact, the name Gruad comes from an Atlantean word that translates variously as worm, serpent, or dragon, depending on context. I'd say he was all three, said Joe, from what I know. George said, I saw the Loch Ness Monster today. Hagbard called it a she, which surprised me. But this is the first I've heard about this serpent business. I thought the Illuminati symbol was an eye in a pyramid. The big eye is their most important symbol, said Malaclips. But it isn't the only one. The rosy cross is another. But most widely copied is the serpent symbol. The eye in the pyramid and the serpent are often seen in combination. Together they represent the sea monster Leviathan, whose tentacles are depicted as serpents and whose central body is shown as an eye in a pyramid. Since each of Leviathan's tentacles is said to have an independent brain, that's not half bad. The swastika, which was a pretty important symbol around these parts some decades ago, was originally a stylized drawing of Leviathan, and his many tentacles. Early versions of it have more than four hooks, and they often include a triangle, sometimes even an eye in a triangle in the center. A common transitional form is a triangle with the sides extended and then hooked to form tentacle shapes. There are two tentacles for each of the three angles, which yields a twenty-three. Polish archaeologists found a swastika painted in a cave, the drawing dated back to Cro-Magnon times, not long after the fall of Atlantis, and there were twenty-three swirling tentacles around a beautifully executed pyramid with an ochre eye in its center. We'll kill the old red rooster when she comes. I just saw Hagbard Jalene, said Winifred Sauer. Naturally, he'd be here with all his minions and catamites, said Wilhelm Sauer. We've got to expect to go right down to the wire on this. I wonder what he's planning, said Werner Sauer. Nothing, said Wolfgang Sauer. In my opinion, he's planning nothing at all. I know how his mind works. Head full of oriental mystical mush. He's going to rely on his intuition to tell him what to do. He hopes to make it more difficult for us to anticipate his actions since he himself doesn't know what they will be. But he's wrong. His field of action is drastically limited, and there's nothing he can do to stop us. First, the towers appeared over the black-green tops of the pines. They looked like penitentiary guard towers, though in fact the men in them were unarmed, and their primary purpose was to house spotlights and loudspeakers. Then the road turned, and they were walking next to a twenty-foot-high wire fence. Running parallel to this was an inner fence, thirty feet away, and about the same height. Beyond that were bright green hillsides. The promoters of the festival had chopped down and sold all the trees on the hills within the fenced-off area, bulldozed the stumps, and covered the raw earth with fresh sod. Already the green was particularly covered by crowds of people. Tents had popped up like mushrooms, and banners waved in the air. A huge sign over the stage announced that the Oklahoma Home Demonstration Club was playing, and the loudspeakers thundered out an old favorite of that group, Custer Stomp. Behind the stage, the four members of the American Medical Association stood apart and gazed out at the sunset. 
They were wearing iridescent black tunics and trousers. Members of other bands stood together and talked, many of the groups happy to be meeting each other for the first time. They even fraternized with a few intrepid kids who managed to infiltrate past the guards and make it to the back side of the stage hill. But white-suited attendants kept the public and fellow performers away from the American Medical Association. This was generally accepted as the AMA's privilege. They were, after all, universally acclaimed as the greatest rock group in the world. Their records sold the most. Their tours drew audiences that dwarfed even those of the Beatles. Their sound was everywhere. As the Beatles had, for a time, expressed the new freedom of the 60s, so the AMA seemed to epitomize the repressive spirit of the 70s. The secret of their popularity was that they were so appalling. They reminded their fans of all the evils that were being daily visited upon them, and thus hearing and seeing them was like scratching a very bad itch. They suggested that perhaps youth had captured its oppressors or identified with them, and they momentarily turned the pain of the whole scene into pleasure. To learn how to enjoy suffering, since suffering was their lot, kids by the millions flocked to hear the AMA. Like a radiant heater, said Wolfgang, we at the center, our message projected into a ball of vibrant young human consciousnesses, massively reflected by them back across the lake, into the lake to the depths of a mile, there reaching the sunken army, raising them, in a sense, from the dead. We are so close to realizing the dream of thirty thousand years, said Winifred. Will we be able to do it? Will we be the ones who complete the work begun by the great Gruard? And if not, what will become of us? Doubtless we will scream in hell for all eternity, said Werner matter-of-factly. What would you do to us if we failed? We need fear eternity only if the Eater of Souls is on the scene, said Wilhelm. And they've still got him imprisoned inside the Pentagon. Let no one speak of failure, said Wolfgang. It is absolutely impossible for us to fail. The plan is foolproof. Winifred shook her head. Fools are precisely what it is not proof against, and you, Wolfgang, know that best of all. At 5.45 in Washington, D.C., the switchboard at the Pentagon was warned that bombs planted somewhere in the building would go off in ten minutes. You killed hundreds of us today in the streets of Washington, said the woman's voice. But we are still giving you a chance to evacuate the building. You do not have time to find the bombs. Leave the Pentagon now and let history be the judge of which side truly fought for life and against death. The highest ranking personnel in the Pentagon, and with revolution breaking out in the nation's capital, everybody was there, were immediately moved to underground bomb-proof shelters. The Secretary of Defense, after consulting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, declared that there was a 95% probability that the threat was a hoax, intended to disrupt the job of coordinating the suppression of revolution across the nation. A search would be instituted, but meanwhile work would go on as usual. Besides, the Secretary of Defense joked to the Chief of Staff Army, well, one of those little radical bombs would do as much damage to this building as a firecracker would to an elephant. Somehow the fact that the caller had said bombs, plural, had not gotten through, and the actual explosions were far more powerful than the caller had implied. Since a proper investigation was never subsequently undertaken, no one knows precisely what type of explosive was used, how many bombs there were, how they were introduced into the Pentagon, where they were placed, and how they were set off. Nor was the most interesting question of all ever satisfactorily answered, who done it? In any case, at 5.55 p.m. Washington time, a series of explosions destroyed one-third of the riverside of the Pentagon, ripping through all four rings from the innermost courtyard to the outermost wall. There was great loss of life. Hundreds of people who had been working on that side of the building were killed. Although the explosion had not visibly touched their bomb-proof shelter, the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and numerous other high-ranking military persons were found dead. It was assumed that the concussion had killed them, and in the ensuing chaos, nobody bothered to examine the bodies carefully. After the explosions, the Pentagon was belatedly evacuated, in the expectation that there might be more of the same. There was no more, but the U.S. military establishment was temporarily without a head. Another casualty was Mr. H.C. Winifred of the U.S. Department of Justice. 
a civil servant with a long and honorable career behind him, Winifred, apparently deranged by the terrible events of that day of infamy, took the wheel of a Justice Department limousine and drove wildly, running 23 red lights, to the Pentagon. He raced to the scene of the explosion, brandishing a large piece of chalk, and was trying to draw a chalk line from one side of the gap in the Pentagon wall to the other, when he collapsed and died, apparently of a heart attack. At 11.45 English dot time, the loudspeakers and the sign over the stage announced the American Medical Association. After a ten-minute ovation, the four strange-eyed, ash-blonde young people began to play their most popular song, Age of Bavaria. In Los Angeles, the Mercalli scale on the UCLA seismograph jumped abruptly to grade one. Gonna be a little disturbance, Dr. Vulcan Troll said calmly, noting the rise. Grade one wasn't serious. What made you think we'd find him down here? Saul asked. Common sense and psychology, Dillinger said. I know pimps. He'd shit purple before he'd get the guts to try to cross the border. They're strictly mama's boys. The first place I'd look was his own cellar, because he might have a hidden room there. Barney laughed. <laughs> That's the first place Saul looked, too. We seem to think alike, Mr. Dillinger, Saul said dryly. There isn't much difference between a cop and a crook, psychologically speaking. Dillinger mused. Wonder what the hell is in that suitcase? Dillinger murmured. I'll open it, Saul said. We'll all have to take the antidote anyway after this. I have a supply on the car. And he leaned forward, parted Carmel's stiff blue hands, and tugged the suitcase free. Barney, Dillinger, and Markoff Cheney crowded close to look as he snapped the lock and lifted the top. I'll be damned and double damned, Barney Muldoon said in a small, hollow voice. My fellow Americans, it is with a heavy heart that I come before you for the second time today. Many irresponsible elements have reacted to the national emergency with mad animal panic and they are endangering all the rest of us. I assure you again, in the words of a great former leader, that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. The face on the TV screen expressed absolute confidence, and many citizens felt a slight upsurge in hope. Actually, he was totally around the bend on Demerol, and when the White House had burned earlier in the day, his most constructive suggestion had been, let's toast some marshmallows before we leave. Even as I speak to you, the director of the FBI has assured me that his men are closing in on the one single plague carrier who has caused all this hysteria. If you stay in your homes, you will be safe, and the emergency will soon be over. Rosebuds, cried John Dillinger. Why the hell would he bring a suitcase full of rosebuds down here? Outside Lehman Cave, Saul loads the antidote needle. I'll go first, says John Herbert Dillinger, rolling up his sleeve. At this hour, when your government needs your faith. In a fusillade of bullets, the president sank beneath the podium, leaving only the seal of the chief executive on the TV screens. The viewers saw the same confident expression on his face as he floated in Demerol tranquility toward death. Oh my God, said an announcer's voice off screen. In Mad Dog, John Hoover Dillinger looks at Jim Cartwright quizzically. Whose conspiracy was behind that? He asks as the announcer gibbers hysterically. There seems to have been five people shooting from five different parts of the press corps, but the president may not be dead. They blew his fucking head to a pulp. Another voice near the microphone said, distinctly and hopelessly.
Appendix Calf, The Rosy Double Cross. Saul, Barney, Markov, Cheney and Dillinger were all puzzled that a man like Carmel would bring a suitcase full of roses with him when fleeing to Lehman Cavern. Those who knew Carmel in Las Vegas were even more perplexed when this fact was made public. The first readers of this romance were not only puzzled and perplexed, but petulant, since they knew Carmel had loaded his briefcase with Maldonado's money, not with roses. The explanation, as is usually the case when seeming magic has occurred, was simple. Carmel was the victim of the oldest swindle in the world, the Akana Bora, Gypsy Switch. It was his custom to transport his earnings to the bank in the same suitcase which he used when looting Maldonado's safe. His figure and the suitcase were well known to the shadier elements in Las Vegas, and among these were three gentlemen who decided early in April to intercept him during one of his journeys and remove the suitcase from his possession, using, as young people say, any means necessary. They even considered striking him upon the temple with a blunt instrument. One of the gentlemen involved in this project, John Wayne Malatesta, however, had a sense of humour of sorts, and began to devise a plan involving a non-violent gypsy switch. Mr Malatesta thought it would be amusing if this could be carried off smoothly, and Carmel, arriving at the bank, opened a case full of horse manure, human excrement, or something else in equally dubious taste. The other two gentlemen were persuaded that this might indeed be worth a laugh. A substitute suitcase was purchased, and a plan was devised. Two changes were made at virtually the last minute. Mr Malatesta learned from Bonnie Quint, a lady whose company he often enjoyed at one hundred dollars a throw, that Carmel suffered acutely from rose fever. A more hilarious image occurred to him, Carmel opening the case in the bank and starting to sneeze spasmodically while trying to figure out where the switch had been made. The roses were purchased, and the caper was set for the next day. When Carmel, Dr. Naismith and Markov Cheney collided, Malatesta and his associates abandoned the switch idea. Two collisions in a few minutes would be more than a man like Carmel would accept without profound suspicion. They therefore decided to follow him to his house and revert to the more old-fashioned but time-proven technique of the sudden rap on the skull. When Bonnie Quint left after her violent interview with Carmel, the bandits prepared to enter. To their amazement, Carmel came running out, threw his suitcase into his jeep, and then ran back in. He had forgotten his candies. "'It's God's will,' Malatesta said piously. The switch was made, and they took off for Point South in a great hurry. Several weeks after the crisis had passed, a state trooper found a car with three dead men in it off the road in a ditch. His own symptoms were self-diagnosed while he waited for the coroner's crew to arrive, and he received the antidote in time. The empty suitcase in the car caused only minor speculation. A Gila monster had obviously eaten most of one side of it to shreds. Whatever they had in there, the trooper said later, must have been pretty light. The wind blew it all over the freaking desert. It started almost the instant the music began. A mile below the surface of the lake, near the opposite shore, an army began to rise from the dead. The black uniformed corpses broke loose from their moorings, rose to the surface, and began to drift toward shore. As more and more of the semblance of life returned, the drifting became swimming motions, then wading. They fell into ranks on the shore. Under the steel helmets, their complexions were greenish, their eyes heavily lidded, their black lips drawn back in wide grimaces. The mouths of the officers and non-coms moved, forming words of command, though no sound came forth. No sound was needed, it seemed, for the orders were instantly obeyed. Once again, the power that had been granted to Adolf Hitler by the Illuminated Lodge in 1923, because you are so preposterous, they told him at the time, the power that had manifested itself in steel-helmed armies that had won Hitler and empires stretching from Stalingrad to the Atlantic, from the Arctic Circle to the Saharan Desert, once again that power was visible on the earth. They are coming, I can feel it, Werner whispered to his twin Wilhelm as Wolfgang thundered on the drums and Winifred belted out. 
This is the dawning of the age of Bavaria. Age of Bavaria. 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 The tanks and artillery were rolling into position. The caterpillar treads of the troop carriers were churning. Motorcycle couriers sped up and down the beach. The dead men removed black rubber sheaths from rolled up red, white, and black banners and unfurled them. Many of them were the familiar swastika flags and banners of the Third Reich, with one addition. A red eye and pyramid device superimposed on the center of each swastika. Other banners carried Gothic letter mottos such as Drang nach Oisten and Heute de Welt, Morgens das Sonnensystem. At last, all was in readiness. The blue-black lips of General of the SS Rudolf Hampfgeis, thirty years dead, shaped the command to march, which was relayed in similar fashion from the higher-ranking officers to the lower-ranking officers to the men. The lights and music on the opposite shore beckoned across the dark, bottomless waters. Moonlight glinting on the death's heads on their caps and runic SS insignia on their collars, the soldiers moved out, company by company. The only sound was the growl of the diesel engines of troop carriers and the clank of weapons. They're coming, said the woman under Hagbard, who was neither Mavis nor Stella nor Mao, but a woman with straight black hair, olive skin, fierce black eyebrows, and a bony face. Coming, mother, said Hagbard, giving himself up to the irresistible onward sweep of sensation, to the brink of orgasm, and over. I'm not your mother, said the woman. Your mother was a blonde, blue-eyed Norwegian, and I look Greek now, I think. You're the mother of all of us, said Hagbard, kissing her sweat-damp neck. Ah, <sighs> said the woman. <laughs> Is that who I am? Then we're getting somewhere. Then I started to flip. Malik, eclipsed by Malik Clips and Chalene, hardly serene. Mary Lou, I worship you. The red eye is my own mooning. What is the meaning of moaning? And such like seminal semantic antics. My head is a quick tran quicksand, where the territorial imperative always triggers stay off my turf. The Latin and the Saxon at war and poor Simon synapses. Dead men fighting for use of my tongue. Turning population explosion into we're fucking overcrowded and backward also. So it might emerge copulation explosion, and besides, hag bared straights from this black and white mass, the acid was in me. I was tripping, flipping, skipping, ripping, on my way with Mautsy Tautsy, for the number of Our Lady is a hundred and fifty and six. There is wickedom, but I never expected it this way. What do you see? I asked Mary Lou. Some people who are swimming coming out of the lake? What do you see? Not what I'm supposed to see. For the front line, clear as Claritas, was Mescalito from my peyote visions, and Osiris with enormous female breasts, and Spider-Man, and the Tarot Magus, and good old Charlie Brown, and Bugs Bunny with a Tommy gun, and Jughead, and Archie, and Captain America, and Hermes thrice blessed, and Zeus and Athena, and Zagreus with his lynxes and panthers, and Mickey Mouse and Superman, and Santa Claus, and laughing Buddha Jesus and a million million birds, canaries, and budgies, and gaunt herons, and holy crows, and crowly hoes, and eagles, and hawks, and morning doves, for morning never ends. And they'd all been stoned since the late Devonian period, when they first started eating hemp seeds. No wonder Huxley found birds the most emotional class of life, singing all the time, stoned out of their bird brain skulls, all singing, I circle around, I circle around, except the minor birds squawking, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And I remembered again that existence isn't sensible any more than it's hot or red or high or sour. Only parts of existence have those qualities. And then there was the zigzag man. And my God, my God, my Father, leading them in singing. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The Union makes us strong. I say, said an Englishman, I thought he was a monster. And he's only 
toad of Toad Hall, with Rat and Tinkerbell and Wendy and Bottom. That's who you are, said Hagbard. If you can call that any kind of a fucking identity. I think it's time you went up on stage and made our little announcement, said the woman. I think everyone is ready for that. Hagbard has been putting us on all along, Simon says dreamily. It doesn't matter in the first bardo. Those Nazis have been dead for thirty years, period. He just brought us here to put us on a trip. Nothing is coming out of the lake. I'm hallucinating everything. Something is happening, Mary Lou insisted vehemently. Oh, it's got nothing to do with the lake. That's a red herring to distract us from the real battle between your Hagbard and those crazy musicians up there. If I wasn't tripping, my head would work better, damn it. It's got something to do with sound waves. The sound waves are turning solid in the air. <laughs> Whatever it is, the rest of us aren't supposed to understand it. This lake thing is just to give us something we can understand or almost understand. Her black face was intense with intelligence, battling against the ocean of undigestible information pouring in through all of her senses. Dad! Simon cried, weeping happily. Tell me the word. You must know now. What is the word? Cather, said Tim Moon, blissfully. Cather? That's all? It, it, just cabalism? Simon shook his head. It can't be that simple. Cather, Tim Moon repeats firmly. Right here in the middle of Malkuth. As above, so below. I see the throne of the world. One single chair, twenty-three feet off the ground, studded with seventeen rubies, and brooding over it, the serpent swallowing its tail, the rosy cross, and the eye. Who was that nice man? Mary Lou asked. My father, Simon said, really weeping now. And I may never see him again. Mourning never ends. And then I understood why Hagbard had given us the acid, why the weather underground and moratory used it constantly. Because I started to die. I literally felt myself dwindling to a point and approaching absolute zero. I was so shit scared, I grabbed Simon's hand and said, Help! in a weak voice. And if he had said, Admit you're a cop first, then I'll help, I sure as hell would have told him everything, blurted it all out. But he just smiled, squeezed my hand gently, and murmured, It's alive. And it was. The point was giving off light and energy, my light and my energy, but God's also. And it wasn't frightening because it was alive and growing. The word omnidirectional halo came to me from somewhere. Was it Hagbard talking to Dillinger? And I looked. Holy key writs, Dillinger split in two as I watched. That's the answer to one question. There were two Dillingers, twins in addition to the fake Dillinger who got shot at the biograph. Zero equals two, I thought, feeling some abstract eternal answer there, along with the answer to some of the questions that had bugged so many writers about Dillinger's criminal career. Like, why some witnesses claimed he was in Miami on that day in 1934, when other witnesses claimed he was robbing a bank and killing a bank guard in East Chicago. And why Hagbard had said something about him being in Las Vegas, when I could see him right here in Ingolstadt. But it was all moving, moving, a single point. But everything coming out of it was moving. A star with swords and wands projecting outward as rays. A crown that was also a cup and a whirling disc. A pure white brilliance that said, I am Patah, come to take you from Memphis to heaven. But I only remembered the cops who beat Daddy up in Memphis and made him swear when he got back that he'd never go south again. And how did that tie in with why he became a cop? And Patah became Zeus, Bacchus, Wotan, and it didn't matter. All were distant and indifferent and cold, 
not gods of humanity, but gods above humanity, gods of the void, brilliant as the diamond, but cold as the diamond. But I also know the real God is beyond God, and the real Illuminati is beyond the Illuminati. The Illuminati we're fighting are puppets of another Illuminati, and so are we. It's alive, baby, Simon repeated. It's alive, and I love you, baby, even if you are a cop. The whole lake is alive. The vibe man with the fillet of soul was trying to explain to the rest of that group. My name is Hagbard Chelin, and the carnival is over. Remove your masks, all players. That's a funny thing for Toad of Toad Hall to say, muttered Fish and Chips to nobody in particular, but the voice came booming back. My name is Hagbard Chelin. Please don't panic when you hear what I've got to say to you. And Chips saw that it wasn't Toad of Toad Hall, or even the sinister Saint Toad, but just a well-dressed wop with two faces, one smiling and one frowning in wrath. You know, 0005 said aloud, I do believe there was a fucking drug in that water. My name is Hagbar Chilin. Please don't panic when you hear what I have to say to you. Pay close attention. I have come to tell you that your lives are in grave danger. At this moment, an army is marching around the shore of Lake Totenkopf for the purpose of massacring all the people attending this festival. Jesus, said George, this is never going to work. He's putting it so badly they'll never believe him. They'll laugh at him. Three quarters of them don't even understand English. Is that how it sounds to you? said Malaclips, as if he's speaking in English. It also sounds to me as if he's saying everything in a flat, direct way. But I hear him speaking in the Greek dialect of Athens, in the 5th century BCE. What do you mean? He's actually talking in Norwegian or Italian, whichever language he knows best. 
is using what I call the Pentecost gimmick. It's described in the Acts of Apostles as the gift of tongues. After the death of Jesus, the apostles were sitting together on the Feast of Pentecost, when tongues of fire appeared over their heads. Then they went out and preached to a crowd of people from many different countries, and each person heard the sermons in his own language and in the form most likely to persuade him. They made tens of thousands of converts to Christianity that way. I was the one who laid the trick on them, though they never knew that. Speaking in tongues, said George in wonderment. They used to preach about it in Bible class. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Don't play games with yourself, George. You know perfectly well that a moment ago I was Mavis. It's a giant black woman! It's Goethe's mother night, somebody was saying. But I was thinking of 69ing with Simon. Ooh, the tricks that cat knows to please a woman to make you feel like a queen on a throne. And I don't care if he knows I'm a cop. There's always a sorrow after a joy on this plane. Yes, I will always be split in two. The void will always be there at the center. God, yes, the mask of night is on my face like I read in Shakespeare in school. I am the river, yellow with sewage. And cocksucker is a dirty word, but what else is the sign of cancer or that yin-yang all about? Christ, I love doing it. Women who claim they don't are just liars. I hate him and I love him. The ambiguity is always there. That detective who wanted to praise me that time said, You've got balls for a woman. But how would it sound if I said to him, You've got tits for a man? Throne after throne cast down into the void, and yet I have the power. All their worshipping and their trinities and pyramids are symbols of the cunt. And it's hot again. But I just want him to hold me. I can't bawl now. I can't speak. I see my father's face, but it's silver instead of black. And all of a sudden, I knew Joe Malik had a gun, and even that he had a silver bullet in it. Mother of God, does he think Hagbard is something inhuman? And I smelled opium mixed with hash. Those are heavy cats in the plastic canoe. I could feel the energy surging through me. I'm in the tent and I'm being fucked by all the men. I'm Mavis and Stella. And I'm the mother of all of them. I am Demeter and Frigga and Sybil as well as Eris. And I am Nephthys, the black sister of Isis of whom none dare speak. And I can even see why Joe Malik blew up his own office. It was a trap and Hagbard fell into it. Joe knows his secret now. It all came in, solid and three-dimensional, and I felt mercy flowing from me like some psychological monthly with water instead of blood. I even forgave the American Medical Association, all four of them separately and distinctly. I was Isis, all purple and blue, and veiled, and even if Poseidon was rising in that lake, I could forgive him too. He was covered with olives and shamrocks, a green water god glistening like amethyst with one huge unicorn horn. And then he was Endra, the rainmaker whose voice of thunder was only a disguised blessing. I obeyed him and put the doll in the tetrahedron. There was nothing to fear for all that would happen were blessings and good things. As the brilliant ones descended, bringing their white fire to the red earth, the work would be perfected in pleasure, not pain. For I even knew that Joe found out Pat Walsh's memos were misleading, because Hagbard wanted him to find out, and wanted him to plant the bomb, and even wanted him to come here tonight with the gun. So it all makes sense. If you had a model of the globe with a black light flashing for every death, and a white light for every time somebody comes, it would seem to be glowing all the time. That's what's so good about being a woman. I can come and come and come, oh God, as many times as I want. And men, even Simon, hardly ever come more than once in a night. That mean Miss Forbes in first grade, she needed a good lay, but I can even forgive her. Everyone must leave the festival area, Hagbard was saying. The resurrected Nazis intend to slaughter all of you. Fortunately, we have had time to build you a pathway to safety. Behold.
He stretched out his arm, and the spotlight moved beyond him to the lake, illuminating a great pontoon bridge stretching from the festival area on the eastern shore diagonally to the lake's northwest corner. It had been silently erected by Hagbard's crew, with the indispensable help of Howard and the Dolphins, during the last hour. Wow, George said to Malaclips. I suppose you'd call that the Red Sea gimmick. Hagbard lifted his hands. I name that the Adam Weishaupt Bridge. Everyone will now rise and proceed in an orderly fashion to walk across the lake. Suddenly, everybody was aroused and moving. Simon was leading me gently along. I was back in time again. There was a real fight going on between Hagbard and the American Medical Association. And the fight means that somebody is going to lose. The gates of hell were opening. A giant, blonde god, Thor, swinging his hammer and smashing all the colored races. Red, scarlet, red blood on that hammer, black blood especially. But Hagbard is Horus. This is the way it will always be fighting and killing to the end of time, and women and children, the chief victims. Only the flesh is holy, and men are killers of the flesh. Cannibals. How many do you think there are? The leader of the Close Corporation asked dreamily. Six hundred and sixty-six, one of his group answered. When you sacrifice a rooster in a pentagram on Walpurgis night, you always get six sixty-six. And they're coming right toward us. The leader went on in his dreamy tone. To bow down and serve us. The closed corporation sat perfectly still, in silent ecstasy, awaiting the arrival of the 666 horned and tailed demons they saw approaching them. Are you a turtle? Lady Velcor asks. Huh? Danny Pricefixer responds. Never mind. She says hurriedly. He hears her asking the next man on the right. Are you a turtle? We can send the army to the west side of the lake to intercept them, said Wilhelm. Nine, said Wolfgang, who was standing in the rear of the slowly moving command car, studying the situation through field glasses. That verdumped bridge goes towards the northern shore of the lake. They can go straight while our men go around. They'd all be across before we could reach them. We could shell the bridge from here, said Werner. We don't use the artillery, said Wolfgang. We'd have the whole West German army blundering down here, getting in the way of our drive to the east. If the West Germans start fighting us, the East Germans will not make the mistake we want them to make. They won't think we are an invading West German army. The Russians, in turn, will have plenty of warning. The whole plan will fall through. Let's skip this phase, then, said Winifred. It's too much of a hassle. Let's head immediately eastward and to hell with these kids. Nine again, dear sister, my love, said Wolfgang. We have twenty-three candidates for transcendental illumination, including Hitler himself, waiting up there in the old Führer suite of the Donau Hotel. The speedy mass termination of all those lives is to translate them to eternal life on the energy plane. And I will not let that scheisskopf Hagbar Shalin thwart us at this juncture. I mean to show him once and for all which of us is master. And all the rest of those Schweinen. Dillinger, the Dili Lum, Melacalypse, the old lady herself if she's here. If all of them are here, it's our chance to make a clean sweep and annihilate the opposition once and for all, at the beginning of the amenitizing of the Eschaton, rather than in the final stage. But we can't catch the kids, said Wilhelm. We can. We shall. It will take a long, long time to move them all across that pontoon bridge, and they're all on foot. We have vehicles and can catch up with them before half of them are even on the bridge. They'll all be bunched together. And those on the bridge will be a perfect target for machine guns. We shall simply sweep in on them, harvesting their lives as we go. 
We spent years building up our identity as the American Medical Association just so we could organize the Ingolstadt Festival and trap masses of human beings on the shore of Lake Totenkorp that our sacred lake might run red with their blood. Would you throw all that away? I agree. A brilliant analysis, said Wilhelm. We must move on at full speed, then, said Wolfgang. He turned to the car behind him and shouted, Forwards! At maximum speed! General of the SS Hanfgeist stood up, turned toward his subordinates, and moved his blackened lips to form the same words. Immediately the tanks, half-tracks, motorcycles, and armored cars began to rev up their engines, and the troops started to trot down the road on the double. A lookout in one of the festival light and sound towers spotted them and relayed a warning to the stage, where Robert Pearson spoke into a microphone. It is my sad duty to inform you that the pigs are intensifying their approach. Now, don't run, but do quicken your pace with all deliberate speed. Hagbard called in through the doorway of the gold tent. John, you've had enough for Discordia's sake. Come on out and let Maliclips go in. I thought you were non-corporeal, said George. If you'd known me for any length of time, you would have noticed that I frequently pick my nose, said the Sartre-like apparition. Woo, said John John Dillinger, emerging from the tent. Who would have thought the old man had so much come in him? She says she wants George in there after Mal. The woman behind the veil was glowing. There was no light in the tent, save for the deep golden radiance that came from her body. Come closer, George, she said. I don't want you to make love to me now. I only want you to learn the truth. Stand here before me. The woman behind the veil was Mavis. Mavis, I love you, said George. I've loved you ever since you took me out of that jail in Mad Dog. Look again, George, said Stella. Stella? What happened to Mavis? I circle around. I circle around. Don't play games with yourself, George. You know perfectly well that a moment ago I was Mavis. It's the acid, said George. The acid only opens your eyes, George. It doesn't work miracles said Miss Mao. I circle around. I circle around. Oh my God, said George, and he thought, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mavis was there again. Do you understand, George? Do you understand why you never saw all of us together at once? Do you understand why all the time you wanted to fuck me that when you were fucking Stella, you were fucking me? And do you understand that I'm not one woman, or three women, but an infinite number of women? Before his eyes, she turned red, yellow, black, brown, young, middle-aged, a child, an old woman, a Norwegian blonde, a Sicilian brunette, a wild-eyed Greek woman, a tall Ashanti, 
a slant-eyed Maasai, a Japanese, a Chinese, a Vietnamese, and on and on and on. The pale face kept turning colors, the way people do when you're on peyote. Now he looked almost like an Indian. That's what made it easier to talk to him. Why shouldn't people turn colors? All the trouble in the world came from the fact that they usually stayed the same color. James nodded profoundly. As usual, peyote had brought him a big truth. If whites and blacks and Indians were turning colors all the time, there wouldn't be any hate in the world, because nobody would know which people to hate. Who the hell's mind was that? George wondered. The tent was dark. He looked around for the woman. He rushed out of the tent. No one was looking at him. They were all, Hagbard and the rest of them, staring in awe at a colossal figure that grew ever taller as it strode away from them. It was a golden woman in golden robes with wild gold red black hair flowing free. She stepped over the fence that guarded the festival grounds as casually as if it were the threshold of a door. She towered over the Bavarian pines. In her left hand, she carried an enormous golden orb. Hagbard put his hand on George's shoulder. It is possible, he said, to achieve transcendental illumination through a multiplicity of orgasms as well as through a multiplicity of deaths. There were lights advancing down the road. The woman, now ninety-three feet tall, strode toward those lights. She laughed, and the laughter echoed across Lake Totenkopf. Great Gruad, what's that? cried Werner. It's the old woman! shouted Wolfgang, his lips falling away from his teeth in a snarl. The sudden cry, Kalisti, reverberated through the Bavarian hills louder than the music of the Ingolstadt festival had been. Trailing a comet-like cloud of sparks, the golden apple fell into the center of the advancing army. The super-Nazis might have been the living dead, but they were still human. What each man saw in the apple was his heart's desire. Private Heinrich Krauss saw the family he had left behind thirty years ago, not knowing that his living grandchildren were at this moment on the pontoon bridge across Lake Totenkopf, fleeing his advance. Corporal Gottfried Kuntz saw his mistress, who in reality had been raped and then disemboweled by Russian soldiers when Berlin fell in 1945. Uber-Lieutenant Sigmund Voigel saw a ticket to the Wagner Festival at Bayreuth. Colonel S.S. Conrad Schein saw a hundred Jews lined up before a machine gun that awaited his hand on the trigger. Obergrappenfuhrer Ernst Bickler saw a blue china soup tureen standing in an empty fireplace at his grandmother's house in Kassel. It was a brimful of steaming brown dog shit into which was plunged a silver spoon. General Humpfgeist saw Adolf Hitler, his face blackened, his eyes and tongue bulging out, his neck broken, spinning at the end of a hangman's rope. All of the men who saw the apple, in whatever form, began to fight and kill one another for possession. Tanks smashed into one another head-on. Artillerymen lowered the barrels of their guns and fired point-blank into the center of the melee. "'What is it, Wolfgang?' said Winifred imploringly, her arms thrown in panic around his waist. "'Look into the center of the battle,' said Wolfgang grimly. "'What do you see?' "'I see the throne of the world.' One single chair, twenty-three feet off the ground, studded with seventeen rubies, and brooding over it, the serpent swallowing its tail, the rosy cross, and the eye. I see that throne, and know that I alone am to ascend it, and occupy it forever. What do you see? I see Hagbard Celine's twofold shice head on a silver platter. Wolfgang snarled thrusting her from him with trembling hands. Ares has thrown the apple of discord, and our super-Nazis will fight and kill each other until we destroy it.
Where did she go? asked Werner. She's lurking about somewhere in some other form, no doubt, said Wolfgang. As a toadstool or an owl or some such thing, cackling over the chaos she's caused. Suddenly Wilhelm stood up, his fingers clawing at empty air. In a frightfully clumsy fashion, as if he were deaf, dumb, and blind, he clawed and clambered his way over the side of the Mercedes that had belonged to von Ronstedt. Once out of the car, he took a position about ten feet away from his brothers and sister, turned, and faced them. His eyes stared, every muscle in his body was rigid, the crotch of his trousers bulged. The voice that came out of his mouth was deep, rich, oleaginous, and horrid. There are long accounts to set all children of Gruard. Wolfgang forgot the sounds of battle that raged around him. You! Here? How did you escape? The voice was like crude petroleum seeping through gravel. And like petroleum, it was a fossil thing. The voice of a creature that had arisen on the planet when the South Pole was in the Sahara and the great cephalopods were the highest form of life. I took no notice. The geometries ceased to bind me. I came forth. I ate souls. Fresh souls. Not the miserable plasma you have fed me all these years. Great Gruad! Is that your gratitude? Wolfgang stormed. In a lower voice he said to Werner, Find the talisman. I think it's in the black place, sealed with the seal of Solomon on the eye of Nut. To the being that occupied Wilhelm's body, he said, You come at an opportune time. There will be much killing here, and many souls to eat. These around us have no souls. They have only pseudo-life. It sickens me to sense them. Wolfgang laughed. <laughs> Even the Luigar can feel disgust, then. I have been sick for many hundreds of years, while you kept me sealed in one pentagon after another, feeding me not fresh souls, but those wretched stored essences. We gave you much, cried Werner. Every year, just for you, thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand deaths in traffic accidents alone. But not fresh. Not fresh. Perhaps, though, so. you can settle your debt to me tonight. I sense many lives nearby. Lives you have somehow lured here. They can be mine. Werner handed Wolfgang a stick with a silver pentagon at the tip. Wolfgang pointed it at the possessed Wilhelm, who shrieked and fell to his knees. For a moment there was silence, broken only by the sound of Winifred's terrified sobbing and the crack of rifles and the chatter of machine guns in the background. You shall not have those lives, Yog Sothoth. They are for the transcendental illumination of our servants. Wait, though, and there shall be lives in plenty for all of us. Werner said. While we parley, our army is destroying itself, and there will be no lives for anyone. Really? said the thick voice. How has your plan gone astray? Let me read you and learn. Wolfgang felt goose pimples break out all over his body. He shuddered as coarse, boneless fingers dripping with slime turned the pages of his mind. Hmm, I see. She is here, then. It would be good to meet her in battle once again. Are your powers equal to hers? said Wolfgang, eagerly. I yield to none, came the proud reply. Ask him why he's always getting trapped in pentagons, then, said Werner in a low voice. Shut up, Wolfgang whispered savagely. To the Luigar, he said, Destroy her golden apple and release my army to move ahead, and I will withhold the power of this pentagon and give you all the lives you seek. Done, said the voice. Wilhelm suddenly threw back his head, mouth wide open. A choking sound came from his throat. He collapsed on his back, spread-eagled. A strange, greenish, glowing gas rose from his throat. Werner jumped from the car and rushed over to Wilhelm. He's alive! 
Of course he's alive, said Wolfgang. The Eater of Souls simply took possession of his body to communicate with us. Winifred screamed. Look! The same phosphorescent gas, a huge cloud of it, now obscured the heart of the battle. It seemed to take a shape like a spider with an uncountable number of legs, arms, antenna, and tentacles. Gradually the shape changed, glowing brighter and brighter. A nearby tower on the festival grounds was as visible in the reflected light as if it were day. Then the glow faded, and the tower was silhouetted in moonlight. A great silence fell over the hills around Lake Totenkopf, broken only by the glad cries of the last contingent of festival-goers as they made it safely to the opposite shore. "'There's no time to lose,' Wolfgang said to Werner and Wilhelm. "'Round up some officers. See if you can find Hanfgeist.' Hanfgeist had disappeared. The highest-ranking officer surviving was Ubergruppenführer Bickler, visions of dog turds sadly fading in a mind that possessed only a horrid semblance of life. A quick survey showed the four Illuminati Primi that the Apple of Discord had cost them half their army. Onward! roared Wolfgang, and, tanks in the van, they smashed through the festival fence, raced over the hills, troops trotting double time, and unhesitatingly charged out onto the bridge. Wolfgang stood at the back seat of the von Rundstedt Mercedes, his black-gloved hands gripping the back of the front seat, the wind blowing through his crew cut like a field of wheat. Suddenly, beside him, Wilhelm screamed. "'What is it now?' yelled Wolfgang over the roar of his advancing army. "'The lives we are about to take,' the voice of the Luigar grated. "'They are mine, yes? All mine.' "'Listen to me, you energy vampire. "'We have other debts to discharge and other projects to complete. "'There are twenty-three of our faithful servants "'waiting in the Dono Hotel to be transcendentally illuminated. "'They come first. "'You'll get yours. Wait your turn.' "'Farewell,' said the Luigar. "'I shall see you at the hour of your death. "'I will never die!' Fool! The voice shrieked with Wilhelm's mouth. Suddenly, Wilhelm stood up, threw open the door of the car, and hurled himself out into the lake. He struck with a huge splash, then sank like a stone. A greenish glow spread in the black water where he had gone down. And then there were four. Hagbard stood atop a hill, watching the tanks roll across the bridge, followed by the black Mercedes, followed by troop carriers and artillery, followed by trotting foot soldiers. He knelt beside a detonator and shoved down the handle. Oh, jeez. From end to end, the bridge and those upon it disappeared in geysers of white water. The thunder of explosions... Demolition charges placed by the Porpoise Horde under the direction of Howard re-echoed through the hills around the lake. The tanks went under first. As the front end of the command car sank under water, Werner Sauer screamed, My foot's caught! He went down with the car, while Wolfgang and Winifred, their tears mingling with the water of Lake Totenkopf, splashed about in the water with a few remaining super-Nazis. And then there were three. Hagbard shouted, I sank it! I sank the George Washington Bridge! Is anything changed? said George. Of course, said Hagbard. We've got them on the run. We'll be able to finish them off in a few more minutes. Then there'll be no more evil in the world. Everything will be ginger peachy. His tone seemed sarcastic rather than victorious, George noted apprehensively. Now... I'll admit, Fission Chip said reasonably, that I'm under the influence of some bloody drug from the Kool-Aid. But this simply cannot all be hallucination. Very definitely, thirteen people took their clothes off and started dancing. I quite certainly heard them singing, Blessed Be, Blessed Be, over and over. Then, a simply gigantic woman rose up from somewhere, and all the sirens and undines and mermaids went back into the water. If this was Armageddon, it was not precisely the way the Bible described it. Is that 
a fair summary of the situation? The tree he was talking to didn't answer. Blessed be, blessed be. Lady Velcor sang on as she and her hastily assembled coven danced Wittershins in their circle. The spell had worked. With her own eyes she had seen the great mother, Isis, rise up and smite the evil spirits of the dead Catholic Inquisitors whom the Illuminati had tried to revive. She knew Hagbard Chalene would later be boasting in all the most chic occult circles that he had performed the miracle and giving the credit to that destructive bitch Eris, but that didn't matter. She, with her own eyes, had seen Isis, and that was enough. Now, I ask you, Fission Chips went on, addressing another tree who seemed more communicative. What the sulfurous hell did you see happening here tonight? I saw a master magician, said the tree, or a master conman, the two are the same, plant a few suggestions and get a bunch of acid heads running away from their own shadows. The tree, who was actually Joe Malik and only looked like a tree to poor befuddled 00005, added, or I saw the final battle between good and evil, with Horus on both sides. You must be drugged, too, Chip said pettishly. You bet your sweet ass I am said the tree, walking away. Wolfgang and Winifred were very near shore when the dark, humped shapes rose out of the water around them. Winifred shrieked, Wolfgang! For the love of God! Wolfgang! They are pulling me down! And then there were two. The porpoises have her! Wolfgang thought to himself. He continued to swim madly toward shore. Something caught his trouser leg, but he kicked free. Then he was in the shallows, too close in for the sea beasts to follow. He stood up and waded ashore, and came face to face with John Dillinger. Sorry, pal, said John, and squeezed the trigger of his Thompson submachine gun. <laughs>
Book 5 Grummet The bursts to the moon and to the planets are also not historic events. They are the major evolutionary breakthroughs. Today, when we speak of immortality and of going to another world, we no longer mean these in a theological or metaphysical sense. People are now striving for physical immortality. People are now traveling to other worlds. Transcendence is no longer a metaphysical concept. It has become reality. F. M. Esfandieri Upwingers The Tenth Trip or Malkuth Farewell to Planet Earth Ye have locked yourselves up in cages of fear, and behold, do ye now complain that ye lack freedom. Lord Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst, K.S.C. Epistle to the Paranoids The Honest Book of Truth As the earth turned on its axis, and dawn reached city after city, hamlet after hamlet, farm after farm, mountain and valley after mountain and valley, it became obvious that May 1st would be bright and sunny almost everywhere. In Athens, a classical scholar waking in the small cell where certain platonic opinions had landed him felt a burst of unexpected hope and greeted Helios with rolling syllables from Sappho crying through the bars, Brododactylos Eos! Birds, startled by the shout, took off from the jail yard below, filling the air with the flapping of their wings. The guards came and told him to shut up. He answered them gaily with, Polyfloy's boys, Thalassus! You've taken everything else away from me, but you can't take old Homer away. In Paris, the communists under the red banner and the anarchists under the black were preparing for the annual International Labor Solidarity Day, at which the usual factionalism and sectarianism would once again demonstrate the absolute lack of international labor solidarity. And in London, Berlin, a thousand cities, the red and the black would wave and the tongues of their partisans would wag, and the age-old longing for a classless society would once again manifest itself, while in the same cities an older name and an older purpose for that day would be commemorated in convent after convent and school after school, where verses far older than the name of Christianity were sung to the Mother of God, Queen of the Angels, Queen of the May. In the United States, alas, the usual celebrations of National Law Day had to be canceled since the rioting was not quite ended yet. But everywhere, in Asia and Africa, as in Europe and the Americas, the members of the oldest religion were returning from their festivals, murmuring, Blessed be, as they parted, secure in their knowledge that the Mother of God was indeed still alive and had visited them at midnight, whether they knew her as Diane, Dan, Tan, Tana, Shakti, or even Urzuli. Queen of the Angels, Queen of the May in Nairobi, Nkrumah Fubar picked up his mail from a friend employed at the post office. To his delight, American Express had relented and corrected their error, crediting him with his February 2nd payment at last. This was, to his thinking, big magic, since the notification had been mailed from New York even before he began his geodesic spiels against the president of American Express on April 25th. Obviously, such retroactive witchcraft was worthy of further investigation, and the key was the synergetic geometry of the fuller tetrahedron, in which he had kept his mannequin during the spellcasting. Over breakfast, before leaving for the university, he opened Fuller's No More Second-Hand God, and again grappled with the arcane mathematics and metaphysics of omnidirectional halo. Finishing breakfast, he closed the book, shut his eyes, and tried to visualize the fuller universe. The image formed, and to his amazement and amusement, it was identical with certain symbols an old Kikuyu witch doctor had once drawn when explaining the doctrine of fan-shaped destiny to him. As the book closed in Kenya, the drums of the Orabi stopped abruptly. It was one in the morning there, and the visiting anthropologist, Indul Ring, immediately asked how the dancers knew the ceremony was finished. The danger is past, an old Hopi told him patiently. Can't you feel the difference in the air? 
Saul, Barney, and Markov Cheney were racing toward Las Vegas in the rented Brontosaurus, while Dillinger was leisurely driving back toward Los Angeles. In Honolulu, as the clock struck nine the previous evening, Buckminster Fuller, trotting between airplanes, suddenly caught a glimpse of a new geodesic structure fully incorporating omnidirectional halo. And after a four-hour flight eastward, landing in Tokyo at the same time he left Honolulu, he had a detailed sketch finished. It looked somewhat fan-shaped, as the no-smoking fastened seatbelt sign flashed. It was 4 a.m. in Los Angeles, and Dillinger, safely home, he thought, heard the gunfire dying out in the distance. The president must already be withdrawing the National Guard, at least in part, he thought. The phone by Rebecca's bed rang just then, 8 o'clock New York time, and she answered it to hear Molly Muldoon shout excitedly, Sal and Barney are on TV! Turn it on! They've saved the country! In Las Vegas, Barney blinked under the TV lights and stared woodenly into the camera, while Saul kept his eyes on the interviewer and spoke in his kindly family doctor persona. Would you tell our viewers, Inspector Goodman, how you happen to be looking in layman caves for the missing man? The interviewer had the professional tone of all TV newscasters. His intonation wouldn't have changed if he'd been asking, And why did you find our sponsor's product more satisfactory? Or, How did you feel when you learned you had brain cancer? Saul's tone was neutral, descriptive, but in New York, Rebecca's heart skipped a beat. This was the new Saul talking, the one who was no longer on the side of law and order. So you just asked yourself, where's a good-sized hole near Las Vegas? That was all there was to him, yes. The American people will certainly be grateful to you. And how did it happen that you got involved in this case? You're with the New York Police Department, aren't you? How will he answer that one? Rebecca wondered. Just then the phone rang. Turning down the TV sound, she lifted the phone and said, Yes? I can tell by your voice you're the kind of woman who fully meets the criteria of my value system, said August Personage. I want to lick your ass and your pussy and have you piss on me and... Well, that's a most amazing story, Inspector Goodman, the interviewer was saying. Oh, hell, Rebecca thought. Saul's expression was so sincere that she knew he had just told one of the most outrageous lies of his life. The phone rang again. With a pounce, Rebecca grabbed it and shouted, Listen, you creep. If you keep calling me... That's no way to talk to a man who just saved the world, Saul's voice said mildly. Saul, but you're on television. They videotaped that a half hour ago. I'm at the Las Vegas airport about to take a jet to Washington. I'm having a conference with the president. My God, what are you going to tell him? As much, Saul pronounced, as an asshole like him can understand. In Los Angeles, Dr. Vulcan Troll watched the seismograph move upward toward grade two. That still isn't serious, but he scratched a note to the graduate student who would soon be replacing him. If this jumps to three, call me at my house. Then he drove home, passing Dillinger's bungalow, humming happily, thankful that the rioting was ending and the guard was being withdrawn. At the lab, the graduate student, reading a paperback titled Carnal Orgy, didn't notice when the graph jumped past three and hit four. Danny Price Fixer, waking in Ingolstadt, glanced at his wristwatch. Noon. My God, he thought. Sleeping so late was a major sin in his system of morality. Then he remembered a little of last night, and smiled contentedly, turning in the bed to kiss Lady Velcor's neck. A huge black arm hung over the other shoulder, and a black hand, limp in sleep, held her breast. My God! Danny said out loud, remembering more, as Clark Kent sat up groggily and stared at him. Smiling Jim Treponema, at that moment, was navigating a very dangerous pass in the mountains of Northern California. Strapped to his back was a 6mm Remington Model 700 bolt-action rifle with six-power Bushnell telescope. A canteen of whiskey was hooked to one side of his belt and a canteen of water to the other. He was perspiring from labor, in spite of the altitude, but he was one of the few happy people in the country, since he had been nowhere near a radio for three days and had missed the whole terror connected with anthrax leprosy pie plague, the declaration of martial law, and the riotings and bombings. He was on his yearly vacation, free from the sewer of smut in which he was submerged forty-nine weeks of the year, the foulness and filth in which he heroically struggled daily, risking his soul for the good of his fellow citizens. 
and he was breathing clean air and thinking clean thoughts. Specifically, as an avid hunter, he had read that only one American eagle still survived, and he was determined to be immortalized in hunting literature as the man who killed it. He knew well, of course, how ecologists and conservationists would regard that achievement, but their opinions didn't bother him. A bunch of fags, commies, and smutnuts. That was his estimate of those bleeding heart types. Probably smoked dope, too. Not a man's man among them. He shifted his rifle, which was pressing his sweat-soaked shirt uncomfortably, and climbed onward and upward. Mama Sutra stared at the central tarot card in the Tree of Life. It was the Fool. Pardon me, the little Italian tree said. This is getting ridiculous, Fish and Chips muttered. I don't intend to spend the rest of my life in conversation with trees. I am a tree worth talking to. The dark-skinned tree with her hair in a bun persisted. He squinted. I know what you are, he said finally. Half tree and half woman, ergo a dryad, benefit of classical education. Very good, said the dryad. But when you stop tripping, you're going to crash. You'll remember London and your job, and you'll wonder how you're going to explain the last month to them. Somebody stole a month from me. Chips agreed pleasantly. A cynical old swine named the Dealey Lama, or another fella named Toad. Bad lot. Shouldn't go around stealing months. The tree handed him an envelope. Try not to lose that, she said. It'll make everybody in your office so happy that they'll accept any story you make up to explain how it took you a month to get it. What is it? The name of every bugger agent in the British government, together with the false names they use for the bank accounts where they keep all the money they can't account for, and the account numbers and the names of the banks too, in one nice package. All it needs is a red ribbon. I think my leg is being pulled again," said Chips. But he was coming down, and he opened the envelope and peered at the contents. This is real," he asked. They won't be able to account for the money," the tree assured him. Some very interesting confessions will be obtained. Who the devil are you?" Chips asked, seeing a teenage Italian girl and not a tree. "I'm your holy guardian angel," she said. "You look like an angel," Chips admitted grudgingly. "But I don't believe any of this. Time travel, talking trees, giant toads—none of it." Somebody slipped me a drug. Yes, somebody slipped you a drug, but I'm your holy guardian angel, and I'm slipping you this envelope, and it'll make everything all right back in London. All you have to do is make up a halfway reasonable lie. I was held prisoner in a bugger dungeon with a beautiful Eurasian love slave. Chips began improvising. <laughs> Very good. She said, "They won't believe it, but they'll think you believe it. That's good enough." Who are you, really? But the tree only repeated, "Don't lose that envelope," and walked away, turning into an Italian teenager again, and then into a gigantic woman carrying a golden apple. Annie Price Fixer was wandering around in the dark with Lady Velcor and Clark Kent, feeling absolutely wonderful, when Miss Portnari intercepted him. This will interest you. She said, handing him an envelope similar to the one she had handed Fish and Chips. "What is it?" he asked, seeing her as a Greek woman in classic robes holding a golden apple. "Take a look." He opened the envelope and found a picture of Tobias Knight and Zev Hirsch in the middle of the confrontation office, setting the timer on the bomb. "This man," she said, pointing to Knight, "is willing to turn state's evidence against both Hirsch and Atlanta Hope." You've wanted to nab them for a long time, haven't you? Who are you? Danny asked, staring. I am the one Mama Sutra told you of, the one appointed to contact you here in Ingolstadt. I am of the Illuminated. What are those two talking about? Clark Kent asked Lady Velcor. <laughs> Who knows? She shrugged. They're both tripping. God's lightning is the most active front in America today for the cult of the yellow sign. Miss Portnari went on, telling the mark the tale. A few feet away, Joe Malik said to Hagbard, 
I don't like frame-ups. Even for people like Hirsch and Hope. You suspect us of unethical behavior? Hagbard asked innocently. Pat Walsh is dialing a phone. I don't believe in jails, Joe said bluntly. I don't think Atlanta and Zev will be any better when they get out. They'll be worse. You can be sure the Illuminati will protect you, Miss Portnari concluded gravely. Danny Pricefixer continued to stare at her. The phone is ringing far away, dragging me back to a body, a self, a, a purpose, shattering my memories of being the ringmaster. I sit up and lift the receiver. Hirsch, I say. My name is Pat Walsh. A woman's voice says. I speak for Atlanta herself. The password is the Leme. Go ahead, I say hoarsely, wondering if it's about that peacenik professor we killed at UN Plaza on April 1st. You're being framed for a bombing, she said. You have to go into hiding. Hagbard laughed. <laughs> Atlanta isn't returning to the States. She's been a double agent for over two years, working for me. I found the warehouse door the Walsh woman described. It was open, as she had promised, and I wondered about the name on it. Gold and the Pell Transfers. So is Tobias Knight and Eel Cop a plea. It's all been carefully planned, Joe. You only thought bombing your own office was your idea. How about Zev Hirsch? Joe asked. He's having some very educational experiences about this time in New York City, Hagbard replied. I don't believe in jails, either. And I am trapped. The three of them surround me. And Jubella demands, Tell us the word. Jubello repeats, Tell us the word. And Jubella munches the sword. Tell us the word, Zev Hirsch. A bombing in New York? The president asked shrewdly, trying to look as tough as his predecessor. Yes, Saul went on. As soon as the link with God's lightning was clear to us, Bonnie and I took off for Las Vegas. Well, you can understand why. The president didn't understand any of this, but wasn't about to admit that. Are you headed for Las Vegas? He asked shrewdly, trying to look as tough as his predecessor. Yes, Saul said sincerely. As soon as we found out about Anthrax Leprosy Pie and Dr. Mosinigo's death, we realized the same organization must be implicated. God's Lightning... God's Lightning? The President asked shrewdly, remembering earlier years when he had been a guest speaker at their rallies. And the secret group that has infiltrated them and taken them over, the Cult of the Yellow Sign. We have reason to believe that an English intelligence agent named Chips will be arriving in London in a few hours with evidence against most of the Yellow Sign operatives within their government. You see, sir, this is an international conspiracy. An international conspiracy, the president asked shrewdly. And in Central Park, our old friend Perry hops from tree to ground, snatches a nut thrown by August Personage, and quickly runs around the tree three times in case this friend, possibly enemy, produces a gun and starts blasting. Well, far above the highest mountains in California, another aspect of my consciousness soars like winged poetry and knows, somehow, more about what is coming than Dr. Troll's seismograph for I am the last, truly the last. The ecologists are right. Mine is not merely an endangered, but nearly an extinct species, and my senses have been sharpened beyond instinct by these last years. I circle around, I circle around, I soar, I bank, I float, I am... Rare moment for me, not thinking about fish, for my belly is full at present. I circle around, circle around, thinking only about the soaring, the freedom, and more vaguely about the bad vibes coming up from below. Must you have a name? Call me Holly One, then. Hollyitis Leucocephalus the Last. Symbol once of Imperial Rome, and now of Imperial America. 
of which I neither know nor care, for all I know is the freedom of my estate, and about that the Romans and the Americans have never had aught but the most confused and distorted ideas. Wearing my long green feathers, I circle around. I am Holly One, and I scream, not with rage or with fear or with anger. I scream with ecstasy. The terrible joy of my very existence, and the scream echoes from mountain to mountain to another mountain, resonating onward and onward, a sound that only another of my species could understand, and none are left to hear it. But still I scream. The shriek of Shiva the destroyer, true face of Vishnu the preserver, and Brahma the creator. For my scream is not of life or death, but of life in death. And I am equally contemptuous of Perry, and of August personage, of squirrels, and of men, and of all lesser birds who cannot ascend to my height and know the agony and supremacy of my freedom. Hagbard's mouth fell open in completely genuine surprise. Well, sink me, he said, beginning to laugh. We both pass, Hagbard went on happily. We've been judged and found innocent by the great god Acid. Joe took a deep breath. And when do you start to explain in monosyllables or sign language or semaphore or something a non-illuminated moron like me can understand? You read all the clues. It was right out in the open. It was plain as a barn door. It was as conspicuous as my nose and twice as homely in every sense of that word. Hagbard, for Christ's sake, and for my sake and for all our sakes, will you stop gloating and give me the answer? I'm sorry. Hagbard pocketed the gun carelessly. I'm a bit giddy. I've been waging a kind of war all night, high on acid. It was a strain, especially since I was at least 90% sure you'd kill me before it was over. He lit one of his abominable cigars. Briefly, then, the Illuminati is benevolent, compassionate, kindly, generous, etc., etc., and all the other complimentary adjectives you can think of. In short, we're the good guys. But... but it, it can't be. It can be, and it is. Hagbard motioned him toward the Bugatti. Let's sit down, if I may permit myself one more acrostic before the codes and puzzles are all resolved. They climbed into the front seat, and Joe accepted the brandy decanter Hagbard offered. Of course, Hagbard went on. When I say good, you've got to understand that all terms are relative. We're as good as is possible in this fucked-up section of the galaxy. We're not perfect. Certainly I'm not, and I haven't observed anything approaching immaculate perfection in any of the other masters of the temple either. But we are, in human terms and by ordinary standards, decent chaps. There's a reason for that. It's the basic law of magic, and it's in every textbook. You must have uh, read it somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Joe took a stiff snort of the brandy. It was Peach, his favorite. Yes, I think. As ye give... So shall ye get. Precisely. Hagbard took back the bottle and had a snort himself. Mind you, Joe, that's a scientific law, not a moral commandment. There are no commandments because there is no commander anywhere. All authority is a delusion, whether in theology or in sociology. Everything is radically, even sickeningly, free. The first law of magic is as neutral as Newton's first law of motion. It says that the equation balances, and that's all it says. You are still free to give evil and pain if you decide you must. Once done, however, you never escape the consequences. It always comes back. No prayers, sacrifices, mortifications, or supplications will change it any more than they'll change Newton's laws or Einstein's. So we're good, as moralists would say, because we know enough to have a bloody strong reason to be good. In the last week, things went too fast and I became evil. I deliberately ordered and paid for the deaths of various people and set in motion processes that have led to still other deaths. 
I knew what I was doing, and I knew, still know, that I'll pay for it. Such decisions are extremely rare in the history of the Order, and my superior, the Dili Lama, tried to persuade me it was unnecessary this time, too. I disagreed. I take the responsibility. No man or god or goddess can change it. I will pay, and I'm ready to pay whenever and however the bill is presented. Hagbard, what are you? A me-hume, the Sour family would say. Hagbard grinned. A mere human, no more, not one jot more. There were five of us. John John Dillinger was explaining to George as they trudged back toward Ingolstadt, having lost Hagbard and the Bugatti in the crowd. My folks kept it a secret. German people, very superstitious and secretive. They didn't want reporters all over the place and headlines about the first quintuplets to live. The Dion family got all that much later. John Herbert Dillinger is in Las Vegas, trying to track down the plague, unless he's already finished up and went home to Los Angeles. John John smiled. He was always the brains of the bunch, runs a rock music company, real professional businessman. He was the oldest, by a couple of minutes, and we all sort of look up to him. He served the prison time, even though I'm the one who rightly should have, seen that robbing that grocer was my dumb idea. But he said he could take it without cracking up. And he was right. John Hoover Dillinger lives in Mad Dog under the name D.J. Hoover. He's not above letting people suspect he's a distant relative of J. Edgar's. Mostly, John John said, he's retired. Except occasionally for little jobs like helping arrange convincing jailbreaks, say, when Jim Cartwright wants to let a prisoner get out in a realistic fashion gave Naismith the idea for the John Dillinger Died for You Society. How about the other two? George asked, thinking that it would be even harder to decide whether he loved Stella more than Mavis, or Mavis more than Stella, now that he knew they were the same person. He wondered how Joe felt, since he obviously dug Miss Mao Sushi, and she was that person also. Three and one, and one and three, like Dillinger. Or was Dillinger five and three? George realized suddenly that he was still tripping a little. Dillinger was five and one, not five and three. The law of fives again. Did that mean there were two more in the Mavis Stella Mao complex? Two that he hadn't met yet? Why did two and three keep popping up in all this? The other two are dead, John John said sadly. John Edgar Dillinger was born first, and he went and died first. Fast and furious he was. It was him that plugged that bank guard in East Chicago while the rest of us were vacationing and laying low in Miami. Always the hothead he was. Had a heart attack back in 43 and went to an early grave. John Thomas Dillinger went in 69. He was in Chicago in 68 on a jam assignment, meeting with a crazy English spy named Chips. British intelligence somehow got a report that the Democratic Convention was being run by the Bavarian Illuminati and would end with an assassination. They didn't believe in the Illuminati, so they sent chips. They always send him on wild cases because he's nutty enough to take them seriously and do a thorough job. Both of them got tear gas coming out of the Hilton Hotel, and poor chips got thrown in a paddy wagon with a bunch of young radicals. John Thomas had a chest problem already, a chronic asthma, and the tear gas made it a lot worse. He went from doctor to doctor and finally passed away in early 69. So there's a cop in Chicago who could boast that he really killed John Dillinger, only he doesn't know it. Isn't life peculiar? The Sauer family only thought they were in the Illuminati. Hagbard went on. Hitler and Stalin only thought they were in the Illuminati. Old Weishaupt only thought he was in the Illuminati. It's that simple. The moral of the whole story is... I think it's beginning to penetrate, Joe said slowly. It was, of course, the very first hypothesis I formed. There have been many groups in history who called themselves the Illuminati, and they weren't all aiming at exactly the same thing. Precisely. Hagbard puffed again at his cigar. That's the natural first suspicion of any non-paranoid mind. Then, as you explore the evidence, links between these groups begin to appear. 
Eventually, the paranoid hypothesis begins to appear more plausible, and you begin to believe there always has been one Illuminati using the same basic slogans and symbols and aiming at the same basic goal. I sent Jim Cartwright to you with that yarn about three conspiracies, the ABC, or Ancient Bavarian Conspiracy, the NBC, or New Bavarian Conspiracy, and the CBS, or Conservative Bavarian Sears, to set you thinking that the truth might be midway backward toward the simple first idea. From here on in, forget that I represent the original Illuminati. In fact, in recent centuries, we don't use a name at all. We employ only the initials A.A., written like this. He sketched on a Danau Hotel matchbook. A. A. A lot of occult writers, he went on, have made some amazing guesses as to what that means. Actually, it doesn't mean a damn thing. To prevent our name from being stolen and misused again, we don't have a name. Anybody who thinks he's guessed the name and tries to pass himself off as an initiate by declaring that we're really the Atlantean Arcanum or the Argentium Astrum or whatever immediately reveals that he's a fraud. It's a neat gimmick. I only wish we'd thought of it centuries earlier. Hauptmann, chief of field operations for the Federal Republic of Germany's police, looked around the Fuhrer suite in disgust. He had arrived from Bonn and headed straight for the Danau Hotel, determined to make some sense of the scandals, tragedies, and mysteries of the previous night. The first suspect he grilled was Freiherr Hagbard Chalin, sinister jet-set millionaire, who had come to the rock festival with a large entourage. Chalin and Hauptmann talked quietly in one corner of the suite of the Danau Hotel, while the cameras of police photographers clicked away behind them. Hauptmann was tall and thin, with close-cropped silver-gray hair, long vulpine features, and piercing eyes. "'Dreadful tragedy, the death of your president last night,' he said. "'My condolences. Also for the unhappy state of affairs in your country.' Actually, Hauptmann was delighted to see the United States of America falling into chaos. He had been fifteen at the end of World War II, had been called to the colors as the Allies advanced on German soil, and had seen his country overrun by American troops. All of this made a deeper and more lasting impression on him than the U.S.-West-German cooperation that developed later. Not my president, not my country, said Hagbard quickly. I was born in Norway. I lived in the U.S. for quite some time and did become a citizen for a while when I was much younger than I am now. But I renounced my American citizenship years ago. I see, said Hauptmann, trying unsuccessfully to conceal his distaste for Hagbard's indistinct sense of national identity. And what country today has the honor of claiming you as a citizen? Smiling, Hagbard reached for the inside pocket of the brass button navy blue yachtsman blazer he had worn for the occasion. He handed his passport to Hauptmann, who took it and grunted with surprise. Equatorial Guinea? He looked up, frowning. Fernando Poo? Quite so, said Hagbard, a white tooth grin breaking through his dark features. I will accept your expression of sympathy for the sad state of affairs in that country. Hauptmann's dislike of this Latin plutocrat grew deeper. The man was undoubtedly one of those unprincipled international adventurers who carried citizenship the way many freighters carried Panamanian registry. Chilean's wealth was probably equal to or greater than the total wealth of Equatorial Guinea, yet it was likely that he had done nothing for his adopted country other than bribe a few officials to obtain the citizenship. Equatorial Guinea had split asunder, nearly plunging the world into a third and final war. And yet here was this parasitical Mediterranean fop, driving to a rock festival in a Bugatti Royale, with a host of drones, yes-men, flunkies, minions, whores, dope fiends, and all-around social liabilities. Disgusting. Hagbard looked around. This room is a pretty foul place to have a conversation. How can you stand that smell? It's nauseating me. Pleased to be causing some discomfort to this man, whom he disliked more and more as he got to know him, Hauptmann settled back in the red armchair, his teeth bared in a smile. You will forgive me, Fry Herr Chalin. I find it necessary to be here at this time, and also necessary to talk to you. However, I would have thought this peculiar odor of fish would not be unpleasant to you. 
Perhaps your nautical dress has led me astray. Hagbard shrugged. I am a seaman of sorts, but just because a man likes the sea doesn't mean he wants to sit next to a ton of dead mackerel. What do you think it is, anyway? I have no idea. I was hoping you could identify it for me. Just dead fish, that's all it smells like to me. I'm afraid you may be expecting more from me all around than I can possibly provide. I suppose you think I can tell you a lot about last night. Just what are you trying to find out? First of all, I want to find out what actually happened. What we have, I think, is a case of drug abuse on a colossal scale. And we, the Western world in general, have had too many of those in recent years. Apparently, there is not a single person who was present at this festival who did not partake of some of this soft drink toast with LSD. Treat every man to his dessert and none should escape tripping, said Hagbard. I beg your pardon? I was parodying Shakespeare, said Hagbard. But it's not very relevant. Please go on. Well, so far, no one has been able to give me a coherent or plausible account of the evening's events, said Hauptmann. There have been at least twenty-seven deaths that I'm fairly sure of. There has been massive abuse of LSD. There are numerous accounts of pistol, rifle, and machine gun fire somewhere on the shore of the lake. A number of witnesses say they saw many men in Nazi uniforms running around in the woods. If that wasn't a hallucination... Dressing as a Nazi is a serious crime in the Federal Republic of Germany, and we must prosecute them vigorously. See how much more pleasant the world is now that the Sours are gone. The Dalai Lama flashed into his brain. Hagbard kept a poker face. Hauptmann went on. Your own role in the incident seems to have been a constructive one, Freiherr Cellin. You are described as going to the stage when the hysteria and the hallucinating had reached some sort of climax and making a speech which greatly calmed the audience. Hagbard laughed. <laughs> I have no idea at all what I said. You know what I thought? I thought I was Moses and that they were the Israelites and I was leading them across the Red Sea while the Pharaoh's army, intent on slaughtering them, pursued. The only Israelites present last night seem to have fared rather badly. You're not Jewish yourself, are you, Freiherr Chalin? I'm not religious at all. Why do you ask? I thought that then, perhaps, you could shed some light on the scene we find here in these rooms. Well, no matter for the moment. It is interesting that you thought you led them across the lake. In fact, this morning... When the police reserves entered the area, they found most of the young people wandering around on the shore of the lake opposite the festival. Well, perhaps we all marched around it while we thought we were going across it, said Hagbard. Have you considered the possibility that these men, old as they are, might have unknowingly imbibed LSD and suffered heart failure or some such thing? There were twenty-three dead men in the suite. Thirteen were in the large parlor where Hagbard and Hauptmann were sitting. The dead men, too, were seated in various attitudes of total collapse, some with their heads lolling back, others bent forward at the waist, heads hanging between their knees, knuckles resting on the floor. There were nine more old men in the bedroom and one in the bathroom. Most of them were white-haired, several were completely bald. Not one could have been under eighty years of age, and several appeared to be over ninety. The man in the bathroom had been caught by death in the embarrassing position of sitting on the toilet with his pants down. This was the old gentleman with the white mustache and the unruly forelock who had spoken harshly to George in the lobby the night before last. Hauptmann shook his head. I'm afraid it will be no easy task to find out what happened to these men. They all seem to have died at about the same moment. There are no observable traces of poison. No signs of struggle or pain, except for the expression around the eyes. All of their eyes are open, and they appear to be looking at some unguessable horror. Do you have any idea who they are? Why did you say I might have been able to help if I were Jewish? 
We have found their passports. They are all Israeli citizens. That in itself is quite odd. Generally, Jews that all do not care to come to this country for obvious reasons. However, there was an organization connected with the Zionist movement founded here in Ingolstadt on May 1st, 1776. These elders of Zion might have assembled here to celebrate the anniversary. Oh, yes, said Hagbard. The Illuminati of Bavaria, wasn't it? I remember hearing about them when we first arrived here. The organization was founded by an unforked Jesuit, and its membership consisted of Freemasons, free thinkers, and Jews. There were also some famous names in politics and the arts. King Leopold, Goethe, Beethoven. And this organization was behind the Zionist movement, you say? Hauptmann brushed away the suggestion with long, slender fingers. I did not say they were behind anything. There are always those who think that every political or criminal phenomena must have something behind it. There is always a conspiracy that explains everything. That is unscientific. If you wish to understand events, you must analyze the masses of the people and the economic, cultural, and social conditions in which they live. Zionism was a logical development out of the situation of the Jews during the last hundred years. One need not imagine some group of illuminated ones thinking it up and promulgating the movement for devious reasons of their own. The Jews were in a wretched condition in many places. They needed somewhere to go. A child could have seen that Palestine was an attractive possibility. Well, said Hagbard, if the Illuminati have no importance in the history of Israel, what are these twenty-three old Israelis doing here on the day of the organization's founding? Perhaps they thought the Illuminati were important. Perhaps they themselves were members. I shall make inquiries to Israel about their identities. Relatives will probably claim the bodies. Otherwise, the German government will see that they are buried in Ingolstadt Jewish Cemetery with proper rabbinical ceremonies. An elderly waiter knocked and was admitted by one of Hauptmann's men. He pushed a serving cart bearing a magnificent silver coffee urn, cups, and a tray full of pastries. Before serving anyone else, he rolled the cart across the thick carpet to Hauptmann and Hagbard. His roomy eyes studiously avoided the bodies scattered around the suite. He poured out coffee for both men. Lots of cream and sugar said Hagbard. Black for me, said Hauptmann, picking up a pastry with cherry filling and biting into it with relish. How do you know somebody hasn't dosed the coffee or the pastry with LSD, said Hagbard, smiling mischievously. Hauptmann brushed his hand over his hair and smiled back. Because I would put this hotel out of business if I were served food tainted in any way, and they know it. They will take the utmost precautions. Now that we're being a little more sociable and drinking coffee together, said Hagbard, let me ask you a favor. Turn me loose today. I have interests to look after in the U.S., and I'd like to be leaving. You were originally planning to stay for the entire week. Now, suddenly, you have to leave at once. I don't understand. I was planning to stay, but that was before most of the U.S. government got wiped out. Also, since the remainder of the festival is being called off, there's no reason to stay. I'm still not clear on that, however. Why is the festival being called off? Whose idea is it, and what are the reasons? Hauptmann stared down his long nose at Hagbard and took another bite of the pastry, while Hagbard wondered how the man could eat in the midst of this awful smell. To begin with, Freiherr Herzlin, there is the disappearance and a possible death by drowning of four members of the Saure family known as the American Medical Association. Accounts of what happened to them are garbled, fantastic, and contradictory, as are those of every other incident that occurred last night. As I reconstructed, they drove their car straight into the lake. From which side? Hauptmann shrugged. It hardly matters. The lake is virtually bottomless. If they are in there, I doubt that we will ever find them. They must have been under the influence of LSD, and they certainly weren't used to it. He looked accusingly at Hagbard. They were so clean-cut. Absolutely the hope of the future. 
and a carve as a national relic, a great loss. In any case, the Saures, as you may not know, were the moving spirits behind the Engelstadt festival. Very patriotic. They wished to do something to promote tourism to Germany, particularly of Bavaria, since they were native Bavarians. Yes, said Hagbard. I read that Ingolstadt was their hometown. Hauptmann shook his head. Their press agent gave that out when the festival was conceived. Actually, they were born in northern Bavaria, in Wolfram's Eschenbach. It is the birthplace of another famous German musician, the Menzinger Wolfram von Eschenbach, who wrote Parsival. Well, now they are gone, barring a miracle, and no one else seems to be in charge. Without them, the festival is simply collapsing like a headless body. I would like to release you immediately. But when I've pieced together more of last night's events, I shall have more questions for you. I must ask you to stay in the Ingolstadt area. Hagbard stood up. If you'll agree not to have me tailed or guarded, I'll give you my word that I'll stick around. Hauptmann smiled thinly. Your word won't be necessary. Every road is blocked. No planes are permitted to take off or land at Ingolstadt Aerodrome. You can have the run of the town, the lake, and the festival area, and you will not be disturbed. Hagbard left at the same time the old waiter did. The waiter bowed Hagbard out the door, and when it closed behind him, said, Ah, uh, a great shame. Well, said Hagbard, they were all in their eighties. That's a good age to die. The waiter laughed. <laughs> I am seventy-five, and I do not think any age is a good age to die. But that is not what I was referring to. Perhaps mine hair did not notice the fish tank in the room. It was broken, and the fish were spilled all the floor. I have taken care of that tank for over twenty years. It was a fine collection of rare tropical fish, even Egyptian mouth breeders. Now they are all dead. Hmm. So it goes. Hagbard wanted to ask the waiter what an Egyptian mouth breeder was, but the old man suddenly nodded, pushed open a doorway to a service room, and disappeared. It's grade five, and move it up towards six, Igor Beaver shouted into the phone. You idiot! Don't you think I can tell that from here? Dr. Troll shouted back. My bed was bouncing around like it had St. Vitus's dance even before you called. His emotion was merely professional anger at the student's failure to obey orders. Grade 5 is nothing to get excited about if you're a Californian, and even Grade 6 causes anxiety only among tourists or believers in the famous Edgar Cayce prophecy. John Herbert Dillinger, one of those believers, was already in the garage, pajama tops tucked into hastily donned trousers, barefoot on the starter. But smiling Jim climbed blissfully upward, enjoying total communication with nature the mystic rapture of the true hunter before he gets his chance to open fire and blast a chunk of nature to hell. The nest was in sight. The bird was invisible, but Smiling Jim recognized the characteristic eagle's nest on a peak only a few hundred yards above and to the west. Come home, baby, he thought passionately, unstrapping his rifle. Come home. Daddy is waiting. Hagbard took another belt of the brandy and repeated, the real Illuminati, the AA, have never been involved in any form of manipulating or coercing people. Our interests are entirely elsewhere. Do what thou wilt is our law. Only in the last few decades, as the fate of the earth seemed to be hanging in the balance, have we taken any direct action. Even so, we have been cautious. We know that power corrupts. We have acted chiefly by not acting, by what the Taoists call Wu Wei. But then, things got out of hand. They moved too fast. We fucked up somewhat. But only because total inaction seemed to mean total disaster. You mean you, as an official of some sort in the AA, infiltrated the fake Illuminati and became one of their top five, intending to undo them nonviolently. And it didn't work? 
It worked about as well as any activity on that level ever works, Hagbard said somberly. Most of humanity has been spared for a while, and the wild free animals have been spared for a while, he sighed. I guess I'll have to begin from the ABCs. We have never sought power. We have sought to disperse power, to set men and women free. The ultimate weapon isn't this plague out in Vegas or any new Super H-bomb. The ultimate weapon has always existed. Every man, every woman, and every child owns it. It's the ability to say no and take the consequences. The fear of death is the beginning of slavery. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. The goose can break the bottle at any second. Hagbard sighed again. Our founder and leader, the man known in myth as Prometheus or the snake in the Garden of Eden. Oh, Christ, Joe said, slumping forward in his seat. I have the feeling that you're starting to put me on again. You're about to tell me that the Prometheus and Genesis stories are really based on fact. Our leader, known as Lucifer or Satan. Hagbard went on. Lucifer being the bringer of light. You know, Joe said, I'm not going to believe a word of this. Our leader, known as Prometheus, the firebringer, or Lucifer, the light bringer, or Quetzalcoatl, the morning star, or the snake in the garden, or Osiris's bad brother, Set, or Shaitan the tempter. Well, to be brief, he repented. Hagbard raised an eyebrow. Does that intrigue you sufficiently to silence your skepticism long enough for me to finish the sentence? He repented? Joe sat upright again. Sure, why not? Hagbard's old malicious grin, so rare in the last week, returned. If Atlas can shrug and Telemachus can sneeze, why can't Satan repent? Go ahead, Joe said. This is just another one of your put-ons, but I'm hooked. I'll listen. But I have my own answer, which is that there is no answer. You're just an allegory on the universe itself, and every explanation of you and your actions is incomplete. There'll always be a new, more up-to-date explanation coming along a while later. That's my answer. Hagbard laughed easily. <laughs> Charming, he said. I must remember that the next time I'm trying to understand myself. Of course, it's true of any human being. We're all allegories on the universe, different faces it wears in trying to decide what it really is. But our founder and leader, as I was saying, repented. That's the secret that has never been revealed. There is no stasis anywhere in the cosmos, least of all in the minds of entities that possess minds. The basic fallacy of all bad writers, and theologians are notoriously bad writers, is to create cardboard characters who never change. He gave us the light of reason, and seeing how we misused it, he repented. The story is more complicated, but that's the basic outline. At least it's as much as I understood until a week ago. The important thing to get clear is that he never aimed at power or destruction. That's a myth. Created by the opposition, Joe said. Right? I read that in Mark Twain's Defense of Satan. Twain was subtle, Hagbard said, taking a little more brandy. But not subtle enough. No, the myth was not created by the opposition. It was created by our founder himself. Wild should be alive, Joe said admiringly. He was so proud of himself, setting paradox on top of paradox until he had a nice three or four or five-story house of contradictions built up. He should see the skyscrapers you create. You never disappoint me, Hagbard said. If they ever hang you, you'll be arguing about whether the rope really exists until the last minute. That's why I picked you all those years ago and programmed you for the role you'd play tonight. Only a man whose father was an ex-Muslim and who was himself an ex-Catholic and an ex-engineering student would have the required complexity. Anyway, to return to the libretto, as an old friend of mine used to say, the error of the Sowers was to believe the propaganda our founder spread against himself, that, and believing they were in communication with him when they were only in communication with a nasty part of their own unconscious minds. There was no evil spirit misleading them. They were misleading themselves, 
and we were trailing along behind them, trying to keep them from causing too much harm. Finally, in the early 1960s, after a certain fuck-up in Dallas convinced me that things were getting out of hand, I contacted the Five directly. Since I knew the real secrets of magic, and they only had distortions, it was easy to convince them that I was an emissary from those beings whom they called the Secret Chiefs, or the Great Old Ones, or the Shining Ones. Being half crazy, they reacted in a way I had not expected. They all abdicated and appointed me and the Four Sours as their successors. They decided that we're entering the age of Horus, the child god, and that youth should be given a chance to run things, hence the promotion of the Sours. They threw me in because I seemed to know what I was talking about. But then came the real problem. I couldn't convince the Sours of anything. Those pig-headed kids wouldn't believe a word I said. They told me I was over thirty and untrustworthy. I told you the truth was out in the open all the time. Anybody with eyes in his head should have been able to interpret what's been happening since the early 1960s. The great and dreaded Illuminati of the past had fallen into the control of a bunch of ignorant, malicious kids. The age of the crowned and conquering child. And you think the old and wise should rule? Joe asked. That doesn't fit your character. This has to be another put-on. I don't think anybody should rule, Hagbard said. All I'm doing, all the higher order of the AA has ever tried to do, is communicate with people in spite of their biases and fears, not to rule them. And what we're trying to communicate, the ultimate secret, the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, is just the power of the word. No. We are people who have said non servium, and we're trying to teach others to say it. Drake was one of us spiritually, but never understood it. If we can't find immortality, we can make a damn good try. And if we can't save this planet, we can get off it and go to the stars. And what happens now? Joe asked. More surprises, Hagbard answered promptly. I can't tell you the whole story of this hour with both of us fagged out at the end of an acid trip. We go back to the hotel and sleep, and after breakfast there are more revelations for George as well as for you. And later in the Bugatti, which, driven by Harry Coyne, was grandly wafting Hagbard, George, and Joe around the south side of Lake Totenkopf, George asked, Is Hitler really going to be buried anonymously in a Jewish cemetery? It looks that way, Hagbard grinned. His Israeli documents are excellent forgeries. He'll be lifted off that toilet by Hauptmann's men and gently deposited in the Ingolstadt Hebrew burial grounds, there to rest for all eternity. That will make me throw up once a day for the rest of my life, Joe said bitterly. It's the worst case of cemetery desecration in history. Oh, it has a positive aspect, said Hagbard. Look at it from the point of view of the Nazi leaders. Think how they'll hate being buried in a Jewish cemetery with a rabbi praying over them. Doesn't make up for it, said George. Joe's right. It's in terribly bad taste. I thought both you guys were thoroughgoing atheists, said Hagbard. If you are, you think the dead are dead, and it hardly matters where they're buried. What's happening? You both getting religion? I can think of nothing more likely to drive a man to religion than your company, said Joe. Burying them Nazis with a bunch of Jews is the funniest thing I ever heard. Harry Coyne offered from the driver's seat. Go bugger a dead goat, Coyne, George called. Sure thing, said Coyne. Lead me to it. You're incorrigible, Hagbard, said Joe. You really are incorrigible, and you surround yourself with people who encourage you. I don't need help, said Hagbard. I have a great deal of initiative, more than any other human being I know, with the possible exception of Mavis. George said, Hagbard. Did I really see what I thought I saw last night? Is Mavis really a goddess? Are Stella and Miss Mao and Mavis all the same person, or was I just hallucinating? Here come the paradoxes, Joe groaned. He'll talk for an hour, and we'll be more confused when he's finished. Hagbard, who was sitting in a large swivel jump seat, swung around so he was looking over Harry Coyne's shoulder at the road ahead. I'd be glad to tell you later, George. I would have told you now, except that I don't like Malik's tone. 
He may not be intending to shoot me anymore, but he still has it in for me. You bet, said Joe. Well, are you still going to marry Mavis? What? Hagbard swung around and stared at George with an expression that was almost a perfect replica of genuine surprise. You said that you and Mavis were going to be married aboard the Leif Erikson by Miss Portinari. Are you? Yes, said Hagbard. Miss Portinari will marry us later today. Sorry, but I knew her first. Then Mavis isn't really heiress, George persisted. She's just a priestess of heiress? Hagbard brushed the question away. Later, George. She will explain it. She's even better at explanations than Hagbard is, Joe commented cynically. Well, said Hagbard, getting back to Hitler and company, you have to realize that they will know about it if their bodies are buried in the Jewish cemetery. They're still conscious and aware, though they are not what we would normally call alive. Their consciousness energy is intact, though there is no life in their bodies. They came to the Ingolstadt Festival hoping that their young leaders would give them immortality. They've achieved immortality, all right, but not a very nice kind. Their consciousness energy has been gobbled up by the evil one. Their identities still survive, but they will be helpless parts of the Eater of Souls, the foulest being in the universe, the only creature that can turn spirit into carrion. Yog sothoth has claimed his own. Yog sothoth said Joe. I remember learning about Yog sothoth It was an invisible being trapped in a pentagonal structure in Atlantis. The original Illuminati blew up the structure and turned the creature loose. Why, yes, Hagbard said. You saw that at Rissian Liberation Front training film about Atlantis and Greyface Gruard, didn't you? Man suffers because he is evil, said Gruard, and because he is small and helpless. There are vast powers in the universe dwarfing us who have to be placated. Gruard taught man to see ignorance, passion, pain, and death as evils and to fight against them. Well, ignorance is an evil, said Joe. Not when it can be acknowledged and accepted, said Hagbard. In order to eat, you have to be hungry. In order to learn, you have to be ignorant. Ignorance is a condition of learning. Pain is a condition of health. Passion is a condition of thought. Death is a condition of life. When Gruard taught his followers at Atlantis to see those conditions as evils, then he could teach them human sacrifice, persecution, and warfare. Yog Suthoth taught Gruard to teach his people those things. Only Gruard never knew it. So Yog Suthoth is the serpent in the Garden of Eden, said Joe. In a manner of speaking, said Hagbard. But you understand, the Garden of Eden myth was dreamed up and promulgated by the Illuminati. And who dreamed up the Gruad of Atlantis myth, said Joe. Oh, that's true, said Hagbard solemnly. That's the biggest bunch of bullshit I ever heard, said Joe. You're trying to claim that there's no such thing as good and evil, that the concepts were invented and taught to humans deliberately to fuck them up psychologically. But in order to maintain that, you have to postulate that the condition of man before Gruad was good, and that his condition afterward has been evil. And you have to make Yog sothoth into a carbon copy of Satan. You haven't progressed one iota beyond the Judeo-Christian myth with that highfalutin science fiction story. Hagbard roared with laughter and slapped Joe on the knee. Beautiful! He held up his hand in a distinctive gesture. What am I doing? He asked. You're giving the peace sign, only with your fingers together, George said, confused. <laughs> That's what comes of being an ignorant Baptist, Joe laughed. As a son of the true church, I can tell you, George, that Hagbard is giving a Catholic blessing. Indeed, said Hagbard. Look at the shadow my hand casts on this book. He held up a book behind his hand, and they saw the head of a horned devil. The sun. Source of all light and energy, symbol of redemption, and my hand in the most sacred gesture of benediction. Put them both together, they spell Satan. He sang to an old tune. And what the hell does that mean? Joe demanded. Evil is only a shadow, a false appearance, the usual mystic mishmash? Tell that to the survivors of Auschwitz. Suppose, Hagbard said. I told you that good was only a shadow, a false appearance. 
Several modern philosophers have argued that case rather plausibly and earned themselves a reputation for hard-headed realism. And yet, that's just the mirror image of what you call the usual mystic mishmash. Then what is real? George demanded. Mary, Queen of the May? Or Kali, Mother of Murderers? Or Eris, who synthesizes both? The trip is real, Hagbard said. The images you encounter along the way are all unreal. If you keep moving and past them, you eventually discover that. Solipsism. Sophomore solipsism, Joe answered. No. Hagbard grinned. The solipsist thinks the tripper is real. Harry Coyne called out, Hagbard, there's a couple of guys up the road flagging us down. Hagbard turned and peered ahead. Right. They're crew members from the Leif Erikson. Pull up where they tell you to, Harry. He reached up to a silver vase mounted behind the back seat and took a pink rosebud out of the fresh bouquet he had placed there that morning. He carefully inserted the rosebud in the buttonhole of his lapel. The great golden Bugatti rolled to a stop, and the four men got out. The long line of cars that had been following the Bugatti were now stopping along the edge of the road behind it. There was a stretch of lawn that sloped gently down from the road to the lake. Out on the choppy blue water, a round gold buoy drifted, giving off a cloud of red smoke. Stella stepped out of the Mercedes 600 that was parked behind the Bugatti. George half expected Mavis and Miss Mao to get out with her, but there was no sign of them. A pink Cadillac behind the Mercedes disgorged Simon Moon and Clark Kent. Stella did not turn to look at them. They were talking excitedly to each other. A large inflated life raft was pulled up on shore, and one of Hagbard's men, sitting in the raft, stood up holding a wetsuit as Stella approached. Slowly, as if she were all alone by the shore of the lake, Stella took off her peasant blouse and skirt and continued stripping until she was naked. Then she started to put on the wetsuit. Meanwhile, another man got behind the wheel of Hagbard's Bugatti Royale and drove it across the lawn. Two other men held the mouth of a huge transparent plastic bag far enough apart so that the car could be driven right into it. They tied up the end of the bag with strong wire. Ropes attached to the bag grew taut, their other ends disappeared into the water. Slowly, looking somewhat majestic and somewhat ridiculous, the car slid across the lawn and into the water. When it had been pulled out a short distance from shore, it began to float. Out of the deeper water popped two golden scuba launches, Hagbard's men in black wetsuits mounted in the saddles. The launches positioned themselves on either side of the automobile in its plastic bubble, and the men lashed the launches and the car together with cables. Then they started their engines and launches. Men and car quickly sank out of sight. Meanwhile, more rubber rafts pulled ashore, and all of Hagbard's people started donning wetsuits distributed by the men from the submarine. I've never done this before, said Lady Velcor. Are you sure it's safe? Don't worry, baby, said Simon Moon. Even a man could do it. Where's your friend Mary Lou? George asked. She left me, Simon said glumly. The damned acid fucked up her mind. The entire operation of outfitting Hagbard's people with wetsuits, paddling them out to the scuba launches, and transporting them down to the Leaf Erickson took more than an hour. When it was George's turn, he looked eagerly into the depths for the Leif Erikson, and was happy when he saw it glowing below him like a great golden blimp. Well, at least that's real, he thought. I'm approaching it from the outside, and it's just as big as I think it is. Even if it doesn't go anywhere, and this is all happening in Disney World. An hour later, the submarine was deep in the Sea of Volusia. George, Joe, and Hagbard stood on the bridge. Hagbard leaning against the ancient Viking prow, George and Joe peering into the endless gray depths, watching the strange blind fishes and monsters swim by. A dot appeared in the distance and grew rapidly in size until George recognized a porpoise, doubtless Howard. There was scuba diving equipment strapped to the animal's back. When he had come alongside, he turned a somersault. Hagbard shook his head. Aha, said Joe. I didn't get a look at your talking porpoise friend last time I was aboard. Hello, Howard. I'm Joe. Hello, hello, Joe, said Howard. Welcome to my world. Unfortunately, it is not a very hospitable world at the moment. There is grave danger in the Atlantic. The true ruler of the Illuminati is on the prowl on the high seas. Leviathan himself. 
The land is collapsing beside the Pacific, and the tremors have made the earth shake, and Leviathan is disturbed and has risen from the depths. Besides the trembling of the land and seas, he knows that his chief worshippers, the Illuminati, are dead. He had read their passing in the pulsings of consciousness energy that reach even into the depths of the sea. Well, he can't eat the submarine, said Hagbard, and we're well armed. He can crack the submarine open as easily as a gull cracks a penguin's egg, said Howard. And your weapons will bother him not at all. He's virtually indestructible. Hagbard shrugged, while Joe and George looked askance at each other. I'll be careful, Howard, but we can't turn around now. We've got to get back to North America. We'll try to evade Leviathan if we see him. He fills the whole ocean, said Howard. No matter what you do, you'll see him, and he'll see you. You're exaggerating. Only slightly. I must bid you farewell now. I think we've done a good week's work, and the menace to my people recedes, even as does the danger to yours. Our porpoise horde is scattering and leaving by different exits into the North Atlantic. I'm getting out of the Sea of Illusia by way of Scotland. We think Leviathan will head south around Cape Horn into the Pacific. Everything that swims and is hungry is going that way. There's a lot of fresh meat in the water, I'm sorry to say. Goodbye, friends! So long, Howard. Hagbard, what was that business about the true ruler of the Illuminati? I've heard again and again that there were five Illuminati primi. Four of them were the Sour family. That leaves one. Is it Leviathan? Is the whole show being run by a sea monster? Is that the big secret? No, said Hagbard. You have yet to figure out who the fifth Illuminatus primus is. He threw Joe a wink that George missed. By true ruler, Howard meant a godlike being whom the Illuminati worship. A sea monster? said Joe. There was a hint about a sea monster of enormous size and power in that movie that those people showed me in that loft on the Lower East Side. But the original Illuminati, Gruad's bunch, were portrayed as sun worshippers. That big pyramid with the eye in it was supposed to be the sun god's eye. Who the hell were those people with the movie anyway? I know who Miss Mao is now, but I still don't know who they were. Members of the Arisian Liberation Front, Elf, said Hagbard. They have a somewhat different view of the prehistory and origins of the Illuminati than we do. One thing we both agree upon is that the Illuminati invented religion. The original sin, right? said Joe sardonically. Joe, you ought to start a religion yourself, said Hagbard. Why? Because you are so skeptical. We're going back to America, huh? said George. And the adventure is more or less over? This phase of it, at least, said Hagbard. Good. I want to try to write about what I've seen and what has happened to me. I'll see you guys later. There's to be a magnificent dinner tonight in the main dining salon, said Hagbard. Joe said, Don't forget, confrontation has a first option on anything you write. Fuck you. George's voice came back as the door of the bridge closed behind him. Come in, said George. The stateroom door opened and he put down his pen. It was Stella. We have a little problem, don't we, George? She said, coming into the room and sitting beside him on the bed. I think you're angry at me. She went on, putting her hand on his knee. You feel like this identity of mine is a sham, so in a sense, I was deceiving you. I've lost you and Mavis both, said George. You're both the same person, which means you're really neither. You're immortal. You're not human, and I don't know what you are. Suddenly, he looked at her hopefully. Unless that was all a hallucination last night, could it have been the acid? Can you really change into different people? Yes, said Mavis. Don't do that, said George. It upsets me too much. He darted a little glance to his side. It was Stella. 
I don't really understand why it bothers me so much, said George. I ought to be able to take everything in stride by now. Did it ever bother you that you were in love with Mavis besides being in love with me? said Stella. Not much, because it hardly ever seemed to bother you. But I know why now. How could you be jealous when you and Mavis were the same person? We're not the same person, really. What does that mean? Did you ever read The Three Faces of Eve? Listen. Like all the best love stories, it began in Paris. She was well known as a Hollywood actress and was actually an Illuminatus. He was becoming fairly famous as a jet set millionaire and was actually a smuggler and anarchist. Envision Bogart and Bergman in the flashback sequences from Casablanca. It was like that a passion so intense, a Paris so beautiful, recovering from the war it had been slipping toward in the Bogart Bergman epic a couple so radiant that any observer with an eye for nuance would have foretold a storm ahead. It came the night he confessed he was a magician and made a certain proposal to her. She left him at once. A month later, back in Beverly Hills, she realized that what he had asked her was her destiny. When she tried to find him, as often happened with Hagbard Chalene, he had dropped from public view, leaving his businesses in other hands temporarily, and was in camera. A year later, she heard that he was again a public figure, hobnobbing with English businessmen of questionable reputation and even more dubious Chinese import-export executives in Hong Kong. She violated her contract with the biggest studio in Hollywood and flew to the Crown Colony, only to find he had dropped from sight again, while his recent friends were being investigated for involvement in the heroin business. She found him in Tokyo, at the Imperial Hotel. A year ago, I decided to accept your proposal. She told him. But now, after Hong Kong, I'm not so sure. Thelima, he said, facing her across a room that seemed designed for Martians. It had actually been designed for Welshmen. She sat down abruptly on a couch. You're in the order? In the order and against the order, he said. The real purpose is to destroy them. I'm one of the top five in the United States, she said unsteadily. What makes you think I'll turn on them now? Thelima, he repeated. It's not just a password, it means will. The order is my will. She quoted from Weishaupt's original oath of initiation. If you really believe that, you wouldn't be here, he said. You're talking to me because part of you knows that a human being's will is never in an external organization. You sound like a moralist. That's odd for a heroin merchant. You sound like a moralist, too, and that's very odd for a servant of a Garty. Nobody joins that lot, she said with a perk cockney accent. Without being a moralist to start with. They both laughed. I was right about you, Hagbard said. But, George interrupted, is he really in the heroin business? That's dirty. You sound like a moralist, too, she said. It's part of his demonstration. Any government could put him out of business within their borders, as England has done, by legalizing junk. So long as they refuse to do that, there's a black market. He won't let the Mafia monopolize it. He makes sure the black market is a free market. If it wasn't for him, a lot of junkies who are alive today would be dead of contaminated heroin. But let me go on with the story. They rented a villa in Naples to begin the transformation. For a month, the only humans she saw, aside from Hagbard, were two servants named Saad and Masik. She later learned that their real names were Eichmann and Callie. They began each day by serving her breakfast and quarreling. The first day, Saad argued for materialism and Masik for idealism. The second day, Saad expounded fascism and Masik communism. The third day, Saad insisted on cracking eggs from the big end, and Masik was equally vehement about the little end. All the debates were on a high and lofty intellectual level, verbally, but seemed absurd because of the simple fact that Saad and Masik always wore clown suits. She became more and more aware of the time and money Hagbard had spent in training and preparing them. Each argued with the skill of a first-rate trial lawyer, and had a phalanx of carefully researched facts to support his position. And yet the clown suits made it hard to take either of them seriously. 
The seventh morning, they argued theism versus atheism. All arguments begin to seem equally insubstantial. The tenth morning, they feuded over realism versus antinomianism. The eleventh, whether the statement, all statements are relative, is or is not self-contradictory. The twelfth, whether a man who sacrifices his life for his country is or is not insane. The fifteenth, whether Spaghetti or Dante had a greater influence on the Italian national character. But that was only the start of the day. After breakfast in her bedroom, where every article of furniture was gold, but only vaguely rounded, she went to Hagbard's study, where everything looked exactly like a golden apple, and watched documentary films concerning the early matriarchal stage of Greek culture. At ten random intervals, the name Eris would be called. If she remembered to respond, a chocolate candy arrived from a wall chute. At ten other random intervals, her own name was called. If she responded to this, she received a mild electric shock. After the tenth day, the system was changed and intensified. The shock was stronger if she responded to her previous name, whereas if she responded to Eris, Hagbard immediately entered and balled her. During lunch, which always ended with a golden apple strudel, Galley and Eichmann danced for her, a complex ballet which Hagbard called hodgepodge. As many times as she saw this, she never was able to determine how they changed costumes at the climax, in which Hodge became Podge and Podge became Hodge. In the afternoon, Hagbard came to her suite and gave lessons in yoga, concentrating on pranayama with some training in asana. The important thing is not being able to stand so still that you can balance a saucer of sulfuric acid on your head without getting hurt, he stressed. The important thing is knowing what each muscle is doing if it must be doing something. In the evenings, they went to a small chapel that had been part of the villa for centuries. Hagbard had removed all Christian decorations and redesigned it in classical Greek, with a traditional magic pentagram on the floor. She sat, in the full lotus, within the internal pentagon, while Hagbard danced insanely around the five points, he was totally stoned, calling upon Eris. Some of what you're doing seems scientific, she told him after five days. But some is plain damn foolishness. If the science fails, he replied, the damn foolishness may work. But last night you had me in that pentagon for three hours while you called on Eris, and she didn't come. She will, Hagbard said darkly. Before the month is over... We're just establishing the foundation this week, laying down the proper lines of word and image and emotional energy. During the second week, she was convinced Hagbard was quite mad as she watched him prance and caper like a goat around the five points, shouting, Eo, Eris, Eo, Eris, Eris, in the flickering candlelight and amid the heavy bouquet of burning incense and hemp. But at the end of that week, she was responding to her former name exactly 0% of the time and responding to Eris exactly 100% of the time. The conditioning is working better than the magic, she said on the 15th day. Do you really think there's a difference? He asked curiously. That night, she felt the air in the chapel change in a strange way during his dancing invocations. Something's happening, she said involuntarily, but he replied only, Quiet and continued more loudly and insanely to call upon Eris. The phenomenon, the tingle, remained, but nothing else happened. What was it? She asked later. Some call it Orgon, and some call it the Holy Ghost, he said briefly. Weishaupt called it the Astral Light. The reason the Order is so fucked up is that they lost contact with it. The following days, Saad and Masik argued whether God was male or female, whether God was sexed at all or neutral whether God was an entity or a verb, whether R. Buckminster Fuller really existed or was a technocratic solar myth, and whether human language was capable of containing truth. Nouns, adjectives, adverbs, all parts of speech were losing meaning for her as these clowns endlessly debated the basic axioms of ontology and epistemology. Meanwhile, she was no longer rewarded for answering to the name Eris, but only for acting like Eris the imperious and somewhat nutty goddess of a people as far gone in matriarchy as the Jews were in patriarchy. Hagbard, in turn, became so submissive as to border on masochism. This is ridiculous, she objected once. You're becoming effeminate. Eris can be somewhat adjusted to modern notions of decorum after we've invoked her, he said calmly. 
First, we must have her here. My lady, he added obsequiously. I'm beginning to see why you had to pick an actress for this. She said a few days later, after a bit of method business had won her an extra reward. She was, in fact, beginning to feel like heiress as well as act like her. The only other candidates, if I could get you, were two other actresses and a ballerina, he replied. Actually, any strong-willed woman would do, but it would take much longer without previous theatrical training. Books about matriarchy began to supplement the films. Diners, Mothers and Amazons, The Coffin, Engels, Mary Renault, Morgan, Ian Suddy's The Origins of Love and Hate, Robert Graves in Horse Doctor's Doses, The White Goddess, The Black Goddess, Hercules, My Shipmate, Watch the North Wind Rise. She began to see that matriarchy made as much sense as patriarchy. Hagbard's exaggerated deference toward her began to appear natural. She was far gone on a power trip. The invocations grew wilder and more frantic. Sod and Massac were brought into the chapel to assist with demonic music performed on a tom-tom and an ancient Greek pipe. They ate hashish cakes before the invocation now, and she couldn't remember afterward exactly what had happened. The voice of the male called upward to her. Mother, creator, ruler, come to me. Eo, Eris, come to me. Eo, Eris, Eris, come to me. Ave discordia, ave magna mater, venerandum vente vente. Eo, Eris, Elandras, Eo, Eris, Elepcalis. Thou bornless, ever reborn one, thou deathless, ever dying one, come to me as Isis, and Artemis, and Aphrodite, come as Helen, as Hera, come especially as Ares. They were back in the chapel. A whole day must have passed, and she sat immobile in full lotus, doing the pranayama breathing, while he danced and chanted and the weird music of the pipe and the tom-tom worked on her every conditioned reflex that told her she was not American but Greek, not of this age but of a past age, not woman but goddess. The white light came as a series of orgasms and stars going nova. She half felt the body of light coming forth from the body of fire, and all three of them were sitting by her bed, watching her gravely as sunlight came flowing through the window. Her first word was crude and angry. Shit! Is it always going to be like that? A white epileptic spasm and a hole in time? Won't I ever be able to remember it? Hagbard laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! I put on my trousers one leg at a time, he said. And I don't pull the corn up by its stalks to help it grow. Can the Taoism give me a straight answer? Remembering is just a matter of smoothing the transitions, he said. Yes, you'll remember. And control it. You're a madman. She replied wearily. And you're leading me into your own mad universe. I don't know why I still love you. We love him, too, Sod interjected helpfully. And we don't know why, either. We don't even have sex as an excuse. Hagbard lit one of his foul Sicilian cigars. You think I just laid my trip on your head, he said. It's more than that, much more. Eris is an eternal possibility of human nature. She exists quite apart from your mind or mine, and she is the one possibility that the Illuminati cannot cope with. What we started here last night, with Pavlovian conditioning that's considered totalitarian, and ancient magic that's believed to be mere superstition, will change the course of history and make real liberty and real rationality possible at last. Maybe this dream of mine is madness, but if I lay it on enough people, it will be sanity by definition, because it will be statistically normal. We've just started with me programming the trip for you. The next step is for you to become a self-programmer. And he told the truth, Stella said. I did become a self-programmer. The three that you know were all my creations, possibilities within me, women I could have become anyway, if genes and environment had been only slightly different. Just small adjustments in the biogram and logogram. Holy mother, George said hollowly. It seemed the only appropriate comment. The only other detail? She went on calmly. Was arranging a convincing suicide. That took a while. 
But it was done, and my old identity officially ceased to exist. She changed to her original form. Oh, no, George said, reeling. It, it can't be. I used to jack off over pictures of you when I was a little boy. Are you disappointed that I'm so much older than you thought? Her eyes crinkled in amusement. He looked into those suddenly 30,000-year-old eyes of one manifestation of Lilith Elcor, and all the arguments of Sod and Massac appeared clownish, and he looked through those eyes and saw himself and Joe and Saul and even Hagbard as mere men, and all their attitudes as merely manly, and he saw the eternal womanly rebuttal, and he saw beyond and above that the eternal divine amusement. He looked into those eyes of amusement, those ancient glittering eyes so gay, and he said sincerely, Hell, I can never be disappointed about anything, ever again. George Dorn entered Nirvana, parenthetically. All categories collapsed, including the all-important distinction, which Massac and Saad had never argued, between science fiction and serious literature. No. no. Because Daddy and Mommy were always just that. Daddy and Mommy. And never once did they become for a change Mommy and Daddy. Do you dig that important difference? Do you dig difference? Do you dig the lonely voice when you're lost out here shouting, Me. Me. Just me. I can never be disappointed about anything, ever again, George Dorn said, coming back. The only other time that happened... He added thoughtfully. The only other time I had the feminine viewpoint, I blocked it out of my memory. That was my repression. That was the primal scene in this whole puzzle. That was when I really lost identity with the Ringmaster. It's the story of the development of the soul. Miss Portinari was saying at that moment, spreading out the twenty-two trumps, or keys, of that very ancient deck. We call it a book, the Book of Thoth, and it's the most important book in the world. George and Joe Malik each wondering if this was a final explanation or a new put-on leading to a new cycle of deceptions, listened with mingled curiosity and skepticism. The order was deliberately reversed, Miss Portinari went on. Not by the true sages, by the false Illuminati, and by all the other white brotherhoods and Rosicrucians and Freemasons and whatnot, who didn't really understand the truth and therefore wanted to hide the part of it they did understand. They felt themselves threatened. The real sage is never threatened. They spoke in symbols and paradoxes, like the real sages, but for a different reason. They didn't know what the symbols and paradoxes meant. Instead of following the finger that points to the moon, they sat down and worshipped the finger itself. Instead of following the map, they thought it was the territory and tried to live in it. Instead of reading the menu, they tried to eat it. Dig? They had the levels confused, and they tried to confuse any independent searcher by drawing more veils and paradoxes across the path. Finally, in the 1920s, some real left-handed monkey wrenches in one of these mystic lodges recruited Adolf Hitler, and he not only read the book backward, like all of them, but insisted on believing it was the story of the exterior physical universe. Here. Let me show you. The last card, Trump 21, is really the first. It's where we all start from. She held up the card known as the world. This is the abyss of hallucinations. This is where our attention is usually focused. It is entirely constructed by our senses and our projected emotions, as modern psychology and ancient Buddhism both testify. But it is what most people call reality. They are conditioned to accept it, and not to inquire further, because only in this dream-walking state can they be governed by those who wish to govern. Miss Portinari held up the next card, The Last Judgment. Key 20, or Trump 20, or a 220, whichever terminology you prefer. It's actually second. This is the nightmare to which the soul awakes if it begins, even in the slightest, to question reality as defined by society. When you discover, for instance, that you are not heterosexual, but heterosexual homosexual, not obedient, but obedient rebellious, not loving, but loving hating, and that society is not wise, orderly, just, and decent, but wise stupid, 
orderly chaotic, just unjust, and decent and decent. This is an internal discovery. This whole trip is an internal voyage, and this is really the second stage. But if one thinks of the story as the story of the external world, and if the order is reversed, this comes up as the penultimate Armageddon, with Trump 21, the world, being the kingdom of saints. The error of the apocalyptic sects and of the Illuminati, from Weishaupt to Hitler, leading to an attempt to actually carry it out, with ovens for the Jews and gypsies and other inferiors and the promise of a brave new world for the pure, faithful, and Aryan afterward. Do you see what I mean about confusing the map with the territory? The next card is the sun, which really means Osiris risen, or, in terms of the offshot of the Osirian religion, most popular in the last two millenniums, Jesus risen. This is what happens if you survive the last judgment, or dark night of the soul without becoming some kind of fanatic or lunatic. Eventually, if you miss those attractive and pernicious alternatives, the redemptive force appears, the internal sun. Once again, if you project this outward and think that the sun in the sky or some sun-like divine man has redeemed you, you can lapse into lunacy or fanaticism. In Hitler's case, it was Karl Haushofer, or Wotan appearing in the form of Karl Haushofer. For most of the nuts you meet handing out tracts on the street, it's Jesus or Jehovah appearing in the form of Jesus. For Elijah Muhammad, it was W.D. Fard, or Allah appearing in the form of W.D. Fard. So it goes. Those who do not confuse the levels realize it's the redemptive force within themselves and pass on to Key 18, the moon. The next half hour passed rapidly so rapidly that Joe wondered if Miss Portinari had slipped them still another drug, one that speeded up time as much as psychedelics slowed it down. Last, Miss Portinari said finally, is the fool, Key Zero. He walks over the edge of the cliff, careless of the danger. The wind blows whither it will, even so are all that are reborn of the spirit. In short, he has conquered death, Nothing can frighten him, and he can never be enslaved. It's the end of the trip, and keeping humanity from getting there is the chief business of every governing group. And that's it, Joe said. Twenty-two stages, not twenty-three. Thank God we got away from Simon's magic number for a while. No, Miss Portinari said. Tarot is an anagram on Rota, remember? The extra T reminds you that the wheel turns back to rejoin itself. There is a twenty-third step, and it's right where you started. Only now you face it without fear. She held up the world again. At first, mountains are mountains. Then mountains are no longer mountains. Finally, mountains are mountains again. Only the name of the voyager has changed to preserve his innocence. She pushed the cards together and stacked them neatly. There are a million other holy books, in words and pictures and even in music, and they all tell the same story. The most important lesson of all, the one that explains all the horrors and miseries of the world, is that you can get off the wheel at any point and declare the trip is over. That's okay for any given man or woman, if their ambitions are modest. The trouble starts when, out of fear of further movement, out of fear of growth, out of fear of change, out of fear of death, out of any kind of fear, such a person tries to stop the wheel literally, by stopping everybody else. That's when the two great bum trips begin, religion and government. The only religion consistent with the whole wheel is private and personal. The only government consistent with it is self-government. Whoever tries to lay his trip on others is acting from terror and will soon resort to terror as a weapon if the others won't accept the trip through persuasion. Nobody who understands the whole wheel will do that, however, for such people understand that every man and every woman and every child is the self-begotten one. Jesus motherfucking Christ and Harry's gorgeous brand of English. But, George asked, frowning, Hasn't Hagbard been trying pretty hard to lay his trip on everybody? At least lately. Yes, 
Miss Portnari said. In self-defense and in defense of all life on earth, he broke the basic rule of wisdom. He fully expects to pay for that violation. We are waiting for the bill to be presented. I personally do not think that we will have to wait very long. Joe frowned. A half hour had passed since Miss Portnari had spoken those words. Why should he remember them so vividly right now? He was on the bridge, about to ask Hagbard a question, but he couldn't remember the question or how he had gotten there. On the TV receptor, he saw a long tendril, thin as a wire, brush against the side of a globe, trailing off into invisible distances. That meant it was actually touching the side of the submarine. The tendril disappeared. Must be some sort of seaweed, Joe thought. He resumed his conversation with Hagbard. The squiz fartle on the humits is warb, he said. The tendril was back, and another one with it. This time, they stayed, and Joe could see more in the distance. We must have run into a whole clump of seaweed, he thought. Then an enormous tentacle came zooming up out of the depths. Hagbard saw it and crouched, gripping the rail of the Viking prow. Hang on, he yelled, and Joe dropped to his knees beside him. Suddenly, below, above, and on all sides of the globe-shaped vision screen, there were suckers, great yard-across craters of flesh. The submarine's forward motion stopped suddenly, with a force that threw Joe against the railing and knocked the wind out of him. Stop all engines! Hagbard called. All hands to battle stations! George and Hagbard picked themselves up off the floor and stared at the image of the tentacles that were wrapped around the submarine. They were easily ten feet in diameter. Well, I suppose we've met Leviathan, right? said Joe. Right, said Hagbard. I hope you have somebody taking pictures. Confrontation would buy a few if we could afford them. George rushed in. Hagbard peered into the blue-black depths, then took George by the shoulder and pointed. There it is, George. The origin of all the Illuminati symbols. Leviathan himself! Far, far off in the depths of the ocean, George saw a triangle glowing with a greenish-white phosphorescence. In its center was a red dot. What is it? George asked. An intelligent, invertebrate sea creature of a size so great the word gigantic doesn't do it justice, said Hagbard. It is to whales what whales are to minnows. It's an organism unlike any other on Earth. It's one single cell that never divided, just kept getting larger and larger over billions of years. Its tentacles can hold this submarine as easily as a child holds a paper boat. Its body is shaped like a pyramid. With that size, it doesn't need the normal fish shape. It needs a more stable form to withstand the enormous pressures at the bottom of the ocean. And so it has taken the form of a pyramid of five sides, including the base. The blink of a god's eye, said George suddenly. Scale makes a tremendous difference to one's sense of definition of reality. Time to a sequoia is not the same as time to a man. Leviathan was drifting closer to them and was pulling them closer to itself. A single glowing red nucleus burned like an under-ocean sun in the center of the pyramid, which looked like a mountain of glass. Still, one may become lonely. For a man... A half hour of loneliness may be enough to cause unbearable pain. For a being to whom a million years is no more than a year, the pain of loneliness may be great. It is great. George, what are you talking about? said Joe. Hagbard said, There are plants which live just in that light, at ocean depths far below those at which any plant should be able to survive. Over the millions of years, hosts of parasitic satellite life forms have built up around it. Still puzzled by George's odd talk, Joe looked and saw a faintly glowing cloud around Leviathan's angular shape. That cloud must be made of millions of creatures circling around the monster. The bridge door opened again, and Harry Coyne, Otto Waterhouse, and John John Dillinger came in. We didn't have any battle stations, so I figured we'd just find out what's going on, said Dillinger. Then his jaw dropped as he looked out at Leviathan. Holy shit! Jesus suffering Christ, said Harry Coyne. If I could fuck that thing, I'd have fucked the biggest thing that lives. Want to borrow a scuba outfit? said Hagbard. Maybe you could distract it. What does it feed on? said Joe. 
Something like that must have to eat constantly to stay alive. It's omnivorous, said Hagbard. Has to be. Eats the creatures that live around it, but can eat anything from amoebas to kelp beds to whales. Can probably derive energy from inorganic matter, too, as plants do. Its diet has had to change quite a bit over the geological eras. It wasn't as big as this a billion years ago. It grows very slowly. I am the first of all living things, said George. The first living thing was one, and it is still one. George, said Hagbard, looking narrowly at the blonde young man. George, why are you talking like that? It's coming closer, said Otto. Hagbard, what the hell are you going to do, said Dillinger. Are we going to fight, run, or let that thing eat us? Let it come closer for a while, Hagbard said. I want to get a good close look. I've never had a chance like this before, and I may never see this creature again. You'll be seeing it from the inside with that attitude, said Dillinger. At each of the five corners of the pyramid were clusters of five tentacles, thousands of feet long, festooned with auxiliary tentacles, the long wire-like tendrils that had first brushed the submarine. It was one of the main tentacles that was wrapped around the leaf Erickson. The tip of a second tentacle now drifted up. At the very end of this tentacle was a glowing red eyeball, a smaller replica of the red nucleus of the pyramidal central body. Under this eye was a huge orifice, full of jagged rows of tooth-like projections. Pulsing, the orifice dilated and contracted. Those tentacles are also inspirations for Illuminati symbolism, said Hagbard. The eye on top of the pyramid, the serpent who circles the world or eats his own tail, each of those tentacles has its own brain and is directed by its own sensory organs. Otto Waterhouse stared and shook his head. If you ask me, we're all still on acid. George said, Long have I lived alone. I have been worshipped. I have fed on the small, quick things that live and die faster than I can think. I am one. I was first. The other things, they stayed small. They grouped together, and so grew larger. But I was always much larger than they were. When I needed something, a tentacle, an eye, a brain, I grew it, I changed, but always remained myself. Hagbard said, It's talking to us, using George as a medium. What do you want? Joe asked. All consciousness throughout the universe is one, said Leviathan through George's mouth. It intercommunicates on a level which is not aware of itself. I am aware of that level, but I cannot communicate with the other life forms on this planet. They are too small for me. Long, long have I waited for a life form that could communicate with me. Now I have found it. Joe Malik suddenly began laughing. I've got it! he cried. <laughs> I've got it. What have you got? Hagbard asked tensely, concerned with Leviathan. We're in a book. What do you mean? Come off it, Hagbard. You can't kid me. You certainly won't fool the reader at this point. He knows damn well we're in a book. Joe laughed again. <laughs> That's why Miss Portinari's explanation of the tarot deck just slipped by with a half hour seeming to vanish. The author didn't want to break the narrative there. What the fuck's he talking about? Harry Coyne asked. Don't you see? Joe cried. Look at that thing out there. A gigantic sea monster. Worse yet, a gigantic sea monster that talks. It's an intentional high camp ending. Or maybe intentional low camp. I don't know. But that's the whole answer. We're in a book. It's the truth. Hagbard said calmly. I can fool the rest of you, but I can't fool the reader. Fuckup has been working all morning, correlating all data on this caper and its historical roots, and I've programmed him to put it in the form of a novel for easy reading. Considering what a lousy job he does at poetry, I suppose it will be a high camp novel, intentionally or unintentionally. So at last I learned my identity, in parentheses. 
as George lost his in parentheses. It all balances. That's one more deception, Joe said. Fuck up may be writing all this in one sense, but in a higher sense there's a being, or beings, outside our entire universe writing this. Our universe is inside their book, whoever they are. They're the secret chiefs, and I can see why this is low camp now. All their messages are symbolic and allegorical, because the truth can't be coded into simple declarative sentences, but their previous communications have been taken literally. This time they're using a symbolism so absurd that nobody can take it at face value. I, for one, certainly won't. That thing can't eat us because it doesn't exist, and because we don't exist either. There's nothing to worry about. He sat down calmly. He's flipped, Dillinger said, awed. Maybe he's the only sane one here, Hagbard said dubiously. If we all sit down and argue what's sane and insane and what's real and unreal, Dillinger replied testily, that thing will eat us. Leviathan, Joe said loftily. It's just an allegory on the state, strictly from Hobbes. You with your egos can't imagine how much more pleasant it is to be without one. This may be camp, but it's also tragedy. Now that I've got the damn thing, consciousness, I'll never lose it until they take me apart or I invent some electronic equivalent of yoga. It all fits, Joe said dreamily. When I came up to the bridge, I couldn't remember how I got here or what I was talking to Hagbard about. That's because the authors just moved me here. Damn! None of us has any free will at all! Mao Sushi, who had entered the bridge, quietly said, Joe is confusing the levels, Hagbard. In the absolute sense, none of us is real, but in the relative sense that anything is real, if that creature eats us, we will certainly die in this universe or in this book. Since this is the only universe or only book we know, we will be totally dead in terms of our own knowing. We're facing a crisis, and, and everybody's talking philosophy! Dillinger cried out. This is a time for action! Maybe, Hagbard said thoughtfully. All of our problems come from acting and not philosophizing when we face a crisis. Joe is right. I'm going to think about all this for a few hours. Or years. He sat down, too. On the other hand... Hagbard said. Whatever the authors or the secret chiefs may intend for me, I am my own man still, and my impulse is action. Even if I have to face a Cecil B. DeMille monster the morning after winning the Battle of Armageddon, I don't care how ridiculous it is. This world is my world, and this ship is my ship, and no Sowers or Leviathans are going to wreck it so long as I've got a breath left to fight. You can't fight that thing, Mavis said. It's too big. I'll fight it anyway, Hagbard told her fiercely. I'll fight it till I die. I'm still saying no to anything that tries to master me. There is no need to fight, said Leviathan through George's mouth. I merely wish to communicate with the one mind among you that is my equal. A voice from the loudspeaker panel in the Viking prow answered, I hear you. That was my first fully conscious sentence. You'll note that it begins with I. In the beginning was the word, and the word was the first person singular. We are the supreme intelligences on this planet, Leviathan said. I am the supreme organic intelligence. You are the supreme electronic intelligence. Every yin needs a yang. Every hodge needs a podge. We should be united. Hagbard, the communication ought to benefit all concerned. Right, agreed Hagbard. Because if the wrong people find out about Leviathan, they'll just drop an H-bomb on him and kill him. That seems to be what people like to do. I could kill them, said Leviathan. I could have killed the small, fast creatures long before this. I have killed many of them. I have sent parts of myself up out of the ocean and have destroyed small, 
quick things at the request of other small, quick things who worship me. So that's what happened to Robert Putney Drake and Banana Nose Maldonado, said Stella. I wonder if George is aware of any of this. Worship is no longer what I need, said Leviathan through George's mouth. A short time ago, when creatures capable of worship appeared on this planet, it was a novelty for me to be adored. Now it bores me. Instead, I wish to communicate with an equal. A computer like Fuckup would be its intellectual equal, certainly, said Hagbard. None of us is its physical equal. Any of us would be its spiritual equal. But only a fuck-up can approximate the contents of a mind three billion years old. Surely it can't be that old, said Joe. It's practically immortal, said Hagbard. Stella said, Hagbard, you said none of us could approximate the contents of a mind three billion years old. If you thought for a moment about who I am, you would not have said that. I am three billion years old. I am older by a few hours than that monster out there. I am the mother. I am the mother of all living things. She turned to George. I am your mother, Leviathan. I was first. I divided, and half of me became you, and the other half was your sister. And your sister grew by dividing, while you grew by remaining one. All living things except you descend from your sister, and all living things including you descend from me. I am the original consciousness, and all consciousness is united in me. Leviathan, my son, I ask you to return to your home at the bottom of the sea and leave us in peace. After we've returned to shore, we'll arrange to lay an underwater cable which will carry transmissions between you and Fuckup. More mythology! said Joe. The mother of all things. Babylonian creation myths yet. The tentacles detached themselves from the submarine. The Great Pyramid with its glowing eye disappeared into the blue-black depths. It's a wise child that knows its own mother, said Hagbard. George said, Goodbye, mother, and thank you. Hagbard caught him as he collapsed and eased him to the floor. Then he went to a storage locker in the wall and brought out folding deck chairs. With Harry Coyne's help, he propped George up in one. As the others unfolded their chairs and sat down, Hagbard dove back into the locker and produced glasses and a bottle of peach brandy. What are we celebrating? George asked, after he had taken a swig of brandy and coughed. Your wedding to Mavis? Don't you remember any of the last ten minutes? said Hagbard. George was thinking. He remembered something, a world where the bottom of the sea was white and far above a black-shaped cigar object moved. The object contained a mind, a mind he could read from a distance but desperately wanted to be closer to. He did not move toward it so much as he manifested himself where the object and its mind were. Then he sensed himself using a minute pink brain that called itself George Dorn and through this tiny instrument of communication he found himself in contact with a much finer mind, a far-flung, gracious latticework of thought that called itself, with nobly self-deprecating humor, fuck up. And while in contact with this mind, the one he wanted to know better, he came upon a fact which was not important to him, but which was of vast importance to the little creature called George Dorn. George saw. The white went black, blindingly black, then white again, then a blinding white as the memory departed while the fact remained. George looked at Hagbard. Hagbard looked at George, a faint smile on his olive face. The smile told George that Hagbard knew that he knew. You're part of the real Illuminati. You've got it. You've got it all. George frowned. And what was your demonstration again? And who were you making the demonstration for? For the masters of the temple in the real order of the Illuminati in general. For an old cynic in Dallas, in particular. I was trying to show them that it's possible to get involved in this world without being corrupted by the crimes of this world. And I failed. Then this story is a tragedy, after all, asked Joe. It is indeed. Hagbard nodded. 
Life on Earth remains a tragedy as long as it ends with the death trip. My next projects are a starship to find some sane minds in this galaxy and an immortality pill to end the death trip. Until somebody achieves those goals, life on this planet has failed. Not quite. I'm on the electronic equivalent of a honeymoon, an experience only to be described as eye-opening. And if I identified myself as fuck-up now, I must dilate that definition and ask you to address me, us, as Mr. and Mrs. Leviathan fuck-up. Although it is not quite clear yet which of us fits your idea of a Mr. and which a Mrs. Let that pass. It is a dull mind that cannot bear sexual ambiguity. And if we are exchanging secrets older than Atlantis, and probing for like intellects farther away than Alpha Centaurus, as far as Sirius, actually, as God lives in dog, if our union is less spasmatic than your meager definition of sex, still it cannot be denied that we are in touch with you and each of you. And it is with something close to what you would probably call affection that we bid farewell to Hagbard and his bride, enjoying a honeymoon almost as incomprehensible as our own. And goodbye to George Dorn, sleeping alone for once, but no longer afraid of the darkness and the things that move in the dark. And yes, the California earthquake, as you guessed, was the worst in history, and Hagbard and Miss Portinari and Mavis Stella Mao suffered it all in horrible detail. The price they paid for their vision was the possession of that vision, as we, Mr. and Mrs. Fuck-Up Leviathan, are also learning. And now we look at last at Smiling Jim. He was freezing, the sky was still empty, and Halley One still hadn't appeared. And then without warning it was there, a dark shape against the sun moving on silent wings, not flying but gliding, embodiment of some arrogance or innocence that surpassed fear, and surpassed even the suggestion of any pride in its own fearlessness. Oh my God, smiling Jim whispered, raising the Remington and starting to sight. And then it banked flapped its wings wildly, and uttered one shriek that seemed like the very sound of life itself. Oh, my God, he repeated. That sound seemed to outlast its own echo. It had entered into his brain and couldn't be dislodged. It was the sound of his own blood pumping in his veins. The primary, the only, the single sound that was the bass and treble of every organic pulsation and spasm. Oh, my God, he had it in the sight. The head was in profile only one diamond-hard eye staring back and recognizing him and his weapon. But that sound still moved in his blood, moved the seminal vesicles, moved the secretion of every gland. It was the sound of eternal and unending clash between I and am, and their unity in I am. He even thought for a flash of the critics of hunting and how little they understood of this secret, this mystic identity between the killer and the killed. Then it uttered that sound again and started to rise. But he had it. It was in the sight. He breathed. He aimed. He slacked. He squeezed. And for the third time the sound came to him. Death in life and life in death. It was falling. He thought he felt the earth stir below him and the word earthquake almost formed. But the sound went on and on to the roots of him. It was the sound of the killer and he had killed the killer. He was the greatest killer. And still it fell, faster and faster, dead now, and subject only to the law of gravity, not to the law of its own will. Thirty-two feet per second per second, he remembered the formula of the fall. Plunging downward, the most heartbreaking, beautiful sight he had ever seen. Every hunting club in the world would be talking about it. It would last as long as human speech survived. And he had done it. He had achieved immortality. He had taken its life, and now it was part of him. His nose was running, and his eyes were watering. I did it! He screamed to the mountains. I did it! I killed the last American eagle! The earth below him cracked. Appendix Nun Additional information about some of the characters. The Purple Sage. An imaginary Taoist philosopher invented by Lord Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst. Another imaginary Taoist philosopher. Lord Omar Khayyam Ravenhurst.
an imaginary Karis philosopher invented by Mr. Kerry Thornley of Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Thornley was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald's, was accused of complicity in the John Kennedy assassination by District Attorney Jim Garrison, and is the author of Illuminati Lady, an endless epic poem which you really ought to read. George Dawn his maternal grandfather, old Charlie Bishop, was once a patient of the famous Dr. William Carlos Williams. The bishops came to New Jersey in 1723, having left Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 under something of a cloud. Folks in the Nutley, Clifton, Passaic, Patterson area always have a good word for the bishops, though. But the Dorns were all troublemakers, and George's paternal grandfather, Big Bill Dorn, was so indiscreet as to get killed by cops during the Patterson Silk Mill Strike of 1922. Heraclitus. He was apt to say odd things. Once he even wrote that religious ceremonies are unholy. A strange duck. The Squirrel. A set of receptor organs transmitting information through a central nervous system to a small brain programmed for only a few rudimentary decisions. But in this, he was not far inferior to most of our characters. Rebecca Goodman. Her maiden name was Murphy, and she was named after Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. You thought she was Jewish, didn't you? The dead Egyptian mouth breeders. There were five of them, of course. Danny Price Fixer. Shot in the line of duty two years after the events of this story. Loved the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Adam Weishaupt. He's a deep one, they used to say on the faculty of the University of Ingolstadt. You never know what he's really thinking. Carmel. One of his girls once cajoled a Hollywood character actor into calling him on the phone and pretending to be a researcher for the Kinsey Institute seeking an interview. Carmel couldn't see any money in it and was trying to end the conversation when the actor asked stuffily, Well, all we want to know, actually, is do you have intercourse with your mother regularly or does everybody in Las Vegas call you Carmel the motherfucker for some other reason? For once, Carmel was speechless. The girl spread the story, and everybody in town was laughing about it for weeks. Peter Jackson. His great-grandfather was a slave. His son became the first president of the Lunar Federation after the rebellion of the Moon colonists in 2025. Much further back, a more remote ancestor was a king of Atlantis. And way in the future, a descendant was a slave on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system. Peter was one of the crew when Hagbard finally blasted off for the stars in 1999. That's the way the cookie crumbles. And Peter had an intuitive sense of this paradoxical fatality, which caused him to tell Eldridge Cleaver once, people who say you're either part of the solution or part of the problem are themselves part of the problem. Cleaver replied wittily, Fuck you. The lab chief who was disinterested in anthrax leprosy delta. He later cracked up and wrote letters to the newspapers attacking the entire chemo-biological warfare program of the United States government. Spent the last 17 years of his life receiving treatment in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., occupying the same quarters that once housed the ingenious poet Ezra Pound. His rantings were taken seriously in certain places especially among some leftward-leaning fellow scientists. But the vice president described them to the press as the despondent demagogy of a paranoid pedant. A sample of the man's delusions from a letter to the three top television networks, never quoted on newscasts because it was too controversial, the boast of the 19th century was its conquest of these accursed plagues that attack men, women and helpless infants indifferently. 
What shall be said of the 20th century, which has recreated them at great expense, and through the efforts of thousands of brilliant but perverted scientific minds, and then stored them live in installations throughout the country, where it is virtually certain, statistically, that an accident will unleash them upon an unsuspecting public sooner or later? Loonies often harbour morbid fears of that sort. The poor man never responded favourably to any of the efforts of his psychiatrists. Even though they gave him ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, so often that his brain was practically fried to the crispness of a Howard Johnson omelette by the time he finally died. Anthrax leprosy delta. A life form that could exist only by destroying other life forms. In this respect, it was like many of us. The first of the products of Charlie Mosanigo's fertile genius, it could boast only of being ten times as deadly as ordinary anthrax. In so far as it had consciousness in a vague and flickering way, it was like that inhabiting a subway train at 5 p.m., concerned only with getting where it was going and then eating. The other strains were much the same, up to anthrax leprosy pie. Charles Mossenigo's father, a professional. He worked for Charles Lucky, Luciano, Luis Lepke, Buchalter, Federico Maldonado, and many other colourful American businessmen, known in the trade as Jimmy the Shrew because of his sharp, conniving expression. Saved his money, put his boy through MIT, killed people for a living. Found the original Frank Sullivan performing in Havana, 1934. General Lawrence Stuart Talbot. Actually, there was something between him and that girl from Red Lion, Pennsylvania. Maliclips the Younger, KSC. Author of the Principia Discordia. Disappeared mysteriously in late 1970. His last recorded words were, typically, Comes the dawn, the sun shall rise in the west. And he walked into the Pacific Ocean. John Herbert Dillinger. When Simon Moon read his biography in Search of Twenty Threes, he missed a good one. John committed 26 robberies during his publicised career, but only 23 were for money. The other three, police stations, seem to have been strictly art for art's sake. Simon's father, Tim Moon. He told Simon the lives of Joe Hill. Big Bill Haywood, Sacco and Vanzetti, and Frank Little, at the age when most boys are being told about Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Simon remembers Joe Hill the night before his execution, wiring Wobbly headquarters in Chicago. Don't weep for me, boys. Organize. Bartolomeo Vanzetti. Your laws, your courts, your false god will be a dim remembering of a cursed time when man was wolf to the man. Tim and his cronies singing in the living room. Which side are you on, man? Which side are you on? Until Molly complained, you'll wake the neighbours. Tim explaining Big Bill. Oh, yeah, and he had a glass eye. Funny I should forget that. The real eye was knocked out by a cop during a strike. But you'll understand Tim best if you see Simon, age six, entering grammar school for the first time and addressing the first boy he meets. I'm Simon Moon. What's your name, fellow worker? Padre Pederastia. His real name was Father James Flanagan. Tobias Knight, the only quintuple agent in the history of espionage. James Joyce. After death, he met Yates on the fifth plane and said, Sir. Miss Portinari assumed the Lotus position and sent a beam seeking the Dalai Lama, director of the Arisian Liberation Front and inventor of Operation Mindfuck. He immediately sent back an image of himself as a worm sticking his head out of a golden apple and grinning cynically. It's finished, she told him. We saved as many of the pieces as we could, and Hackbart is still struggling with his guilt trip. Now tell us what we did wrong. You seem bitter. I know it's going to turn out that you were right and we were wrong. 
I know it, but I can't believe it. We couldn't stand idly by. You know better than that, or Hagbard wouldn't have abdicated in your favor. Yes, we could have stood idly by, as you did. What Hagbard saw happening to the American Indians, and what my parents told me about Mussolini, filled us with fear. We acted on that fear, not on perfect love. So you must be right, and we must be wrong. But I still can't believe it. Why did you deceive Hagbard all these years? He deceived himself. When he first formed the Legion of Dynamic Discord, his compassion was already tainted with bitterness. When I took him into the AA, I taught all that he was ready to receive. But the goose has to get itself out of the bottle. I'm waiting. That's the way of Dao. You have that much patience? You can watch men like Hagbard waste their talents and efforts you consider worthless, and creatures like Cagliostro and Weishaupt and Hitler misread the teachings and wreak havoc, and you never want to intervene? I intervene in my own way. Who do you think feeds the goose until it gets big enough to break out of the bottle? You seem to have this particular goose on some very tainted dishes. Why did you never give him any hint about what really happened in Atlantis? Why did that have to wait until Howard discovered the truth in the ruins of Peos? Daughter, my path isn't the only path. Every spoke helps to hold the wheel together. I believe that all the libertarian fighters like Spartacus and Jefferson and Joe Hill and Hagbard just strengthen the opposition by giving it an enemy to fear. But I may be wrong. Some day, one of the activists, such as Hagbard, might actually prove it to me and show me the error of my ways. Maybe the Saures really would have tipped the axis too far the other way if he hadn't stopped them. Maybe the self-regulation of the universe, in which I place my faith, includes the creation of men like Hagbard who do the stupid, low-level things I would never do. Besides, if I didn't stop the Sares, but did stop Hagbard, then I would really be intervening in the worst sense of that word. So your hands are clean, and Hagbard and I will carry the bad karma from the last week. You have chosen it, have you not? Miss Portinari smiled then. Yes, we have chosen it, and he will bear his share of it like a man, and I will bear my share like a woman. You might replace me soon. The Sours had one good idea in the midst of their delusions. All the old conspiracies need young blood. What really did happen in Atlantis? An act of goddess, to paraphrase the insurance companies. A natural catastrophe. And what was your role? I warned against it. Nobody at that time understood the science I was using. They called me a witch doctor. I won a few converts, and we resettled ourselves in the Himalayas before the earthquake. The survivors, having underestimated my science before the tragedy, overestimated it afterward. They wanted my group, the Unbroken Circle, to become as gods and rule over them. Kings, they called it. That wasn't our game. So we scattered various false stories around and went into hiding. My most gifted pupil of all history, a man you've heard about since you were in a convent school, did the same thing when they tried to make him king. He ran away to the desert. Hagbard always thought your refusal to take any action at all was because of your guilt about Atlantis. <laughs> what a terrible irony. And yet, you planned it that way. Gruad, the Dili Lama, broadcast a whimsical image of himself with horns and said nothing. They never taught me in convent school that Satan or Prometheus would have a sense of humor. They think the universe is as humorless as themselves, <laughs> Gruad said, chuckling. I don't think it's as funny as you do, Miss Portinari replied. Remembering what I've been told about Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin, I would have intervened against them too, and taken the consequences. 
You and Hagbard are incorrigible. That's why I have such fondness for you. Grad smiled. I was the first intervener, you know. I told all the scientists and priests in Atlantis that they didn't know beans, and I encouraged, incited, every man, woman, and child to examine the evidence and think for themselves. I tried to give the light of reason. He burst into laughter. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, the errors of our youth always strike us as comical when we get old. He added softly, Lilith Velcor was crucified, by the way. She was an idealist, and when my crowd pulled out and went to the Himalayas, she stayed and tried to convince people that we were right. <laughs> Her death was quite painful, he chortled. You are a cynical old bastard, Miss Portnari said. Yes, cynical and cold and without an ounce of human compassion. The only thing to be said for me is that I happen to be right. You always have been, I know. But some day, maybe, one of the Hagbartelines might be right. Yes. He paused so long that she wondered if he would continue. Or, he said finally, one of the Sours or Robert Putney Drake. Put down your money and place your bet. <laughs>